You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. Nick Carter, Master Detective. This is the story of a man known the world over as one of the most daring and resourceful characters in the history of detective fiction. A man whose name has become a symbol of the triumph of right and justice over the sinister forces of crime and lawlessness. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's exciting adventure, the life and death search for a man who didn't see a murder that was not yet discovered. The witness saw nothing. Jefferson Heights is a suburb of the city that's still half country. Only a few houses are sprinkled over the winding roads, and Lundy Lane is the lonesomest of all. There is a small white cottage at the end of Lundy Lane, and in it, Mrs. Peter Grogan, a small, white-haired lady, is entertaining her first visitor in many days. Another cup of tea, Mrs. Dennis? No, no, I thank you kindly, Mrs. Grogan. Another crumpet, maybe? Oh, no, thank you. I've had five already. You've had six, Mrs. Dennis? What? Ah, but then who counts? Oh, Mrs. Dennis, would you believe you're the first visitor I've had in two weeks and three days? Oh. Ah, but not the last, Mrs. Dennis. Oh, no, indeed. Time was when the trip out to Lundy Lane was too much trouble. It isn't now, eh, Mrs. Dennis? I don't know to <laughs> what you're referring, Mrs. Grogan. Oh, oh. Why, to the story in the newspaper yesterday about me. They called me Lady Miser of Lundy Lane. All about how I don't trust banks. And how I have $50,000 hidden in pots and pans and other similar places around the house. If you think for one moment I believe that story, Mrs. Grogan. <laughs> Them that reads it will. Ah, uh, just like you, Mrs. Dennis. They'll all be visiting me now. Why, Mrs. Grogan, I never so much as thought of your money and when I And there ain't a word of it true, Mrs. Dennis. I made it all up. What? It was only a trick of mine to relieve the lonesomeness. Ah, sure, I got that tired of looking at the four walls with never a new face. Ah, now there'll be plenty of faces coming to visit old Mrs. Grogan, the lady miser of Lundy Lane. <laughs> well, I never. I'm taking myself out of this house of No, mine. Mrs. Dennis. Oh, sure, you do not begrudge your old friend. Leading your friends to believe you were rich and all the time it's a lie. You'll not be seeing me again, Mrs. Grogan, I oh, assure you. No. And them that do visit will be nothing better than low fortune hunters. <laughs> I wish you well of them, Mrs. Grogan. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> now I wonder how many others saw the story in the paper. Ah, they'll all be coming sooner or later. <laughs> Now, don't act nervous, Wilson. Just make like we're a couple of businessmen with a little proposition. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay, okay, Case. Ring the bell. Yes? Afternoon, ma'am. Could we speak to Mrs. Grogan? Ah, you've got your wish, young man. Mrs. Grogan, me and my friend got a little business proposition we want to talk over with you. Could we come in? Visitors are always welcome, young man. Sure. Come in, come in. Yes, Maybe you'll be having a cup of tea while we talk business, eh? No doubt it's regarding the money of mine you read about in the newspaper. Eh? Yes, ma'am, it's about the dough, but we can't stay for tea. Quick, Wilson. <laughs> uh, nice work, Wilson. You got that wire in your pocket? Yeah. Get her tied up. Stick a gag in her mouth. I'll start looking for the dough. Shouldn't take us more than ten minutes to locate it and get out of here. <laughs> He says, ten minutes. Cash, we've been looking through this place for half an hour. I know. 
But the dough ain't here. It's got to be here. You heard her talking about it when we came in. Well, if it's here, we can't find it. This is no good cash. We're wasting our time. Come on back to the living room. We already been to it four times. I know. This time, we're going to ask Mrs. Grogan to find the dough for us. She ought to come, too, by now. Yeah, her eyes are open. Give me a sap. Yeah, here. Listen, Mrs. Grogan, my friend's going to take the gag out of your mouth. You see this sap in my hand? It's a leather bag full of steel shot. If you try to yell, you get slugged in the head with it. Got that? Take the gag out, Wilson. Okay. Uh, what do you want? Why did we you... We want the dough, Mrs. Grogan. The 50 grand you got stashed away in this house. Where is it? Uh, there isn't any money. Ah, don't give me that. I've been lied to by experts. Where's the dough? Where you got it hid? But I... I tell you, I haven't any money. It, it's all a mistake. Says you. Uh, you're crazy. There isn't any money. There never was any $50,000. It's just a newspaper story. It's all a joke. Hey, there's somebody at the door. Uh, hey. Uh, you old biddy, uh, I'll shut you up. I'll uh, uh, keep you quiet for now. Gee, Cash, you slugged it too hard. I think you killed her. Yeah, she's dead, ain't she? Well, she must have been pretty feeble if that little tap I gave her croaked her. Here's the doorbell again. What do we do? Keep quiet. Whoever it is will go away. Yeah, but maybe whoever's at the door heard her yelling. Look, I don't want to get caught in here with that corpse. Shut your mouth and keep quiet. Hello? Mrs. Grogan? Are you home? I see the door's open. Ah, you didn't shut the door, you dope. What do we do, Cash? That guy might come in here. Hello? Anyone home? I'll take care of this. Stay back here, Wilson. I'm coming. Who is it? Ajax vacuum cleaner salesman. Be right with you. Ah, good afternoon, Mr. Grogan, I presume. Uh, the lady of the house in? Uh, no, I'm sorry, mister. Well, I'm Albert Higgins, salesman for the Ajax vacuum cleaner. Oh, here's my card, Mr. Grogan. Oh. We're conducting a door-to-door -door demonstration campaign to acquaint the public with our sensational new post-war vacuum cleaner. Now, if you hey, allow me to come in, excuse me, I... Mr. Higgins, I'm just a little busy right now. I wonder if you'd come back tomorrow at the same time. My wife will be glad to see your machine. Why, certainly, Mr. Grogan. Tomorrow at, uh, say, 4 o'clock? Uh -huh. Bye. Did you read him? Yeah. But he saw you, Cash. He'd get a good look at your face. Yeah, I never thought of that. Okay, Wilson, after we finish locating the dough in this house, we'll spend tomorrow locating Mr. Albert Higgins. He ain't gonna sell many more vacuum cleaners. The bullet removed from the wound was a 255 45 automatic slug of the type known as. Sit right in here, folks. Oh, it's all right. There's nothing to be afraid Waldo. of. Waldo! Hello, Nicky. Hello, Patsy. Uh, I, I want you to meet Mr. Albert Higgins and his sister Barbara. Nick, this here's a serious problem you've got to apply your brains to. But, Walter, we've got so much work to finish. Oh, just a couple of minutes, Nicky, please. All right, all right. Please sit down, Miss Higgins. You too, Mr. Higgins. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Now, what's the problem? Albert's haunted. What? He is, Mr. Carter. Now, look, Barbara, this is ridiculous. He is haunted, oh. Nick. Haunted by death. I heard him arguing about it out in the street, and I brought him in. Mr. Carter, I, I think my sister's crazy. I don't want to bother you with... All right, now, wait a minute. Let's start at the beginning. Albert was almost killed three times today. But, Barbara, they were natural accidents. They could happen to anyone. Suppose I... you tell me the whole story, Mr. Higgins. Oh, Mr. Carter, I... I was nearly killed three times today. Once in the morning, I was jostled on the subway platform and almost thrown in front of the train. A second time, as I left my office at noon, I was standing at the curb waiting for the light to change. Somebody bumped into me and almost knocked me in front of a passing coal truck. And the third time after lunch, when I was crossing the street, I was almost run over by a cab, that's all. And I say that three accidents like that are impossible in one day, Mr. Carter. Why should anyone want to kill you? There isn't any reason for anyone to murder me. I haven't got any enemies. I, I lead a calm, peaceful life selling vacuum cleaners. It's just that Barbara's got too much imagination. She Maybe. Did you notice anything funny about those accidents? No, not a thing. Subway platform was crowded. It could happen to anyone. The cab driver was just as scared as I was. Did he stop? 
No, he just kept on driving. Get a look at him? He was just an ordinary hacky, gray hat, gray coat. Gray cap? No, gray hat, a felt hat. Hmm, very interesting. Oh, Mr. Carter, now that we've bothered you enough for the day, I'll be going. I've got an appointment at 4 o'clock. Higgins, so happens your sister was right. These weren't accidents, they were attempted murders. But why, for Pete's sake, why? I don't know. Maybe you've got enemies you don't know about. Or maybe you saw something you shouldn't have seen. Maybe you heard something. Where were you yesterday? I was making the rounds up in Jefferson Heights. I, I sell vacuum cleaners. So... Nick Albert, he saw something in Jefferson Heights. Oh, the only thing I saw was customers. All right, we won't argue about that now. Higgins, I want you to go home. Your sister will go with you. So will Waldo. Waldo, you're the bodyguard. Nick, why do I always get the dull jobs? You brought this case in, you work on it. Guard Higgins. But, Mr. Carter... Higgins, you must know something that someone doesn't want you to tell. That something may cost you your life unless I can prevent it. So go home and try to remember what it is. I'm going down to headquarters to see if I can find anything that might help your memory. Hello, Matty. Oh, hi, Nick. What's up? Tell me, Matty, what's the news from Jefferson Heights? Uh, why are you interested in Jefferson Heights? Read off the crime sheet first, then I'll explain. Okay. You want yesterday's reports, huh? Yes. Now, let me see. Inwood, Washington Heights, Harlem, Astoria. Yeah, I've been pretty quiet all around. Nope, nothing for Jefferson Heights. Nothing, huh? No. Hmm. That makes it tough. What makes what tough? Matty, I'm involved in a peculiar case. A young man named Albert Higgins was up in Jefferson Heights yesterday. He must have seen or heard something he wasn't supposed to. Someone's trying to kill him. Yeah? Who? Don't know. It was kind of a reverse murder, Matty. I know the intended victim in advance, but I don't know the killer or the motivation. Hope maybe I could get a lead through the crime sheet. No crime in Jefferson. No crime reported from Jefferson. Ah, oh, beat it, Nick. If you think that I... No. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Hello, Sergeant. Is Nick there? Yeah, just a minute. It's for you, Nick. Buffalo Bill on the phone. Thanks. Yes, Waldo? Nick, Nick, you got to come over to Higgins' place right away. Why? Albert Higgins is gone. He, he's disappeared. Nick, I... I tell you, it, it happened like a thunderbolt. Like, like, oh, I don't know how it happened. All right, all right. Take it easy. Now let's have the story. We took a cab home, Mr. Carter. Albert was pretty angry, but Mr. McGlynn here insisted he follow your orders. That I did, Nick Boy. And when we got out of the taxi and started up to the apartment, Albert said he wanted to get some cigarettes. So you let him go alone, huh? Well, it was just at the corner, Nick. Now I thought... Yes, she... yes, I know. You and Miss Higgins started up the stairs to this apartment. You didn't realize anything was wrong until you got up here. Albert wasn't following, so you ran back to the corner store, right? Right, Nick, and he was gone. Did you ask the store man what happened to him? Th th there wasn't a soul in the store. No one in the store. Let me have that phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Waller, you've been pretty stupid. Today. But, Nick, I... How many stores I... have you ever seen with no one in them in the middle of the day? Nick Carter's office. Patsy, Nick, get this and get it fast. Uh-huh. Call the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. Tell them you must have a record of the calls Albert Higgins made yesterday. He was a door-to-door -door salesman. He must have filed a list of those calls this morning. Right. I'll call you back in ten minutes. Now, let's get moving, Waldo. We're going down to that store. But, but, but you idiot, you realize Higgins has probably been hijacked by the men who've been trying to kill him. If we want to keep him alive, we've got to do it in minutes. <laughs> You see, Nick, this place is empty. Never thought to look in the back of the store, huh? I did, so help me. There's not a soul there. All right, I'll take your word for it. How about behind the soda fountain? Behind? The... Yes, behind. Take a look. Nick! There's a body here. Yes, not cold. See the bruise behind his ear? Nothing worse. Help him up. Oh. Now listen to me, please. I'm Nick Carter. I can't take the time to be gentle with you because a man's life may depend on minutes. What? A man was kidnapped from this store by someone who came in and slugged you. Did you see who it was? No. Oh, my back was turned. I saw enough. That's too bad. 
Wait a minute. Look here at the floor, Waldo. Uh, you mean them BBs? They're not BBs. They're chilled steel shot. Dollars to a penny, the killers bought the shot and fixed up a homemade blackjack and used that to knock this man cold. See, that's right, Nicky. It must have broken open. Waldo, pick up some of that shot. Yeah. Go down to the wholesale munitions district on Fulton Street. Take that shot to every manufacturer. Find out who made it and to what retail stores it was sold. Nick, you're turning me into an errand boy. Me, a fine surgical instrument. Walter, we're fighting for a man's life with no ammunition for our guns. We don't know who wants to kill him or why. The smallest clue may turn the balance. He'll get moving. All right, Nick. I'll see you later. Oh, oh, my head. Now, look, my friend. I'm going to make a phone call. And I'll have to leave you. But I'll send a policeman in to you on my way out. Thanks. Nick Carter's office. Patsy, Nick, what about that report? Oh, Higgins made 11 calls yesterday in the Jefferson Heights suburbs. Read them off backwards. Last calls first. Uh, Mrs. John A. Gerster, Bolton Road. Demonstrated vacuum cleaner from 4.30 to 5 p.m. Right, next. Peter Brogan, Lundy Lane. Not at home. Her husband made appointment for her for the following day at four. That must have been the date he wanted to keep today. Next. Mrs. Allen B. Oh, wait, wait, hold it, hold it. Huh? Was that Mrs. Peter Grogan? Yes. Thought the name was familiar. That's the old lady who was written up in the paper two days ago. That's right, Nick. The lady miser of Lundy Lane. You say her husband talked to Higgins? Well, that's what the report says. There's something fishy right there, Patsy. I'm going up to Mrs. Grogan's house. Stand by for a report from Waldo. Well, what's fishy? Mrs. Grogan is a widow. There isn't any husband. Hmm. Not the newspapers still on the front step. No sense ringing the bell. I'm not wasting any time getting inside. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Matty, this is Nick. Yeah? You better hustle up to Lundy Lane in Jefferson Heights, home of Mrs. Peter Grogan. What for? I found that unreported Jefferson Heights crime. It's murder. <laughs> Nick, I swear I'll never doubt your word again, even if you tell me I'm a murderer. This is fantastic. One of the nastiest, rottenest murders I've seen in a long time. Yeah, some cheap Ginzel must have read about Mrs. Grogan's dough and tried to grab it. Then slugged her to death in the process. Well, look, Nick, uh, where does Higgins come into the picture? Matty, I figure it this way. Higgins came to the house while the killer was here. Yeah? In some way or other, he got in. I get it. The killer thought fast and played he was Mr. Grogan. Gave Higgins the brush off. Right. And then the killer was afraid Higgins might be able to identify him, so he tried to murder him. Yeah, probably has by this time. No, Matty, I don't think so. No, why not? Because if he'd wanted to kill Higgins, he wouldn't have kidnapped him. Why the kidnapping? The killer was probably following him all day, so he must have seen Waldo bring him to my office. I get it, Nick. The killer wants to know how much you know. He's got Higgins someplace, and he's trying to sweat it out of him. And sooner or later, the killer's going to get tired of asking questions that Higgins don't know how to answer. So, he'll knock him off. Right. Now, do you have an idea how we can gain a little more time? What? In the meanwhile, get your department working on that wire that was used to tie up Mrs. Grogan. See if you can trace it. Right, Nick. I'll meet you down at headquarters in the stolen car department in one hour. <laughs> sake. How long are you going to keep me here like this? Until you're ready to talk, Higgins. You got no right to treat me like this. Keep me blindfolded, tied up, beating me. Now, what did you tell Carter about the murder? What murder? I tell you, I don't know anything about... I told you not to hand me that line of guff anymore, Higgins. You know plenty. You told Carter. I want to know what you told him. Uh, Oh, I swear I never told him anything. How could I? I don't know anything. I'm getting a little tired of smacking you around, Higgins. You better spill it. What'd you tell Carter? Ah. So now you're playing dumb, huh? Okay, Higgins. I guess maybe I'm finished asking questions. 
Maybe I better fix it so you can play dumb forever. Ah, uh, is that you, Wilson? Yeah, Cash. Come on out of here, quick. Okay. Well, what's the matter with you? Here, take a gander at these headlines tonight. Uh, Lady Miser of Lundy Lane murdered. Albert Higgins, key witness to murder, disappears. Yeah, and he's gonna disappear for good. I made up my mind. We bump him, Wilson. We don't take chances. No, no, you, you, you don't understand, Cash. Read the rest. In an interview today, Nick Carter revealed that Albert Higgins had identified the murderer as George Spelvin, small-time crook and racketeer. A police dragnet has been set for Spelvin and also for his accuser. Ah, so that's what he told Carter. You see? We're in the clear, Cash. They can't put the finger on us. They're looking for the Spelvin character. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you're right, Wilson. Uh, maybe we better not knock off Higgins' Cash. Maybe if we bump him, we'll be killing our alibi. Let's just sit tight and see what happens. How'd your department do in that wire trace, Matty? Well, not so good, not so bad. Here's a list of 21 retailers that sell the kind of wire used on Mrs. Grogan. Thanks. Waldo? Uh, finish the trace on the steel shot, Nick. patsy has got it. Right here, Nick. Seventeen stores sell that type of shot. Thanks. And I've got the list of the 14 cars reported stolen for today. What stolen cars got to do with Higgins? He was almost killed by a taxi, Matty. And I know that taxi was stolen by the killer that was after him. Oh. Well, I'm going to read this list of stolen cars out loud. If I mention any neighborhood that's on any of the other lists, let me hear it. You ready? Right. Yeah, go ahead. Checker cab stolen from corner of 70th and Broadway. 70th and Broadway. Uh-uh. Packard cab. Stolen from Bayon Park District. Bayon. Uh-uh. Uh. Checker cab stolen from Nelson Square District. Nelson Square. I've got a Nelson Square here, Nick. Yeah, I got one, Nick, right here. Galvanized iron wire. Two reels sold to Hanley's Hardware Store, Nelson Square. Ten pounds of number seven chill steel shot sold to Adam Sporting goes Nelson Square. Hmm. Cab stolen from Nelson Square. Shot bought at Nelson Square. Wire that bound Mrs. Grogan from Nelson Square. Maddie, I think we've got our first break in this case. Gosh, Nick, you're right. Now, the connections are too obvious to miss. Killers evidently using Nelson Square as a base of operations. Let's get up there fast. I think that's where we'll find Albert Higgins. I want to hope we find him alive. <laughs> Nelson Square, Nick. Now what? Let's see. About 12 small apartment houses on the square. Say about 10 apartments in each. Yeah, making 120. I figure the killer is hiding out in one of them and he's got Higgins there. Okay, the question is, which? I don't know. We'll have to cover every one. Hope we have enough time. But look, how are you going to know it's the killer when you see him, Nick? I'm going to make him give himself away. With Waldo's help. Oh, what do I do, Nick? Take this business card. It's one of Higgins. Uh Uh-huh. They're to go from door to door as Albert Higgins, vacuum cleaner salesman. Ah, I get you, Nick. When he hits the killer, the crook will be so surprised, he'll give himself away. Right. Especially in view of the fact that he's probably seen Waldo already. You ready, Wobble? I'm ready, Nick. But, but I prefer action. Not my old 44. Forget the 44. You sell vacuum cleaners. Leave the action to us. <laughs> Good evening, sir. I'm Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. Is the lady of the house in... Wait a uh, fast. Uh, 99 wrong numbers. I'm beginning to get discouraged. Good evening, madam. I'm Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. My card, madam, oh, I'd like to... Wait a minute, cut some Glory be. Well, that makes a hundred dead ends. And it must be crazy, but orders is orders. Well, this one's next. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, sir. Is the lady of the house in? I'm Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Cleaner Company. Who are you that, saying uh, you was? Oh, me card, sir. I'm Albert Higgins of the Ajax Vacuum Why Cleaner Company. Why, you're Carter's leg man. I've seen that mug of yours. No, no really, sir. I Get mean, your rod, Wilson. This is a plant. Yeah, Get but... inside you before well, I blast you. Have you ever dropped that gun? What? You're covered on both sides, mister. Reach. Fast. No tricks. Step aside and we'll come in. I think I know this gentleman, Matty. His name's Cash Hagen. Yeah. That's Wally Wilson inside. A fine pair of thugs. Hey, you got nothing on us, Carter. This here's an invasion of privacy. If you ain't got a search warrant... Did you bring a search warrant, Patsy? Uh, no, Nick. How unfortunate. And that means we'll have to find Albert Higgins here to justify this illegal entry. Where is he, Cash? Never heard of Albert Higgins. In the bedroom, Matty? No. Nowhere in sight, Nick. Must be in the kitchen or a bath. How about it, Waldo? No, he's not here, Nick. You killers murdered Higgins. Hey, and Wilson never heard of this guy. He's got to be someplace in here. Hey, look, Nick. They might have bumped him off and got rid of him already. I hate to believe it, Matty. We'll never have a case against these mugs if they did. They must have got rid of him, Nick. There's, there's nobody else here in the apartment. To be stymied like this at the last Nick, minute. Nick, there's something wrong with this living room. Now, Patsy... Well, but... look at it. It's lopsided. There's more wall on one side of the window than on the other. And there's more floor showing on one side of the rug than on the other. Patsy, this is no time for interior decoration. Even the chandelier is off center. Patsy! Wait a minute, wait a minute, Maddie. Patsy's right. Huh? Come over to the wall, quick. Listen here, if you... Shut up! Now, wait a minute. This bookcase is high enough to conceal a door. Help me swing it away from the wall, Waldo. Yes, All right. Hey, uh... By heavens, you were right, Nick. It is a door. In a false plaster wall, making a partition just big enough to conceal a man. I'm only hoping that... I tell you, I didn't tell the counter anything. I didn't tell him anything. All right, Higgins, all right, take it easy. That. You don't have to lie anymore. You told Nick Carter plenty. Enough to execute Cash Hagen and Wally Wilson for murder. There's just one thing about this case that I don't understand. What's that, Patsy? When Albert told the story about those so-called accidents, how did you know they were attempted murders? Oh, that. Well, remember Higgins said the cab driver looked like an ordinary hacky? Uh Uh-huh, in gray hat and gray coat. When I said gray cap, Albert said, no, gray hat, a felt hat. That was a tip-off. But how? Because no genuine cab driver wears a hat. All cab drivers in this city are required by law to wear caps. So obviously, the driver was a phony. Well, you certainly put the lid on those thugs with that felt hat. Mr. Carter, I take my hat off to you. And now, here's Nick Carter himself with an extra special announcement of interest to every one of you. This is the last time that the adventures of Nick Carter will be brought to you on Sunday. Beginning Tuesday, March 5th, this program will be heard over most of these stations at 8 o'clock in the evening. So put this down in your little black book starting on March 5th. That's one week from day after tomorrow. The adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, will be heard every Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock. So be with us at that time and tell your friends about the change, too, won't you? Now, Nick, can you tell us something about next week's story? Well, Ken, next week I'm going to tell you about a brand new post-war racket that's robbing Americans of thousands of dollars and driving hundreds of Europeans to death. Nick found out about it when my janitor went to check a grocery order and disappeared. He was found murdered with his shoes full of rice. What's rice got to do with murder and racketeering? You'll find out when you hear The Case of the Wholesale Killer. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Waldo by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Alfred Bester. And any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Ken Powell saying so long until Tuesday evening, March 5th, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.
This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Carter, that I've quite accidentally stumbled upon evidence that a horrible murder has been committed. But, Mr. Field, why come to me? That sort of thing should be reported to the police. But to what police? Where was this murder committed? I don't know. Well, then how can you be sure there was a murder if you don't even know where it was done? That's what makes this particular crime different from any other. Somewhere, sometime, a woman has been brutally murdered. Yet I don't know when or where. As a matter of fact, I doubt if anyone in the world knows of it except those who did it and me. Really? Well, how does it happen that you alone know all this? Because the victim has told me so in her own words. I heard the horrible story from her own lips. Ah, then you talked to her. No, no, never. But you just said... But she has talked to me. See here, Mr. Field, are you trying... Mr. Carter, here's the story. About a month ago, at one of those sales of unclaimed packages that the express company holds twice a year, I I bought a box. uh, About uh, one-third the size of a steamer trunk. When I took it home and opened it, I found it contained a blood-stained dress, a photograph of a beautiful woman, and eight phonograph records. What kind of records? Well, they were the small record blanks you buy when you want to make your own recordings at home. And it was from these records that I learned about the crime. Hmm. Well, Mr. Field, if you wanted to arouse my curiosity, you've certainly succeeded. How soon can I hear these records? Immediately. They're in my rooms. If you care to, we can go there right now. Excellent. Patsy? Yes, Nick? Get your hat. We're leaving at once to listen to a murder. That was the start of one of the strangest cases that ever came into the office of Nick Carter, Master Detective. A murder which came to light only because a man bought a box at an auction sale. Eight records which told the amazing story of the brutal killing of an innocent victim. Eight records of death. This is the box, Mr. Carter. How long ago did you say you bought it, Mr. Field? Oh, about a month ago. And the express company holds things for a year before selling, which means the murder's at least a year old. Were the wrappings on the box when you bought it? Yes, but I'm sorry to say they were destroyed before I knew they might give me a valuable clue to the mystery. Oh, too bad. You recall the name to which the box was addressed? Oh, yes, yes, I do. It was addressed to Alex Delanor, New York City, no street address. The rest of the label was obliterated. I have searched every city directory, every telephone book, every place where names are listed, but no such name anywhere. When are we going to get to the records, Nick? Right now, Patsy, I hope. How about it, Mr. Field? Uh, Right away. I'm very curious to get your reaction to them. Are they numbered? No, but I've played them so often, I'm sure I have them in order. Uh, Here's the first one. I don't suppose anyone will ever hear this record, but it's the only way I can think of to tell my terrible story to the outside world. I'm being held a prisoner in my own house. Held prisoner without any hope of rescue, except death. And I know that will be the end for me. All I ask of you who are listening is to avenge my death by putting my murderers where they belong. My name... She sounds as if she really meant it, doesn't she? I thought he was coming in then, but he didn't. My name is Nancy Deering. You will undoubtedly recognize it. As you know, I'm very rich, but all my money is no good to me now. I've tried to escape, but it keeps too close a watch on me. I only hope they don't kill me into... Oh... That's all on that. He apparently came back unexpectedly. She certainly had trouble getting her story on the record, didn't she? Yes, she was interrupted many times, generally in the wrong places. Oh, what a terrible feeling to expect to be killed any minute. Here's the next one. I don't know where I left off last time. I don't dare play it back. If they should ever hear what I'm trying to do, they take the machine away from me. From the way they talk, the end is very near. They may... 
I'm sure Ralph was listening outside the door, so I switched on the radio till he went away. Ralph is the one who will kill me when the time comes. Bad as Olive is, I don't believe she could kill her own cousin. But her husband is different. When I refused to sign the deed last night, he hit me several times. But he can't make me sign because I'm positive that would be the end of me. He can do anything he... Well, that's all there is on that. I wish she'd planned what she was going to say a little better. How to make head or tail of it this way. Well, she manages to get most of the story on the records, one way or another. The only thing she missed out on was telling us who she was or where she lived. All we have is her name. And she said she thought we'd recognize the name. Maybe she lived a long way from here. Maybe. Here's a third one. She apparently knew Ralph was coming to see her, and she prepared for his visit in advance. This is what she got. Come in. Well, my beautiful cousin, have you decided to sign that deed? I told you I'd never do it. Never. All we want, my cousin, is your money. As soon as you've made it over to us, we'll set you free, just as we promised. You don't fool me for one minute. The minute I put my name on that paper, you'd kill me. Set me free. That's funny. I haven't had a free minute since that cousin of mine moved into this house. I thought she was going to be company for me after Leonard died. But I'd have been better off living here alone. It was very sweet of you to invite her to come and live with you, Nancy. It was even nicer of you to let her bring me along. We've had such fun here. I wish I'd known then what I know now. <laughs> a little late to worry about that, dear cousin. Well, for the last time. Will you sign No, me? no, no. Very well. But it won't be long before you wish you had. Oh, oh. oh, I wish this were all over. I'd rather be dead than living like this. Not a friendly face anywhere since they got rid of my old servant. Nobody left but Alex. He's too busy with his rose bushes to know what's going on. Oh, I wish I were dead. And that's all there is on that one. The poor woman. But it's too bad she didn't use more of those records than she did. She only uses a small portion of each blank. It's probably hard enough to get as much as she did in the way she was watched. Nick, where do you suppose she got the blanks in the first place? Probably had a radio phonograph in the room where she was shut up. And must have had the record blanks in with the other records where they didn't notice them. I've never been able to make much of this next one. Maybe you'll have better luck. The whole first part is just scratch. Here, I'll start it where the voices begin. Nancy! What's the idea of voting? Nancy. Isn't she in here? Why, of course she is. Nancy, come out here. Hiding, is she? Well, we'll drag her out. I'll find her, the little Let's sheep. Let's look around here. Aha! Uh-huh. Look there. Ah, come out of there. No, no, go away. Come Let me alone. Out there, I tell you, Let me alone. Come on, oh, come on. Oh. Try to kill me, will you? And with my own gun. Too bad for you, you didn't succeed. You devil, why, Ralph, doesn't... Not very clear, is it? I think so. Nancy locked her door and started the recorder. For some reason, she waited before saying anything. Then Ralph and Olive came to the door, found it bolted, and broke in. Nancy hid, and they dragged her out. She grabbed Ralph's gun and took a fast shot at him. It's too bad she missed. It's clear enough when you tell it. Well, here's the next one. I must hurry as I may be interrupted any minute. They seldom leave me alone anymore. Maybe they're afraid I'll kill myself. But to get on with the story. When my husband was killed in Italy, I invited Olive, a distant cousin, to come and live with me. She asked if she could bring her husband. I foolishly consented. Everything went well for about two months. Then one after another, my servants left. I know now that Olive and Ralph drove them out. Then Ralph suggested that I put him in charge of my estate. I refused, of course. The next day, I was shut up in my room. He told me that when I made my fortune over to him, he'd let me go anywhere I wished. But I could tell he was lying. I knew... Someone is listening outside the door. Yesterday, I wrote a letter to Alex, the only one of my servants left, and threw it out the window. If he finds it, maybe he can... And that's that. We didn't get much out of that except a few background details. Now it all pieces together, Patsy. A little at a time. This next record is more interesting, you'll find. Good. Let's have it. Well, Nancy, 
How do you feel today? You're not interested, so I ask you. I'm extremely interested in the state of your health, always. If you had your way, I'd be dead. Now, why don't you stop being so stubborn, Nancy? It's not getting you anywhere. Why don't you stop torturing me? Or do you enjoy seeing me suffer? I don't particularly mind. Why, you... You she-devil! You ever throw anything at me again, I'll tie you hand and foot so you can't move. Why don't you kill me and be done with it? That's what you're going to do anyway. Why, Nancy. What an unpleasant thought for such a beautiful woman. You know, I could go for you. You'd only say the word. We... You dirty sneak! I told you that I fixed oh, you. No, you. No, I... Ralph, I... please. Next time I will kill you. I'm almost tempted to do it now. Ralph, will you get me a glass of water, please? I don't see why I should. Oh, all right. But no tricks, sir. I'll... Gosh, wish I could have heard more of that. I thought he was going to make a pass at her. You will hear more. Nancy must have known the record was about ended, so she sent Ralph after the water so that she could change the record. She's clever, that woman. Or should I say, she was clever. I'm afraid it's past tense for sure, Mr. Carter. What a terrible thing. Quiet, Patsy, please. Thank you, Ralph. I, uh, I think I should tell you, Nancy, that... Olive and I have decided that we'll give you one more day to do just as we want. Just one. Do you think death frightens me? That's the only way I'll ever get away from you two. At least that way my fortune will go to my sister and not to you two murderers. Are you sure? Of course. My will leaves everything to her. Ah, but we have a new will, leaving everything to us. <laughs> Properly signed, sealed, and witnessed. No, you, you can't get away with it. Oh, yes, we can. Of course, we'd rather not have to use it, but if we must, we must... <laughs> And I assure you, it's a masterpiece of fortune. I can't believe two such inhuman creatures as you and Olive actually exist. Well, we do. And we shall continue to exist long after you've gone. Look forward to tomorrow, Nancy, dear. You, you heard what he said. It was practically a full confession of everything. Oh, I beg you, whoever you are who may hear these words... See that those two monsters get their just desserts for what they've done to me. I shall feel... Huh. She didn't know she was in deadly earnest. You'd think she was putting on an act. Truth is generally more effective than fiction, Bessie. There's one more, the eighth and last. How she managed to get it, I'll never know. But here it is. The first two-thirds are blank. It starts about here. Keep away from me, both of you. As you see, I have a gun and you both know I can shoot. I'll kill the first one of you who comes near me. That's my gun. Where'd you get it? Olive gave it to me so I could defend myself. That's a lie and you know it. What if it is? Nancy. Ah! Give me that gun. Give me that gun, Nancy. Hey, give it to me. I can take a wrong break your wrist. Now, come on. Give it to me. Ah! Well, well, that takes care of you, you stubborn fool. You all right, Olive? Uh, uh, yes, I... I guess so, Ralph. The bullet just grazed my head. Good. Is she dead? Uh, she's dead, all right. Even Nancy Deering can't live with a bullet through her heart. Well, I'm glad it's over at last. You, you say you've arranged with a doctor to... Oh, poor Nancy. What a tough break she got. I truly believe that's the most remarkably told murder story in the history of crime. Well, Mr. Carter, do you have any ideas? I think so. But I'm not ready to talk about them yet. What's your first step going to be, Nick? First, I want to take these records back to the office and play them over and over until I know them by heart. Then, I'll be ready to go to work. Got a sandwich in your pocket, Patsy? Oh, Nick, I thought you'd never finished listening to those records. I wanted to be sure I didn't miss anything that you'd possibly... Be helpful to me. Did you find anything worthwhile? Yes, indeed, Patsy. There are several clues plainly marked out for us. Certainly enough for us to get started, huh? Well, tell me, Nick. Don't keep me waiting. Of course, the most obvious clue we have is the blood-stained dress that came in the box with the records. You mean the label in it? Yes. We know the girl's name was Nancy Deering. That the dress was bought at Shipstead's dress shop in Albany. Uh-huh. And as the picture that was in the box had an Albany photographer's name on it, she must have lived in or near Albany. Right. So we'll start our search there. But, Nick... If it was all done as secretly as the records would seem to indicate, chances are that nobody up there knows anything about it. Yes, except for one thing, Patsy. It's 
It's obvious from the quality of the dress and from what she said in one of the records that Nancy Deering was a well-to-do woman. Uh And I find it difficult to believe that any rich woman can disappear without the newspapers or the police or somebody knowing something about it, even if they don't know there was any foul play connected with it. I see. And when they give you the facts as they have them, you can give them the inside story you got from the records. That's what I hope will happen. So pack your bag and order a taxi. We're flying to Albany immediately. lucky to be able to get us on this plane. Well, this business demands a certain amount of priority. Now, Patsy, here's what I plan to do. Hmm. As soon as we get there, you take the photograph to the address shown. See if it really is a picture of Nancy Deering, and also how recent it is. Uh Uh-huh. I'm going to the newspaper office and see what they can tell me. Meet me there. You're you're not going to the police first? No, not unless we can't find anything anywhere else. I want to keep this unofficial as long as I can. I think I'll get further that way. We've got to be careful. We don't know what we may be stirring up when we start asking questions. Huh? The chief's office? Oh, right over there. Thanks. Got in? Yes? What can I do for you? Mr. Brown, I'm Nick Carter. I hope you can give me some information. Oh, sure, Carter. Glad to help you if I can. What's on your mind? As the editor of a big paper, you must run into things every now and then. Would your files have any dope on a woman called Nancy Deering? What sort of dope are you looking for and why? I'd like particularly to know when and how she died. And I'd rather not tell you why just yet. Carter, I smell a story here. If I give you the information you want, I want that story... I don't know that there is any story, but in return for your help, I'll promise to give you first crack at anything I may find that's worth your attention. Okay. If that's the way you want it, I'll play along with you. Nancy Deering, you say? Yes. How and when she died. Well, Nancy Deering and her husband, Leonard Deering, were pretty prominent people here in town, so I can answer your question offhand. Deering, a colonel in the engineers, was killed in the big push through Italy. His wife died of pneumonia a little over a year ago. Pneumonia, huh? You're sure of that? I am, but I'll take it for you. Give me the morgue. Now, Bill, when did Nancy Deering die and what was the matter with her? I'll wait. Get the name of the attending physician, too, will you? Now, look here, Carter. You got any reason to think that... Yes? December 14th, 1944. Right. Pneumonia, yeah. Um, who was the doctor? Fred Windsor. Say... Wasn't he the guy whose license was taken away a while back for malpractice? Uh Uh-huh. I thought so. Oh, okay, thanks. So this Fred Windsor was disqualified. Any idea where he is now? No. Uh, Wait a a minute. I'll have a look in the directory. Let's see. Yep. Here he is. Fred Windsor, 57 Telfer Road. That's up in the western section of the city, a small suburb. Thanks very much, Mr. Brown. I won't bother you anymore. And if I get any red-hot tips, I'll pass them on to you when I'm ready. I wish you'd tell me what this is all about. Later, Mr. Brown. Well, so long. Thanks again. So long. Oh, there you are. I was just coming to find you. What did you find out? The photographer says it's a picture of Nancy Deering, all right, taken about a year and a half ago, just before her husband left for the war. That's her husband with her in the picture. They had a big house out on Lincoln Avenue in the West End. Good. I found what I wanted, too. We going out to the Deering house now, Nick? Not just yet, Bessie. Huh? What she said in the records is true. The ones living there now are her murderers. They'd hardly be likely to tell us anything we'd want to know. Oh. No, we'll wait till we have more definite information before we tackle them. Then what do we do now? We're going to call on a doctor. Or rather, an ex-doctor. I hope he'll tell us something he never told anybody before. you're in, what do you want? And make it brief. Mr. Windsor, I'll come directly to the point. A little over a year ago, a woman named Nancy Deering died. You, as attending physician, signed the death warrant. All right? Yes, I signed it. What about it? I have reason to believe she didn't die of pneumonia. You're crazy. Of course she did. If you think you can come now, here and start a... I said I had reason to think she died of something else. I might have said I have proof that she did. Well, you haven't. Mr. Windsor, you'll save yourself and me a lot of trouble if you... Get out of here, both of you. They're a pair of metal Hold it, good Winter. For no- it won't help you any to get rough. I've got nothing to say to you. You might just as well get out. 
I'd like you to do just one thing for me before I go. I've got nothing to say. You won't have to talk. Just listen to a record. A record? Yes. You have a player here? Yes, right here. What's the record? Let me play it for you and you'll see. I can promise you, you'll be greatly interested. Well, go ahead, play it. But be quick about it. Put it on, Patsy. You mean the last one of the series? Yes. Okay. Keep away from me, both of you. No. Oh. As you see, I have a gun. You both know I can shoot. I'll kill the first one of you who comes near me. That's my gun. Where'd you get it? Oh, that's right. Oh, gave it to me so I could defend myself. That's a lie and you know it. What if it is? It can't be possible. <laughs> What do you think of? That takes care of you, you oh, stubborn fool. Stop it. Are you stop it. I, I won't hear anymore. I won't hear anymore. Winter, stop. Winter. Nick, did he, did he? Yes, right through the temple. Oh, what a tragedy. But he practically confessed before he died. But we can't prove he did, Patsy. No matter how much we know ourselves, we're right back where we started, as far as legal proof goes. Then we'll have to find some other way to prove what we know. We can't stop here. I have no intention of stopping. Well, what now? I'm going to put an ad in the paper for Alex Delano, the man who sent the box to New York originally. He isn't listed in the city directory of the phone book, so we'll have to try it this way. Wouldn't that be dangerous, Nick? How do you mean dangerous? Well, suppose this Ralph should see it. Mightn't he get suspicious? That's one reason I'm using the ad, Patsy. I hope Ralph does see it, and I hope he does something about it. I want to smoke him right out into the open. And this may be one way to do it. Pardon me, do you uh, have any answers in box 415? 415. Uh, yeah, one. Here you are. Well, results. What is it, Nick? Let me get it open and I'll tell you. <laughs> ah, from Alex himself. Hmm. We'll be looking for you at my residence at 84 Green Court about 8 tonight. Alex Delanoir. You going, Nick? Of course I'm going. But you're going to stay in your hotel oh. room and wait for me to call if I need your help. <laughs> oh, Nick, I want to go too. Nothing doing, Patsy. As you yourself said, this may be a trap and I'd rather deal with it myself. Alex Delanor? Yes? May I come in? I'd like some information, if you can give it to me. Oh, but of course. Come in. Thanks. Uh, sit there, please. <clears throat> Delanor, you used to work for Mrs. Nancy Deering, didn't you? Oh, Mrs. Deering. Oh, yes, I worked for her for many years. It was only after she died that Mr. Morgan fired me. Uh, Mr. Morgan. Yes, yes. Tell me, Delanor... After she died, did you pack up a box of records and send them to New York? Oh, you have found the records? Oh, I've waited so long for that. Yes, we found them. And why did you send them to New York like that? Well, her letter asked me to, to prove she was murdered. Her letter? Yes. It says she is being kept prisoner, and she is afraid she will be killed at any time. She says if she die quick, I must pack the records I find in her radio cabinet and take them to the police. It will prove what she say. And why didn't you go to the police with that letter? Uh, she have died the day before I find the letter. It is too late. She throw the letter out of the window to me a few days before, but I find it behind a rose bush too late to help. So I, I do what she say. And you didn't take the records to the police? Oh, me, uh, I am afraid of police. Hmm. So I put them in a box and send box to New York. And then I write police to get it and find out what have happened. Do you have her letter now? Oh, yes, I... I keep it in my pocket always. Here it is. Thank you, Delano. With that letter and the records, I'll I think I... will take that letter, Mr. What? Carter. No, I have a gun here covering you. Put your hands up over your head. That's it. So it was you who arranged this meeting. Yeah, I was curious to know what you wanted with Alec. And I find he knows much more than I thought he did. I should have got rid of him before this. And what do you intend to do now? Dispose of you and Alex. The records are still in existence. They'll prove you murdered Mrs. Deering. With this letter in my possession and the doctor dead? Oh, yes, I know about that, too. The records will prove nothing. Now, come on, I have my car outside. You and Alex and I'll take a ride to my house where you'll stay until I decide how best to get rid of you. Say, kill him, Ralph. He's too dangerous to be allowed to live. Well, do as I say, Olive. 
If Carter were to disappear, every cop in this section of the country would be searching for him. But Ralph... No, he... we'll clean out the safe deposit boxes, withdraw the money we have in the bank, and go to Mexico, South America. We'll leave Carter and Alex tied up there. If they starve to death before they're found, well, that's just too bad. I think you're a fool, Ralph, to let him live. I'm running this, Olive. And if you don't want me to go away alone, do as I say. I hate him. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have to run away like this. I could kill him myself. Well, you won't. Now, don't leave the house until I get back. Pack all your things. Be ready to leave. All right, Ralph. I'll get back as quick as I can. Let him live. I won't. I'll fix him. A knife in his heart is what he deserves. That's what he's going to get right now. Yes. Yes, this carving knife will do. Tied up his ears, he, he can't do anything to stop me from killing him. Are you in there, Mr. Nick Carter? I'm coming to kill you, Nick Carter. I hate you. I'm going to... Now, now, if I can reach that knife you dropped. No, oh, if I can only see behind my back. What happened, Mr. Carter? I tripped her up as she came in and knocked her head on the floor and stunned her. Now, if I can get to that knife... Now, where is it? I want to be... Now, cut the ropes on my arms. There. Now, have you free in a minute, too, Alex? Oh, look out, Mr. Carter. Oh. She's coming, too. It's all right. I'm free now. I'll take care of her. What? What happened? Quiet. Don't make a sound. But I... You try to cry out, I'll fix you so you can't. Ralph isn't here anyway. Wouldn't do any good. Where is he? He's gone to town. Olive. You're lying to me. Olive. That's he calling. He must have come back for something. Olive, why don't you answer me? Call to him. Tell him to come in here. That you don't think my ropes are tight enough. I won't do it. Ouch! That's the carving knife you feel between your ribs. Now call to him. Carefully. Ralph. Yes? Ralph, I'm in here. Please come in. Oh, what are you doing in there? Get I your hands in the air. Why, what? Get him up high. That's it. Olive. Olive. How did Carter get that gun? Did you? You overlooked this little pistol I always carry in my shoulder holster, Ralph. But it's deadly, even if it is small. What? What are you going to do with us now? Round up whatever existence I can find in this house, including Alex's letter. And hand you both over to the police. With what Alex and I can tell them, and the evidence I can turn over to them, you'll both of you pay for Nancy Deering's life by forfeiting your own. How about a few hints about next week's show? Next week, Ken, I'm going to tell you about a suicide that turned out to be a murder and then disappeared entirely. Hold on a minute now. That's too fast for me. Well, it's true, Ken. If it hadn't been that my woman's intuition told me that what Scubby and I saw wasn't what we ought to have seen, the entire story might have been different. Yes, Patsy, that was one time when you really put the finger on the answer to a very tricky problem. This I gotta hear. What do you call it, Nick? I call it The Case of the Disappearing Corpse. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics magazine. In the adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places, is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. is the Mutual Broadcasting System. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective.
Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. What are you doing? What? My safe, you thief! Give me! Oh. 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 A thunderstorm rages outside. A shot. A man falls dead. So begins a strange adventure for Nick Carter, master detective. An adventure in which a murder seemed to be no murder at all. And the dead body vanished into thin air. The Case of the Disappearing Corpse. Good morning, Matty. Oh, how are you, Nick? What brings you down here to headquarters so early in the morning? It's only just 10 o'clock. Well, I've been out in the country for the past couple of weeks writing an article on crime detection methods. Finished it last night. Huh? Just stopped in on my way back to my office, past the time of day. That's what's doing. Yeah, it's pretty quiet, Nick. Nothing exciting's happened in the past ten days. Oh, Matty, haven't you even got one simple little murder just to keep me in practice? I'm bored. Uh, well, would you be interested in checking up on a suicide? Now, what's there to investigate about a suicide? Well, you never can tell, Nick. I just got a report that a guy bumped himself off in an uptown apartment house. I was going up to take a look at it myself, but the commissioner just called and must see him in his office right away. Uh, you want to go up in my place? Oh, I don't know, Matty. Well, if it's just the usual routine, you can lay off after you make the call. Anybody else going up? Medical examiners going along? Well, I called my office a few minutes ago, and Patsy had nothing for me, so I might as well run up and see what it's all about. What's the address? Hmm? Oh, uh, let me see, uh... Oh, yeah, it's uh, 717 West Hampton Street, apartment 4. Okay, Matty. See you when we get back. Well, this is West Hampton Street. What was that number, Doc? 717. Ought to be just ahead, Nick. Oh, yeah, 695, 701, 709. There it is, 717. Oh, that's a pretty swanky place, Nick. You can't live here on a white-collar salary. Ah, <clears throat> oh, here's the elevator waiting for us. Apartment four, wasn't it? Yeah. Get in and push the button. across the hall here. Yes, sir? Police department. You report a suicide? Oh, yes, sir. Won't you come in, please? Thank you. He... Uh, the body's right in the living room there, to your left. Oh, yes. I see it. Well, doesn't seem to be much of a question about it being suicide. You're the butler? Yes, sir. My name is Jordan. What do you know about this, Jordan? Very little, sir. Mr. Warner, uh, he's Mr. Miller's nephew came in about an hour ago and found his uncle lying there in the middle of the floor. I hadn't come down, but he called me and I reported it to the police. I've touched nothing since. Where's Mr. Warner now? Is he here? Yes, sir. He's upstairs in the library. He'll be down in a moment. I see. This dead man? Mr. Miller? Yes, sir. Mr. Anthony Miller. This is his apartment. His niece and I live here with him. Where's his niece now? She's dressing, sir. She'll be down with you shortly. This is a duplex apartment, isn't it? Yes, sir. Reception hall, living room, dining room, and kitchen on this floor. Library and three bedrooms on the second floor. Oh, pretty swank, I'd say. Pretty stuffy, I'd say. Well, thank you, Jordan. Well, as soon as the others come down, bring them in here, will you? Yes, at once, sir. Well, Doc, how's it look? Oh, pretty cut and dried. 
pistol in his hand, a hole in his head with powder stains around it. Uh, looks like suicide, all right. How long has he been dead? Must have been killed about uh, three o'clock. Uh, beg your pardon, sir. Here's Mr. Warner, Mr. Miller's nephew. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Warner? I'm Nick Carter. Uh, Nick Carter? Yes. I'm acting for Sergeant Matheson of the Metropolitan Police. Oh, by the way, Jordan. Yes. I left word for my two assistants to meet me here as soon as they could. When they arrive, will you let me know, please? Of course. At once, sir. Mr. Warner, I understand you found your uncle's body. That's right, Mr. Carter. I did. Will you tell us about it? Well, of course. When I was here last week, I left my camera here. I wanted to take some pictures this morning, so I dropped in here about 9.30 to pick it up. Who let you in? No one, Mr. Carter. I have my own key to the apartment. I came into the living room here, saw my uncle lying there on the floor, obviously dead. So I called Jordan, who came down immediately and phoned the police. That's about all. Was the outer apartment door locked when you came in? Yes. Both the regular safety lock and the regular lock were on. Mm-hmm. Are there any windows opening under the fire escapes? They were all fastened securely, sir. I checked them myself to make sure. Then no one could have come in from the outside. No, hardly. Not with the door and windows all locked as they were. I uh, see. Mr. Carter, what's the idea of all these questions? It was suicide, wasn't it? Just purely routine, that's all. Has anything in this room been touched since the body was found? No, not a thing. Good. That your uncle's pistol in his hand? Uh, looks like it, yes. Yeah, let me take it. There. You recognize it? Well, no, don't touch it. There may be fingerprints on it. That's why I'm holding it with my handkerchief. Yes. Yes, that's my Uncle Gun, all right. There's no question about that. Yes, sir. It's Mr. Miller's gun, Mr. Carter. I, I've seen it often. Mm-hmm. And one of the shells is empty. And one shot been fired. Well, that's all it took to kill him. Hey. Wait a minute. Well, what is it? This is unusual, to say the least. There's an empty shell in the chamber, but the pistol barrel is clean. What's that, Nick? You see? Either the barrel has been cleaned since the shot was fired, or the shot wasn't fired from this gun. Then this can't be suicide. Can't be suicide? No. It's definitely not suicide. It's murder. Murder, sir? But Where's told... the old man's niece? Say she lives here? Yes, sir. She... She'd be down directly, sir. Mr. Carter, she knows nothing about this. She was still asleep when we phoned the police. Jordan called her afterward. That's right, sir. I did. She knows nothing of this. Maybe and maybe not. I'd like to talk to her anyway, because from what you tell me about the door and windows all being locked, and from the condition of the murder weapon, this must have been an inside job. One of you three is guilty. Well, now look here, Mr. Carter. Sorry, I wasn't... Mr. Warner. This is now in the hands of the police. May I use your phone, please? There's one on the desk, sir. Oh, that, that one's not working, Mr. Carter. If you come with me, I'll show you the one in the library upstairs. Right. I, I know that one's all right. This, this one has a short circuit or something. Thanks. Be right back, Doc. Right, Nick. Sorry to trouble you. No, no, not at all. Better call Sergeant Matheson. Have him send his homicide experts up here, as well as the cop to stand guard. Well, you probably want you all to go down to headquarters for a talk. I see. Murder has to be treated very differently from suicide. Yeah. Well, there's the library right ahead of you. You'll find the phone in there. Thanks. fortune to live here. Yeah. Oh. Uh, this is apartment four, Patsy, right here. Uh-huh. Yes, what is it, please? Is Mr. Carter here? Mr. Carter? Yes, Mr. Nick Carter, the detective. You must have the wrong number, miss. What number were you looking for? Look, is this 717 West Hampton Street or isn't it? That's correct, sir. And is this apartment four, or isn't it? That's quite right, sir. Okay, then where's Nick Carter? I'm very sorry, sir, but there must be some mistake. Mr. Anthony Miller lives here. There's no Mr. Carter. Well, didn't the man kill himself here last night? Oh, my goodness, no, miss. You're all mixed up. Well, uh, Scubby, did Sergeant Matheson tell you the name of the dead man? No, said whoever phoned didn't give it to him. Oh, we must have the address wrong, Patsy. Maybe. Uh, could, could we use your phone? Why, of course, miss, if you'll step into the living room... There, to your left. There's a pool in there. Oh, thanks. Come on, Scabby. Okay. You can give the sergeant a buzz and see what's wrong. Right there, sir, on the desk. Right on. Thanks. If you'll pardon me for a moment, please. Well, sure. Go ahead. Police headquarters. Uh, let me speak to Sergeant Matheson. One moment, please. 
Oh, I wonder how it would be to live in a place. Homicide, like Sergeant Matheson. Oh, Maddie, this is Scubby. Yeah, what's on your mind, Scubby? Oh, Nick must have given us the wrong address when he told us to follow him uptown to this suicide place. What is the address? Uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, mm-hmm. Here it is. It's 717 West Hampton Street, apartment 4. But that's where we are, Maddie. And they don't know anything about it here. What's that? No, the butler tells us there's been no suicide here. What? Uh, hey, that's the address they gave us this morning when they phoned. Well, have you heard from Nick or the medical examiner? Hey, come to think of it, I have it. And that's a funny thing, too. It's over two hours since they left here. They ought to be back by now. Hey, why didn't they call and say they got the wrong address? There's something mighty funny going on, Scubby. Yeah, looks like it. Well, we'll see what we can find. Maybe it's an address that sounds like this one. We'll call you in a little while if we don't find anything. Okay, I'll tell the boys to watch out for Nick and Doc. Right, so long. You know any more than we do? No. He hasn't heard from Nick or the Doc since they left headquarters about two hours ago. What are you looking at? I was just thinking. Whoever lives here has pretty poor taste, even if they do have money. How do you mean? Well, look at the rug in this room. Yeah? It's the wrong color. It's definitely too small for the size of the floor. And the rug in the next room, which must be the dining room. But it's entirely the wrong color for the decorative effect in that room. And that one's much too big for the size of the floor. Yeah. You're right, Patsy. It's funny that people who live in such swell places should furnish their rooms so badly. Yeah. It almost looks as if these two rugs have been switched around, doesn't it? Patsy, maybe that's just what did happen. Maybe... Here, let me get a look at the rug under that dining table. Uh-huh. I'll shove the table over to one side and have a good look. Okay. Are you, are you looking for something, uh, sir? You're darn right I'm looking for something. You better hope I don't find it. I have to ask you to stop moving that dining table. If you try to stop me, I'll put a gun between your ribs. I'll call the police. Go ahead, call them if you dare. <clears throat> there. Scabby, look, right in the center of the rug, a big blood stain. That's what I thought. And I'll bet my last dollar that you'll find a blood stain that same size and shape in the center of the living room floor. Then someone was killed here. Yes, Patsy. And Nick and the doctor were here, too. This whole business about there being no killing here is a frame-up. Now you talk, and talk fast. What have you done with Nick Carter? Every man in every squad car is to be on the lookout for him. Now repeat that description I gave you. Right. Right. No, 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 it's Gerald Warner. Yeah, he was the old man's nephew. Okay, let me know as soon as you hear anything. Now, Jordan, look here. You're in a pretty tight spot. If you don't want this murder rap pinned on you, you better talk and you better say plenty. But I tell you, I know nothing about it. And you still say you don't know where the old man's niece went either, huh? Miss, Miss Hammond? No, sir. She put on her hat and coat and went out carrying a small overnight bag. Where'd she go? I don't know, sir. Ah, look, don't be a sap. The butler always knows everything about a killing. And most of the time, the butler done the murder himself. But I assure now, you, look, sir, we've I... proved that the bloodstained Scubby and Patsy found was human blood. We found Nick Carter's fingerprints on the desk, the table, and the upstairs phone. We found the old man's body stuffed in that upstairs closet in your apartment. <laughs> And you don't know nothing about nothing. Oh, Sergeant, here's huh? the bullet they just took out of Miller's body. Let me see it. Ah, well, that's an ordinary thirty-two caliber slug. Yeah, but it was big enough to kill him. I know that. What I, I mean was... Sergeant, your detective huh? squad is back from searching Gerald Warner's apartment. Oh, yeah? They find anything? Mm, nothing very valuable. Oh, they did find a telephone number for the niece, Frances Hammond. Uh-oh. There were two numbers in Warner's small directory. One was her home and the other, according to the chief operator, is at 62 East Pine Street. Now, what the deuce would that be? Well, maybe she's got a girlfriend there. That's it, Scubby. Patsy, this is a job for you. Uh-huh. Go to this address and see if Frances Hammond is there. If she is, tell her you're a reporter. Find out how much she knows. Get as much of the story out of her as you can. And if she's not there? All right, maybe you can find out where she is. But go on, get going and hurry. Right. Maybe you can dig up something that'll tell us where Nick is. <laughs> Any idea where we are, Doc? No. Looks sort of like somebody's hunting shack. Yes, I can see that. That doesn't help much. Well, as long as we're tied up to these two chairs like we are, it doesn't make much difference what part of the world we're in. We're no good to anybody this way. Oh, 
the thing that makes me maddest is the way they fooled me so completely. I never did see who hit me. Well, considering that there were only two men in the place and that the butler was with me, it isn't very hard to figure out who tapped you for the count. I was out cold from the time I was knocked out until I came to in this place. My wrist was so relaxed when they tied me that I can't work them loose. No, don't think I got into this mess because I was bored. <laughs> Well, I... I don't understand how you found out where I was staying, Miss Bowen. Your cousin told me, Miss Hammond. But it was he who suggested that I come here. He knew reporters would be pestering me for interviews after... After Uncle Anthony killed himself. And he said if I came here, they wouldn't be able to find me. He promised me he wouldn't tell anyone. But he only gave me your address because he knew I wouldn't pester you. He and I have been friends for years. Oh, I... Hope he doesn't tell anyone else. I'm sure he won't. And now, may I ask you a question or two? I suppose so. I, I really don't feel much like talking about it. I know, Miss Hammond. You loved your uncle, didn't you? Very much. He was always so good to me. Were you and your cousin engaged? Well, not quite. Uncle wanted us to get married. In fact, he he made a will leaving me all his money because, well, he, he thought that would keep Gerald more interested in me. Was Gerald, uh, Mr. Warner... Interested in anyone else? Oh, no, it wasn't that. Uncle Anthony knew that Gerald wasn't ready to settle down yet. He was trying to persuade him it would be the best thing for him. Do you know where your cousin is now? I, no, I don't. Why do you ask me where he is? Don't you know? Well, uh, wait, well, you see, he um, asked me to send him a copy of whatever I wrote in my interview with you. But he's left town and he didn't leave me his address. Can you tell me? Why, I, I don't know. When he wants to get out of town, he generally goes to Atlantic City, the Hotel Martise. Or with Hunting Shack up in Norris County. He might be in either place, I suppose. Uh-huh. Well, I'll send a copy of the interview to each of these addresses. One of them ought to reach him. Uh, tell me, Miss Hammond, did you know where your uncle kept his pistol? Why, of course. We all knew it. It was no secret. I've seen it often. But I... I never thought he'd use it to... To do this. Oh, there now, Miss Hammond. I'm sorry I mentioned it. Oh, please don't let it upset you. I'll just run along now. Goodbye. And thanks. <laughs> oh, trying to get across the room by moving your chair like this when you're tied up in it this way. Isn't the simplest thing in the world. And I, I can't make my chair move at all. But you're doing fine. Am I getting anywhere near that table yet? You're doing great, Nick. Just a little more. I'm moving backwards this way. It's hard to tell where I'm going. Uh, to your left. Uh, just a hair. That, that, that's it. Now you got it. Uh, so far, so good. Now, that's where's the bottle, Doc. With my back to it this way, I can't see where it is. It's almost directly in back of you, about a foot from the edge of the table. All right. I'll pull the tablecloth toward me, and that'll bring the bottle near the edge where I can get hold of it. Watch it while I pull it now. Is it coming? Uh, careful now. It's almost there. Hold it. It's right at the edge. You ought to be able to get it now. Well, I can if I can get my hands up that high. Whoever tied my arms and back of this chair did too good a job. There's no slack at all. Uh, that's it. There. I got it. <sighs> now, if I can break this bottle against the fireplace, I should have a sharp edge that'll cut these ropes in short order. <clears throat> but when you can only move an inch at a time this way, it's slow work getting anywhere. <clears throat> Keep me going in the right direction, Doc. Oh, you're doing fine, Nick. Only a little more now. Uh, uh, to your left a bit. Uh, that's it. You ought to be able to reach it now. Uh, 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 I'll try it. Easy first. Uh, you can hit it all right. Yeah. All right, here goes, Doc. Uh, you did it, Nick. Now edge your chair over toward me. You can cut my ropes first, then I'll cut yours. Gosh, Nick. You're the eighth wonder of the world. Thanks, Doc. Well, look out. Here I come. (laughs) 
Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Oh, yeah, Chief. You say Gerald Warner isn't at the Hotel Martise and hasn't been there for several months, huh? Okay, thanks very much, Chief. Yeah, that's what we wanted to know. We know where to look for him now. Yeah, thanks. So long. Well, that wasn't so bad, Nick. But it took longer to cut through the ropes of that piece of glass than I thought it would. Well, we're free, and that's the main thing. Have you found anything around the shack here that looks like a clue? I'm not sure, Doc, but I rather think so. I found these two pistols in the back of one of the cupboards. They're a very unusual pair of guns. Uh-huh. Oh, here. This gun has one empty shell in it. The barrel is clean. It has not been fired. Well, that's the gun that was in the old man's hand when we found him, isn't it? I'm pretty sure it is. Now, look at this other gun. Uh-huh. This one has no empty shells in it. The barrel is dirty. And from the smell of it, has been fired very recently. I see what you mean. Say, that does make them a little queer, doesn't it? Well, Doc, as I see it, Warner killed Miller with his own gun. Then he tried to make it look like suicide, but he couldn't leave his own gun there. So he got his uncle's gun, which hadn't been fired. Took the empty shell out of his gun and exchanged it for a full shell from his uncle's gun and put that gun in his uncle's hand. And he was just excited enough not to realize that the barrel of his uncle's gun was still clean. Of course. Well, why didn't he fire the other gun instead of going through all that rigmarole about changing the empty shell for the full one? Probably afraid that a second shot would wake up somebody who might have been partly aroused by the first shot, the one that killed his uncle. Well, I have to admit that it makes sense the way you tell it. And you still think that it will pay us to wait here for somebody to show up? Yes, Doc, I do. Because if anyone was planning to get rid of us, they'd have done it tonight. And they'd have to do it tonight. They wouldn't dare wait until tomorrow. Someone might find us in the meantime. So if we wait... Someone is sure to show up. Okay, you're the doctor. As far as catching murderers goes, you say wait, we wait. Huh. You're right, Nick. There's somebody now. Now remember, sit in your chair with your back to the door. Hold the ropes as if you were still tied up and unconscious. Like this? Let your head drop on your chest more. Right. Now, that's swell, Doc. Mm. Now, you look as if you were dead to the world. I'll do the same. Quiet. Here they are. Oh, what do you know? It's still out cold. I must have given him a stiffer dose than I thought I did. Ah, it won't hurt him. Makes it easier for us. Yeah, you're quite right, Mike. What are we going to do next, Warner? I still think our best plan is to dump them in the old quarry. It's close by and it's full of water. We'll wait the bodies... They'll never be fun. Yeah, it's an awful lot of killing just to get a hold of an old will. Not at all, Mike. If I could have taken the will without killing anyone, I would have been glad to do it that way. But since I couldn't, I'm not going to worry about it. And it's worth every bit of my trouble, believe me. A will I destroyed left everything to my cousin. Now that that's out of the way, I am the old man's only living relative. Sole heir to everything he owns. And that's plenty. Yeah. What about that niece of his, your cousin? Ah, but she's not really his niece. She's just a girl he sort of unofficially adopted. He always planned to adopt her legally, but he... well, never got around to it. So, she gets nothing. You gonna marry her? Marry her? Hmm. (laughs) Oh, no, indeed, Mike. She's not my type at all. I just kidded around with her to keep in right with the old man. But that's all over now. Well, I hope it works out like you wanted to. Well, I've certainly had bad breaks so far. First, the old man catches me at the safe. Then headquarters sends up Nick Carter instead of a regular cop. Then with a butler and and the plan that I had the apartment all fixed up so you'd never know there'd been a killing, Carter's two assistants show up. And the girl notices the rugs have been switched. That tips off the whole frame up. Ah, their troubles are over now. They will be as soon as we get rid of these two middlers. Yeah, you better do it pretty quick now. Nah, take it easy. Just as soon as it gets a little darker, Mike. Uh, uh, hey, got any old burlap bags we can put them in? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's some out back. I'll show you where they are. Okay, better have them ready when we want them. Now is our chance, Doc. Come on. Let me have one of those shotguns we loaded before. Here, are, Nick. Thanks. Now you take the other one. Get behind the cupboard there. I'll hide over here. Right, Nick. You say when. Let me do the talking. Quiet now. Mike! Mike, look, they've gone. That ain't possible. I just saw... Get your hands up high, both of you. Carter! How did you... We'll talk about that later. All right, Doc. 
I'll hold the gun on them while you tie their hands. And tie them tight, the way they tied ours. It'll be a pleasure, Nick. A positive pleasure. Oh, wait till I tie them. Well, Mr. Warner, this isn't coming out just the way you planned it, is it? You've got no proof against me, Carter. You're wrong, Warner. When you knocked me out in your uncle's apartment, you proved you killed him. Tell that to a jury and see how far you get. Oh, that's not legal evidence. It's true. But I have some other evidence that is legal. What? Warner, between the time Doc and I got free and the time you and Mike got here, we searched this shack of yours. And hidden in one of the cupboards, we found these two guns. Well, so you found two guns in a hunting shack. That's really remarkable. One of these guns is the one that was in your uncle's hand when I first saw his body. The other one, I feel sure, is the one that actually killed him. And if I'm not mistaken, it'll be registered in your name, have your fingerprints on it, and will fire a bullet that'll match the bullet that killed your uncle. Would you call those things legal proof? All right, all right. Yes, that's the gun I killed him with. You know, Carter, I should have killed you when I had the chance. Yes, it would have been wiser than to... Nick? Nick, are you there? Nick, Nick! Come in, Patsy. Oh. What's all the excitement? Oh, Nick, Nick I, I've been so afraid. Afraid of what? Af- afraid for you. Well, Patsy, well, I... you should know me better than that. Say, how did you get down here anyway? Well, when Sergeant Matheson got word from Atlantic City that Warner wasn't there, why... I made Scubby drive me down here as fast as he could. Yeah, she wouldn't let me stop and park anywhere. I never have any luck when I'm out with her. Well, you got here just in time to drive back with us. I was just going to take Mr. Warner and his friend here back to town to meet Maddie. Oh, gosh, Nick. After that that thug tried to tell me that you'd never been in the apartment when we knew you had, why... Oh, I was ready for anything. But she got even with him. I sure <laughs> did. He thought I wouldn't notice that they'd switch the rugs around, but I did. <laughs> That'll teach him. Yes, Patsy. This is one time when a woman's instinct for interior decoration really solved a murder. Well, Nick, how about a glimpse into next week's story of intrigue and adventure? You used the right word that time, Ken. Because next week I'm going to tell you a story in which intrigue is the keynote. A man in the death house with only nine hours to live asked me to prove him innocent of the charge in which he'd been convicted. He claimed he was the victim of a frame-up. And when Nick really got into the case, he found that the whole thing was a frame-up, but not quite the way we expected. You mean you investigated the case and found a solution in only nine hours? That's right, Ken. They were a very busy nine hours, and a man's life hung in the balance. What do you call your story, Nick? I call it Nine Hours to Live. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In The Adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Scubby by John Kane. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. is the mutual broadcasting system. Dum. 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 What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's Nine Hours to Live, another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. And now for some late.
night news. Nine hours from now, at the stroke of midnight, Johnny Waldron, the bland-faced killer convicted of the murder of Mrs. Cornelius Fielding, will go to the chair. And just 30 minutes ago, the condemned man made a last request. But Johnny Waldron did not ask for a sumptuous last meal in the tradition of the condemned, nor did he ask to see his nearest and dearest relative, his wife, Laura. No, Johnny Waldron's request was far more dramatic. He asked to see the great detective, Nick Carter. What this last-minute conference means is anybody's guess. Perhaps a reprieve for Waldron. Perhaps a clue as to what happened to the fielding jewels, which up to now have not been found. At any rate, the master detective, Nick Carter, has consented to talk with Waldron and probably is at this moment entering Death House Row. Keep tuned to this station for further dramatic developments. Where have you got him, guard? Uh, he's in number one. Moved him there this morning. Shorter waves to walk the chair from number one. Is he all ready to go? Yep. Yeah, Barber was in, shaved his head and legs about an hour ago. How's he taking it? Uh, he ain't been a peep out of him. Don't want nothing to eat. Don't want a chaplain. Nothing. Only request he's made to see you. <laughs> Funny time to ask to see a detective. Uh, if you don't mind my asking, Mr. Carter... What made a big shot like you decide to see him? Well, maybe I'm curious to know what's on his mind. Or maybe I'm just a softy about a fellow who's going to die in a few hours. <laughs> I don't believe you got any sympathy for a killer. You're not you. Uh, here we are. Here's your company, Waldron. Oh, hiya, Mr. Carter. Hello, Waldron. You got five minutes. All right, guard. Well, Johnny? Oh, so you came. I I was afraid you wouldn't. I must admit I was surprised when the warden called and said you wanted to see me. Yeah, I imagine you were. Oh, it was sure nice of you to come. Skip the formalities, Johnny. Time's too short for chit-chat. Come to the point. What's on your mind? Mr. Carter, you think I'm guilty, don't you? Well, I didn't follow your case too closely, but you had a fair trial, and you were found guilty. What would you have me believe? I'd like to have you believe I'm innocent. Pretty late in the game to convince anybody of that, John. Oh, I'm not looking for a last-minute reprieve. That isn't what I called you out here for, but... When I got word a little while ago that the governor had refused my last request for a reprieve, I... I made up my mind that I'd only be kidding myself to hope any longer. And why did you want to see me, Johnny? Mr. Carter, I know I haven't got a chance. I'm going to be gone in just a few hours now, but... I could go a lot easier if I thought maybe someday the world would know the truth would know that Johnny Waldron is innocent. Johnny, if I thought you were innocent, I'd start the wheels turning right now to get you a reprieve. Oh, wait, let me finish, Mr. Carter. I know you don't believe me. Nobody does. And I couldn't expect you to believe me after the way things went at the trial, but... Well, as I've been sitting here in death row waiting, the idea came to me maybe Nick Carter would show him someday. Well, of course, I'd be gone, but... Well, you see, there's Laura, my wife... She's going to keep on living, and what well, it'll be hard for her. I suppose she believes you're innocent. Oh, she's stuck by me swell. Oh, she's a wonderful woman. I, I don't want the world to look on her as the widow of a murderer. Mr. Carter, all I'm asking you is that after I'm gone and, well, in your spare time, if you'll try to prove they executed the wrong man just, just for my wife's sake. Johnny, if you're innocent, who do you think did rob the Fielding safe and kill Mrs. Fielding? I don't know, Mr. Carter. There's nobody you even suspect? Well, the only one that I... Oh, no. No, I'm not going to accuse somebody I'm not sure of. I I only got a few hours more to live and... Now, listen, Johnny. If you want me to do anything for you, you better tell me everything you can about this. Oh, no. You, you'll find them for yourself once you start looking. Well, I've got to have some kind of evidence to go on. But I don't have any. The cards were stacked too well against me, but... But go see Laura. She never stopped working for me. Maybe she knows more by now. Look here. If that's the case, why haven't you had a lawyer working for you right up to the last minute? Lawyers? <laughs> I never had that kind of dough. Oh, a couple of shysters came around thinking maybe I had the fielding jewels tucked away someplace, but, well, when they found out they weren't going to get a cut, they faded it pretty fast. Even if you do anything for me, Mr. Carter, I won't be able to pay you for your trouble. You'd have to do it just as a favor to a dying man. You don't know where the jewels are? No, Mr. Carter. Hmm. How could I know? I didn't do that job. 
Look, go see Laura. She'll tell you whatever she can. Time's up, Mr. Carter. All right, guard. Well, Johnny, I'll look into your case. I don't suppose you'll believe me when I say that I'm... <laughs> I bet he's been telling you an innocent man's being sent to the chair. Tells everybody that. Did it ever occur to you that he might be telling the truth? Uh, well, well, why are you... So long, Johnny. Good luck. Well, thanks for coming, Mr. Carter, and thanks for whatever you do for me. I'd very much like to know what happened to the Fielding Jewel. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, well, well, maybe they'll turn up while you're investigating. You think so? I wonder. Say, guard, how long is it now until... Eight hours, Johnny. Just eight more hours. <laughs> Patsy Bowen speaking. Patsy, this is Nick. Oh, Nick, thank heaven you called. This place is a madhouse. The office is filled with reporters. The newspaper and broadcasting companies have been telephoning. The district attorney's been trying to reach you. Now, what's and... the matter? Well, they want to know if you're going to try to get a reprieve for Johnny Waldron. What? And the DA said he'd stick around his office all evening. And he's contacted the governor, and he'll be on tap ready. Reprieve? Great heaven, I just talked to the fellow. I don't have any evidence, none whatsoever. What's the matter with the DA? Well, he says that when you go to work on a case, even at the zero hour, something usually pops. Now tell him to hang onto the hats a while. And you, Patsy, go up to the courthouse and get a transcript in the Walden trial. And dig what you can out of our files about him. Uh-huh. I'm heading back from state's prison right away. I'll meet you in front of the office. All right, Nick. We're going to have to work fast. They throw this switch in exactly seven hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> Well, Waldron was really hired as a chauffeur, Nick. Mm -hmm. But it was brought out at the trial that he tried to get in right with the old lady every chance he got. You know, Mrs. Fielding was an invalid. Yeah. And Waldron used to carry her up and down stairs and waited on her, all all that sort of thing. He was inside the house a great deal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, then let's see. Oh, the gun. The gun she was killed with was traced to Mrs. Fielding's stepson, Tom Fielding. Uh But the prints on the gun were Waldron's. The stepson Fielding. You live there with her? Ah, uh, just the two of them. Mm-hmm. Waldron and all the other servants slept out and reported for work in the mornings at 8. When was the body found? Uh, on a Thursday night at 10 o'clock in the library of the house. Fielding came home from his club and found her. The safe was open, the jewels and the money gone. Of course, any of the servants, as well as Fielding himself, might have known the combination to the safe. Mrs. Fielding often opened it in front of them all. Uh, the defense harped on that at the trial. But Waldron's prints on the gun and his alibi being so flimsy, well, just cooked his goose. I see. Nick, how did Waldron strike you? Guilty? It's the evidence that tells the tale in any case, Bessie. We could find the party who has the missing fielding jewels. Ha <laughs> ha, it would look pretty grim for that party. Wouldn't look good, that's certain. Oh, Nick, look at the time. 5.50. In six hours and ten minutes, an innocent man may be electrocuted. No innocent man will be electrocuted for a crime he didn't do if I can possibly help it. And here's our first stop, Betsy. His old tenement house. Laura Waldron lives here. You're very nice to come to see me, especially today. Mrs. Waldron, this is my assistant, Patsy Bowen. How do you do, Miss Bowen? Hello, Mrs. Waldron. Won't you two sit down? Oh, here, here, let me dust the chair. Oh, no, don't. It's perfectly all right. Well, since Johnny's been away, I... I haven't been as good a housekeeper as I used to be. No heart for it anymore. Even this one room of mine... Mrs. Waldron, I came to see you because... You went to see my husband, I know. I, I heard it on the radio. That's right. But it's too late to get Johnny off, isn't it? And besides, we don't have any money to pay for a famous detective like you. Mrs. Waldron, the only thing Nick Carter ever asked is that justice be done. Now tell me about Johnny. His habits, what he likes, what he doesn't like. Johnny's good, Mr. Carter. You see, I know he's innocent. Have you proof, Mrs. Waldron? Proof? No. No, just my heart tells me he wouldn't kill anybody. But more than that, I know because he was with me at the time the police say she was killed. The prosecution tore that alibi to shreds. Yes, a wife's testimony doesn't count for much in court. And yet how thankful I am that he was with me that night, that that I know he's innocent. You understand what I mean, don't you, Miss Bowen? Yes. You understand when I say the world can stand against your man, but if you know he's right and and good and true... Oh, Mrs. Warren... (laughs) 
Isn't there any way at all it, it can be proved that your husband was home with you that night? Oh, no, no. You don't think of providing alibis or staying in your own home. If you can call one room in a place like this home. I don't know what will become of me now that Johnny's going... Well, Tom Fielding has offered to help me, but... Tom Fielding? You mean the stepson of the woman your husband is convicted of murdering? Yes. In what way has he offered to help you? Money. He knows Johnny isn't a murderer. Uh, his testimony in court didn't follow that line, Mrs. Waldron. Oh, of course not. Mr. Fielding had himself to protect. Well, that's right, Nick. Fielding was under suspicion. Just this afternoon he called again. And where are the jewels, I said to him. If my Johnny did it, where are the jewels and the money? Would I be begging for work if Johnny had done it? You're working now, Mrs. Waldron? Day work. Scrubbing up places where they don't ask too many questions, but... But I'd mop the streets of this town from one end to the other every day if... If Johnny didn't have to die. Oh, don't, Mrs. Waldron. Don't cry. Oh, you'll have to excuse me. It's just that I can't stand to think. I, I'm counting the minutes and seconds now. Only a few more hours and... Oh, Johnny will be gone. Mrs. Waldron, I'd like to ask you another question, if I may. All right, Mr. Carter. Maybe Nick can save your husband yet. Oh, if he only could. There isn't time left for me to chase down every witness and question him. Now, tell me, Mrs. Waldron, whom do you suspect of robbing and murdering your husband's late employer? Who? Oh, Mr. Carter, I have no proof against anyone. I didn't ask if you knew who murdered Mrs. Fielding. I only said, whom do you suspect? But I have no right to suspect him. Right. What do you mean? Oh, he's been so kind and offered to help. Tom Fielding, that's who you think did it. Well, I've never dared to think it out loud before. He was her stepson, you know, but she loved him like her own. Oh, they had their quarrels, but they were just money spats. I'm not saying he did it, only... Only what? Uh, will you talk to him, Mr. Carter? All right, I will. We'll go right over to the Fielding house now. Oh, but you won't find him at home at this hour, Mr. Carter. He's always at the club at this time. Uh, I know from when Johnny used to drive for him. That's the old hunt club, isn't it? Yes. At 10th and 8th. Well, come on, let's hurry. Time's precious. Okay. Uh, goodbye, Mrs. Waldron. Goodbye, and thank you. I'll be right here waiting and, and praying you find the guilty man in time to save Johnny. There's something puzzling you. What is it? Didn't you think Mrs. Walden's story made sense? Well, it did, and it didn't. But, Nick, doesn't it seem a bit odd for Tom Fielding to offer her money? Yes, if that's true. Well, then her story does make sense. Patsy, it's not what Mrs. Waldron said that's bothering me. Something else. Something else? What, Nick? I wish I knew. There's something about her that puzzles me. Something that doesn't fit into the picture. It's in the back of my mind somewhere, aren't I? can't quite seem to get hold of it. If you ask me, Tom Fielding is the one who could straighten out a lot of things. Well, he's the man we're going to tackle right now. Hmm. This hunt club is pretty swanky, isn't it? Uh-huh. Oh, good evening, sir. Can I park your car for you? Oh, no, thanks. We won't be here very long. Oh, I uh, beg your pardon, miss. Ladies aren't permitted in the old hunt club. I'm sorry. Well, that lets you out, Patsy. Mm, yes, I guess it does. You better wait for me here. <sighs> I guess I'll have to. Oh, oh, Nick. Yes? It's 8.15. Only three hours and 45 minutes to go until midnight. <sighs> oh. Ring again, Nick. Fielding wasn't at his club, so he's got to be home here. Uh-uh. Your womanly intuition isn't working right tonight, Patsy. No. There's not a light in the whole house. I don't think anybody's home. Oh, Mr. Tom Fielding, if you only knew how much time we've wasted looking for you. Well, Patsy, even if Mr. Fielding isn't at home, I think we'll see what evidence we can uncover. Huh? I don't like waiting. What? Well, what are you going to do? In the interest of Johnny Waldron and his wife, Laura, I'm going to do a little high-class lock picking. <laughs> ah, there we are. Come on. Stay behind me. Whoa. It's dark in here. Shut the door. I'll use my flash. Where are we headed for? The library. Oh. That's the room Mrs. Fielding was killed in, wasn't it? Uh-huh. Let's see. 
And these old houses, the libraries, usually back this way off the center hall. Come on. Ah, uh, Nick, suppose there's somebody beside us in the house. Well, let's hope there isn't. Ah, here we are. Yes, this is the library. What are we looking for, Nick? Right now, I'm looking for Mrs. Fielding's safe. Safe? Mm-hmm. Safe? Oh, yes. Uh, it's behind that portrait of her. I remember that from the testimony. Thanks. Turn on that small lamp and take a glance through the papers on the desk while I open this safe. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, say, if Mrs. Fielding held her son in air down while she was living, he's certainly making up for it now. Look at that wine cabinet crammed full of black market stuff. Oh, hey, look at this for swank. Have a gold tip cigarette, Miss Bowen? Why, yes, thank you, I will. That's a shame on you. Huh? How'd you feel if Tom Fielding walked in here and caught you swiping his expensive cigarettes? Only one, Nick, for a souvenir. And for that matter, how would you feel if Mr. Fielding walked in and saw you about to open his safe? Oh, Nick! Are you okay? Uh, uh, yes, I... The shot through the window. Bullet went into the side of the desk here. We better get out of here, Nick. Now, one minute, Patsy. I've got to see what's in this safe. It's almost open now, I think. Um, Nick, who, who do you think shot at us? Mr. Fielding? Oh, dig that bullet out of the desk. It'll be a handy piece of evidence. All right. Say, you're taking this attempt to murder us awfully lightly, Nick. I don't think it was murder, Patsy. Huh? You were standing by the wine cabinet, not four feet from the window, and I was a perfect target standing here. Patsy, I think you'll find somebody was just trying to scare us away. Oh... Uh, I got the bullet out, Nick. Hmm. Looks like a thirty-two. Ah, there we are. Patsy. Yes? Look here. The missing jewels. Oh, Nick. Yes, right here in Fielding's safe. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. Hey, what are you doing? I'm getting the DA on the phone for you. You've got the evidence for Johnny Walden's reprieve. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I knew he wasn't guilty, Nick. Mrs. Walden was telling the truth. Patsy, put that phone down. But, Nick. Put it down. Oh, but, Nick... Get me you... police headquarters first. I want a general alarm sent out for Tom Fielding. But Johnny Waldron... I still have two hours. If Waldron is innocent, I'll prove it in time to save him from the chair. Nick, why should you want to talk to Mrs. Waldron again when you haven't asked for the reprieve? It'll only make her feel worse. There's something about her that doesn't quite add up, Patsy. I've got to know what it is before I can go further. This is her door, isn't it? Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, Nick Carter, your thinking on this case is beyond me. Well, it's hard to explain, Patsy. When I don't know myself what the missing link is, how can I explain it to you? But you found the jewels. Tom Fielding had them in his own safe. Why, it's perfectly obvious. He didn't get along with his stepmother and therefore... Nick, what are you doing? Going to open Mrs. Waldron's door. Oh, oh, don't do that. I'm sure she's here. She's probably been crying and doesn't want to see anyone. Let me call to her first. Mrs. Waldron? Mrs. Waldron? Sorry, Patsy, but we haven't any time to waste. Now, let's see. Where's the light switch? Uh, here by the door. Oh, she isn't here. So it seems. Nick, look here. There's a gold-tipped cigarette in this ashtray. Hmm? The same kind we saw at Fielding's house. Let's have it. Oh, no lipstick on it. Kind of pinched in at the end. Just as if... He's been here... Why, I never would have believed it of him. Believe what? Well, that a man like Fielding would come to a place like this. Why, a man like that wouldn't get his hands dirty putting them on the doorknob of a hovel like this. Hmm? Say that again, Patsy. I said a man like Fielding wouldn't dirty his hands on the doorknob of a I place... I got it. Patsy, you just gave me the key I've been looking for. Huh? Come on, we've got to hurry back to Tom Fielding's library, or there may be another murder. <laughs> times when having a siren on this car comes in handy. And tonight's one of them. I hope we're in time. Do you think the police have picked Fielding up yet, or do you think he'll be at his home? Uh, he's at home. I'll bet my bottom dollar on that. Nick, do you know what time it is? Stop worrying about the time. Come on, come on. Uh, I'm right with you. The place is still dark. There's a little light shining in the hallway. Oh, he's here, all right. Watch your step, Betsy. Don't worry about me. I slipped the latch on the front door when we left. Let's see if it's been bolted. Uh-huh. Ah, still open. Come on. Uh-huh. Where do you think he is? Library, probably. I hear someone, Nick. They're both here. That's Mrs. Waldron's voice. Oh, open the door, Nick. It's locked. I'm not up to try to pick it. Oh, Nick. Nick, hurry. I am hurrying. 
Help! Oh, Nick, Help! please. Oh, oh, Nick, he's killed her. He's killed her. There. Mrs. Walgren. Oh, thank heaven you came. He, he was just going to shoot me. I, I got the gun away from him, and I... And you shot him. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter, but it was self-defense. I swear it was. Oh, Mrs. Walgren, it's too bad you had it to go... It was worth it. It was worth it. Now Johnny will be saved. He won't have to die in the chair. Nick, you've only seven minutes to call. It's seven minutes to twelve. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. Please, hurry. Now, just a minute. Just a minute. But... Calm yourself, Mrs. Walgren. <sighs> Here. Have a cigarette. Uh, a cigarette? All right. May I light it for you? Oh, thanks. If you wait just a moment till I get my cigarette holder out of my bed. So you do use a cigarette holder. I thought so. Nick, the time is getting awfully short for your call to the DA. I'm not going to make that call. Why, Nick? Not going to make it? No, Mrs. Walgren. It was a nice frame-up you and your husband tried against Tom Fielding, but it didn't work. Frame-up? Yes, frame-up. You and Johnny staged this whole thing to get him a last-minute reprieve. It was very clever, but you made a couple of bad mistakes. For example, this gold-tipped cigarette butt I found in your room tonight. What about it? When I found this butt in your ashtray, all pinched in at the end from having been smashed in a holder, I knew you had lied about not having seen Tom Fielding. These particular cigarettes are made to order for him. I didn't leave it there. I couldn't be sure of that until I found that you used a cigarette holder. Then I knew I was right. You did leave it there. Go on and prove it. Another thing. Patsy, take a look at Mrs. Waldron's hands. My hands? Why, they're beautiful. Beautifully manicured. Exactly. Mrs. Waldron, with hands like yours, you don't scrub floors for a living. That dingy one room of yours is merely a front. Look what? out, Nick. A gun, huh? Yes. I know how to use this gun, too. And I'm going I'll to... I'll die for you. Uh... Sorry I had to hit you, Mrs. Waldron. Patsy, take uh-huh. a look at Tom Fielding. See if he's still alive. Right, Nick. You haven't anything on me. You can't get me for this. Good. Phone for an ambulance, quick. Okay. But, Nick, can you prove this charge against Mrs. Walden? Can you be positive that she and her husband framed Fielding? Not yet, Patsy. But I'm so sure I'm right that I'll risk my reputation on it. Oh, but, Nick, as long as there's the slightest doubt about it, shouldn't you call the DA and give Johnny Walden the benefit of the doubt? No, Patsy. As far as I'm concerned, there's no doubt whatsoever. I'm so sure I'll even risk Johnny's life on it. Hello, Nick Carter's office. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Yes. Uh Uh-huh. It was. He is? I see. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Uh, Yes, I'll tell Nick. Goodbye. Was that the report from police headquarters, Patsy? Yes, it was Sergeant Madison. You were right, Nick. Ah. That gun you took from Mrs. Walton was registered in Johnny's name. And she lied about taking the gun away from Fielding and shooting him in self-defense. Fielding's fingerprints weren't on the gun anywhere. But hers were all over it. Did they check the bullet you picked out of the desk? The one that was fired at us earlier this evening? Uh Uh-huh. It came from the same gun. Uh Uh-huh. What about Fielding? Matty say? Uh, He's going to live. In fact, he's already regained consciousness long enough to make a statement. Good. Oh, that Mrs. Waldron was clever, wasn't she? Yes, Patsy, very clever. She and Johnny had that all fixed up in advance. As soon as she knew we were going to investigate the case, she suggested we see Fielding. And then while we were looking at him, she rushed to his apartment and planted the jewels, which she was keeping for Johnny, in Fielding's safe. But he came in and caught her at it. Why, Nick, that's exactly what Mr. Fielding's statement said she did. She had a gun and held Fielding up and knocked him out. And she bound him, gagged him, and hid him away in one of the back rooms and waited for us to arrive as she knew we would. And shot at us to make us think Fielding was trying to scare us off. Exactly. Oh. Oh, but, Nick, you haven't even heard Fielding's statement. How how can you know all this? Well, Patsy, it's very simple. Hmm? When I examined him after she shot him, I noticed there was a bad bump on the back of his head. The marks were still on his wrists and ankles where she tied him up. Oh, Nick, you're... You're always holding out on me. And one other thing. What made you think Fielding's life would be in danger way back when we were in Mrs. Waldron's apartment the second time? (laughs) Curious, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Well, Patsy, after your inspired remark about hands, I suddenly realized what it was about Mrs. Waldron that puzzled me. It was her hands. I knew that with hands like hers, she couldn't be earning her living scrubbing floors. (laughs) I see. And if she were lying about that, it was very probable she was lying about everything. And the whole thing was a plot to make Fielding look guilty. Yeah, Uh, but why should that make you suddenly afraid that something might be going to happen to Fielding? Patsy, if she and Johnny were so anxious to get Johnny a reprieve that they were willing to give up the jewels to make it look as if Fielding were really the guilty man, it was entirely possible that she might go further and kill Fielding and try to make it look as if he'd killed himself. Yeah, but how would that help Johnny Waldron? If it was done right, it would look as if he were remorseful at having let Johnny take the blame. 
And she almost got away with it. But she didn't, because Nick arrived in the nick of time. <laughs> You're a wonderful detective, Mr. Carter. <laughs> And so, ladies and gentlemen, at midnight last night, Johnny Waldron went to the electric chair to pay for the crime of having murdered Mrs. Cornelius Fielding. His dramatic last-minute attempt to get a reprieve failed, thanks to the quick action of that master detective, Nick Carter. In those few short hours that Carter was actually on the case, he found the missing jewels, uncovered a well-laid plot between Johnny and his wife to pin the murder on Tom Fielding, and saved Fielding's life. Tom Fielding and the entire community owe a debt of gratitude to Nick Carter. liked them before, you'll like them now. What do I mean? Well, during the war, you called them war bonds, and then you knew them as victory bonds. Now they are called United States Savings Bonds. But whatever the name, they're still the best way to save money. They're still the finest and safest investment you can make. Their return of $4 for each three you put into them and their ready availability offer you the ideal way of saving money for your future. Whether you buy them from your bank or post office, or whether you buy them on the payroll savings plan, they help to ensure your financial security. United States savings bonds, the same bonds you've been buying for years, are available in the same denominations as before and bear the same high rate of interest. And one last word. Don't sell the bonds you now have. While they are redeemable any time after 60 days from date of purchase, hold on to them. Make your money work for you by buying and holding... United States Savings Bonds. Well, Nick, what do you have lined up for us next week? Another exciting adventure? It was exciting, Ken, but Nick was on the receiving end of the excitement for once. Well, how do you mean, Patsy? Well, Nick met two dear little old ladies, Ken, and what they did to him. <laughs> oh, my. Yes, I blush every time I think of that episode in my career. Say, is this a detective story or what? Oh, it's a story of crime and its solution, all right, but between the beginning and the end, we're... The two charming elderly females. <laughs> I hope I don't miss that. What do you call it? I call it the case of the little old ladies. Nick Carter, Master Detective which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In The Adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Barth Conry. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. But, Mr. Sweet, that sort of thing is entirely out of my line. Yes, I suppose it is, Mr. Carter, but after all, you are our official investigator. All right, all right. I'll have one of my men take care of it. Now, tell me again what you want me to do. One of our clients is being sued as a result of an automobile accident in which a woman was very severely injured. Our client got the name of one witness, but another witness got away before he could find out who he was. Now, our client says he was a very tall, thin chap with red hair. 
probably in his late twenties. A bystander told him that he thought this man lived just a couple of blocks away. That's all we know about him. But his testimony is extremely important to us in our defense of the case. We must find him at once. All right, Mr. Sweet, we'll find him. Where was the collision? Corner of Boylston Avenue and second place on the north side. And this red-haired young man lives a couple of blocks from there in some unknown direction? That's what we believe, Mr. Carter. All right, all right. I'll send Mr. McGlynn out at once. Thank you. As soon as we have something definite, I'll let you know. began a case the like of which had never been encountered by Nick Carter, Master Detective. A search for a missing witness seemed like a simple routine job. But Nick didn't know about the two old ladies who lived in the little house on the edge of town. You'll learn all about it in The Case of the Little Old Ladies. And you say you don't know nobody was right here? No, I don't. <sighs> I'm trying. Of all the jobs for a great detective like me, going from door to door looking for a guy who probably don't even exist. I never knew Nick to fall for such a dumb stunt before, and he had to wish it on me. I don't know why I don't quit. Forty-seven houses I've been to. Nobody ever seen a guy like I'm looking for. But I heard about every kind of fellow but the kind I want. If yes? I... Yes? Who is it, please? Uh, good morning, I wonder if you can tell me anything about a tall, thin young man about 26, 28 years old with red hair. Well, now, let me see. I know almost everybody in this neighborhood. We've lived here a great many years. Mm. If you'll come in, I'll ask my sister if she recalls such a person. Oh, now, ma'am, I don't want to put you to no trouble. Oh, no trouble at all. We'll be glad to help you if we can. Do come in, please. Well, well all right. Of course, I want to find this fellow, so if you of can help... Of course you do. It is. Yes? Will you come here a minute, dear? What is it, Mary? Can I... Oh, Edith, this is Mr... Uh, Mr. Waldo McGlynn, ma'am. Uh, Chief Assistant to Nick Carter. <laughs> Mr. McGlynn. Uh, how do you do, Mr. McGlynn? How are you, ma'am? Mr. McGlynn says he's looking for a tall, thin young man with red hair, about 26 or 28 years old. Do we know such a man? Well, now let me see. Uh, there was James Bond. He used to live down the block next to Moshe's. Oh, but he moved away last year. Oh, his hair was really almost blonde, dear. Do you suppose he could mean Walter Castle? Oh, he... sister, he must be near at 35. I suppose you're right, Edith. Uh, how about young Ed Terrence? He lives over on the next street. Oh, no, sister, he's short. Almost as short as Cousin Elmer is. Mm, so he is. Oh, look, ladies, it's awful good of you to take all this trouble just to help me find this young man, but I don't no, know what to... trouble at all, Mr. McGlynn. We just don't seem to be able to do Mary, it. Uh, maybe Mr. McGlynn would like a cigar while he's waiting. Of course, I'll get him one. They're in the box on the table behind him. Oh, no, but... don't get up, Mr. McGlynn. I'll get it for you. <laughs> I, I hate to have you doing all this for me, ladies. If you Mr. Yes, McGlynn, don't move. Just sit where you are. What in the name this of... This is a gun you feel on the back of your neck. And if you don't stay very quiet, it'll go off. Well, and I... you'll never find this young man you're not looking for. Not looking for? Uh, shall I tie him up now, Mary? Yes, Edith. Tie him up right in his chair so he won't have to move at all. Oh. And tight enough so he can't move. <laughs> very well, Mary. I brought the rope as we planned. But, but look, look here, ladies. I just want to find a fellow... You can't fool us, Mr. McGlynn. We know why you're here. You came here to try to trap us into a confession. But we were too smart for you. Now that you've found out where we live, we'll have to go away, of course. That's why we have to tie you up. So you can't follow us. Oh, Mary, Bill isn't going to like this. He trusted us and now look what has happened. We've failed him. I know it. I can't imagine how this man found out, but I'm afraid Bill will never forgive us, sister. What in the name of all the holy are you dames talking about? You know well enough, Mr. McGlynn. You don't have to ask us what we've done. If you didn't know, why are you here? There, now, there. He can't get out of that, I'm sure. Oh, look, ladies. Nick 
Carter ain't going to like this. Not at all. He says I always get things balled up, and now he's... Oh, don't he... you worry, Mr. McGlynn. He can't blame you. We're just too clever for you and your Mr. Carter. Uh, come, sister, we must pack and... Uh, what is it that all good thieves say? Oh, yes. We must pack and scram. <laughs> you are, Waldo. Free as a bird. Oh, thanks, Cubby Boy. Oh, dear. Can't move. I'm as stiff as a board. Ah, oh, you'll be all right in a minute or two. <laughs> now, listen, Waldo. You say these two old ladies tied you up so as to give them time to move out? Yeah, that's what they said, Nick. They thought I had the goods on them for something I didn't know nothing about. Well, couldn't you guess what that something was from what they said? Yeah, not a single guess could I give, Nick, but... They was altogether too cagey for me. Uh, One of them said something about thieves, but that was all. Oh, by the way, Nick, I forgot to ask you, how did you happen to find me here? That was easy. Patsy told us what route you were planning to follow, and we followed you. Oh. You had called at the house on the left, but you never got to the one on the right. This house being empty, it was a good bet that you were here. Nick unlocked the door, and here you were, waiting for us. Waiting for you? And what else could I be doing but wait? Ah, <laughs> oh, you and your bum jokes. Now listen, brother, you listen. There's something going on here that's bigger than a lost witness. And I'm going to find out what it is. But what can we do, Nick? Waldo doesn't know what it's all about and the old ladies have gone. So what do we have to go on? Nothing. We've got to find something. And the best place to start looking is right here in this house. So search every room thoroughly. Don't miss a thing. Now get busy, both of you. And all you found was that burned paper? That's all, Patsy. Uh, and what good that is, I'm darned if I can see. When a piece of paper is burned as bad as that was, so you can't even see if it had writing on it or not, I give up. Oh, that's where science comes in, Waldo. Uh, if science can tell Nick what was on that paper, I'll take my hat off to it. Even old Sim Carter couldn't do that. The use of infrared light and in reading the writing on a burned paper is one of the new developments that have oh, come Nick, in... Oh, Nick, did you find anything worthwhile? Maybe yes and maybe no. Fortunately, that burned paper we found on the ashtray was a good grade of paper and didn't crumble before I could look it over. Well, what'd you find, Nick? That piece of paper was really two separate pieces of paper. One was a wrapper off a bundle of bills, showing that the package was put up by the first mutual bank on Canal Street and had contained $100, probably in small bills. The other was part of a letter. Oh, what did it say? All I could make out was, another month, dear aunts, it'll be safe to use the money. So we... And that's all. Mm, that's a lot of help, that is. Patsy, do we have any record of the first mutual bank being robbed in the last year or so? Oh, I'll, I'll see, Nick. The money this wrapper was on obviously came straight from the bank. No, nothing on the first mutual at all. But the records show there was a payroll robbery about six months ago, hmm. in which the payroll messenger was robbed of $153,000 that came from that bank. What was the firm that was robbed? It was the Brownson Industrial Corporation, just across the river. You know that big plant on Market Street? All right. Let's call on the Brownson Industrial Corporation. I'm going to see this thing through to the end. You want to see me, mister? I do. You're the payroll messenger? It was robbed about six months ago? Who are you? This is Nick Carter. Tell him what oh. you know about it. Oh, okay, yeah. The guards that came with me from the bank left me at the side door of the office building as usual, and I came along inside. There's a short corridor there, about ten feet long, with a turn at the end, leads into the general office. Well, I was just coming to the turn when a couple of old ladies stopped me uh, and... Nick. Later, Walter, well, no later. You say two old ladies? Yeah. This couple of old ladies stopped me and asked me how to get to the metal shop. I stopped to tell them when all of a sudden I got a sock on the back of the head. Not me cold. Then what happened? How do I know? I was out cold. And when I came to, the assistant cashier was bending over me, trying to wake me up. My money bag was cut open. The money was gone. Every nickel of it. Did anyone else see these two old ladies around? Yeah, yeah. The gate man who let them in. They said they was coming to see their nephew, Walter Bascom, a clerk in the office here. So he let them go by without waiting for an okay. 
but Bascom never saw him. He says he ain't even got an aunt. And he didn't leave his desk all afternoon. Were they seen after the robbery? Oh, they was out of the gate before the alarm was give out. The gate man saw him go. Can you describe them? Well, they looked like a couple of sweet little old ladies. Maybe like your pet grandmother. One was short and chubby. The other was about middle-sized, kind of kind of slender-like. The same, Nick. The very same. You're sure of that, Walter? There couldn't be no mistake, Nick. Look, you didn't find any clues as to who slugged you. No suspects at all? Nah, not a one. But it must have been somebody works in here. Couldn't have happened like it did no other way. Uh, okay, thanks. Well, so long. Well, Nick, looks as if this is as far as we go. No, Matty, there's just one more chance. Huh? I have the photograph I made of the piece of burned letter we found at the old lady's place. Yeah? If the writer was the thief, it seems very probable. And if he does work here, as that messenger seemed to think, we might compare the writing on the letter with samples of the writing of the employees in the plant. Oh, but, Nick, that would take forever. There are several thousand employees here. Uh, yeah, them two dames would die of old age before we got that job done, like as not. Nick! Yes, Waldo? I just happened to remember. When them two old dames was tying me up, they kept talking about somebody named Bill. Hmm? Huh? You sure of that? Sure, I'm sure. They said this Bill was going to be pretty sorry at them for getting found out. Oh, Nick, this makes the search for the thief a whole lot easier. Why, sure. We just look at the handwriting of every guy in the plant named William. There may be a lot of them, but it'll be a whole lot easier than checking up on everybody who works here. Well, Waldo, it looks as if you remember that name just in time. Come on. The personnel manager ought to be able to dig up a specimen of this bill's handwriting for us. Uh, much as I regret to say it, it isn't this William either. You mean to say that out of 347 guys named William who signed these employment cards the personnel manager gave us, there ain't one that writes like the sample in the photograph? To the trained eye, there's not one of them that's the same. <sighs> Oh, Nick, that means the whole theory that an employee stole the money is out the window. Yeah, that leaves us exactly nowhere. Nick, maybe the guy's name ain't William at all. Uh, Bill could stand for some other name. Why, of course, Walter, that's the answer. It must be. His name was Wilbur or Wilford. Well, come on, let's get busy. We only have a few hundred more names to look through. Is it all right? Who is you it, sure? Nick? Wilfred Bergen. Works in the stock room. Mr. Brown, where's the stock room? I'd like to talk to this Bergen. It's in the next building, back of this one. You'll probably find him at his desk. It's just to the right of the door. Uh, would you like to have me call him and tell him you want to see him? No, thanks. We don't want to warn him we're coming. We don't want him to get away before we have a talk with him. job sure was a neat setup. This Bergen watches the messenger, sees how he goes through this little corridor every time he comes back with the payroll, tells the old dames that they're, what they're to do, and it all works out just as slick as grease. Yes, the old lady stopped him in the right place, and Bergen socked him. And they shielded him while he cut open the money bag. And they calmly went home, taking their money with them, probably in one of those shopping bags women carry. And Bergen went back to work, and that was that. Yeah, and they're waiting until the money cools off so they can spend it. Uh-huh. I wonder where they hid it while they're waiting. I hope Bergen will answer that for us. There he is, Nick. Uh-oh. Yes. You Wilfred Bergen? That's right. Bergen, this is Nick Carter. He wants to ask you a few questions. Questions? About what? Bergen? Where did you hide the money you got from the payroll robbery six months ago? Why, I... I don't know what you're talking about. No? I think you're Jew. You and your aunts knocked out the messenger and stole the payroll amounting to $153,000. Now, what did you do with it? You're crazy. I had nothing to do with that. Better come clean, Bergen. We got you dead to rights. You think you can make me confess something I didn't do? You're nuts. Bergen, is this your employment card? Yes, it is. What about it? Does this photograph show part of a letter you wrote to your aunts recently? Let me see it. it hey, come back here. Stop or I'll shoot. I think he's falling down the stairs. Oh, and maybe he isn't hurt bad. You won't die, Bergen. You only got shot in the leg. My neck. My neck. I can't move. Let me see. Huh? Huh. Shot him in the leg, all right, Matty. But in falling downstairs, he broke his neck. Oh, Nick, oh, no. Smooth. Now, Bergen, see here. I'm afraid you haven't long to live. 
Before you go, tell me, where's the money? Uh, isn't there something we can do for him? Uh, I'm afraid not, Betsy. Bergen, where did you hide the money? Uh, I buried it. Where, where you'll never find it. You might as well tell us where you buried it, Bergen. We can get your ranch to tell. They'll, they'll never tell you. I did it alone. Find it if you can. I stole it. If I can't have it, no one... Is he gone, Nick? Yes, Matty. He's dead. And the secret of where he hid the money died with him. Well, look, I ain't giving up yet. If he buried it like he said, it's probably buried somewhere around that house where his aunts live. Now, I'm going to have a gang start digging there bright and early tomorrow morning. Good luck to you, Matty. I'll drop in on you later to see how you make out. Hello, Sergeant. Having fun? Hi, Matty. How are you making out? As if I couldn't see for myself. <laughs> oh, I ain't making out, Nick. We've been over this whole doggone lot and not a sign of the money. Well, apparently, Bergen must have buried it outside the limits of the property. Well, if he did, he can stay there for all of me. Do you realize, Nick, that this is the last street in this section? From here out, it's open country. And the darn stuff could be buried anywhere for the next five miles. Matty, if I can tell you right where to dig for the money, will you try it once more? Nick Carter, you've been holding out on me again, so help no, me no, out. No, no, I haven't been holding out on you. Just answer my question. Yeah, I'll try it once more. But look, if it don't work, keep away from me next time I see you. Okay, Matty. Meet me here in the morning about 10 o'clock. I may have something for you. So long. So long, Sergeant. Uh, Nick, hmm? you really have an idea? I do. I believe I can come back here tonight and locate the exact spot for him. Well, tell me, Nick, what's your plan? I'm going to get hold of an army officer I know and have him help me. Help you what? Locate the money. Is that all you're going to tell me? That's all for now. I like to surprise you, Patsy. Oh, someday you'll tell me something and I'll surprise you. I'll probably drop dead at your feet. Sorry this is such a blind search, Lieutenant, but as I said, we have no idea where the money was buried. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Carter. I'm used to working like this. Not too dark for you, is it? Oh, no, indeed. I've worked this gadget on darker nights than this and got results. I suppose we swing over this way for a change. We pretty well covered the ground on that side. Okay, Mr. Carter, whatever you say. Over here, maybe? Yes. If we don't find anything in this trip, I'm afraid we'll... Hey, wait a minute. To... Found something? I think so. Yes. Yes, this is it, I'm sure. No question about it? None at all. I'm certain that if you dig here, you'll find the money. Well, if the money's there... Mattie will find it. But we don't want your Mattie to find it. Who are you? We want to find it ourselves. Of course we do. The money belongs to us now. Why, of course. You're the two old ladies who tied Waldo up and left him in the house the other night. Well, what brings you back here now? The money, of course. I mean, how did you know we were out here? We didn't, but we read in the late evening paper last night that the killing of our nephew Bill had solved the payroll robbery and that the case was closed. So we felt that it would be perfectly safe to come back here and get our money. And when we did, we found you here. We've been watching you for a long time from behind the trees. Oh, yes. And now that you're here, how do you propose to go about digging it up? Oh, I'm sure we can persuade you to do that for us, Mr. Carter. Oh, really? What makes you think so? This... Hey, oh, they got a gun, Mr. Carter. We have two guns, one for each of us, and we both know how to shoot very straight. Our dear departed father taught us when we were girls. Now, look, ladies, you better let me have those guns. Uh, somebody might get hurt. Nobody's going to get hurt, Mr. Carter, if you start digging. Now, look here, a joke's a joke. This is getting Mr. too... Mr. Carter, put your hands up over your head. Oh. You too, soldier, you... Put your hands up, too. What do we do, Mr. Carter? We don't do anything. We just... Hey! That went right past my ear. Are you putting your hands above your head now, Mr. Carter? 
Now, see here, this is all very silly. I guess we better do it. I'd rather be silly than dead. That's very wise of you. Okay, okay, my hands are up. You'd better see if either of them is carrying a pistol, sister. I read in a book that that's always the first thing to do in such cases. Oh, Excuse me, please. The soldier doesn't have one. Oh, Oh, look, Edith. Mr. Carter has two pistols. <sighs> Aren't they beautiful? Oh, put them over by that stump, Mary, where they'll be safe. Now, will you start digging, Mr. Carter? I can't. I haven't a shovel. I'll get you one. I remember seeing one in the cellar of our house. It isn't a very good one, but you can use it. You wait right there. I'll be back. He'll wait for you, sister. Won't you, Mr. Carter? It looks that way. But now look here, it's no good. The police will be here before I can possibly get the hole deep enough to find the money. It's three o'clock already. Oh, then I'm afraid that will mean you'll have to hurry, Mr. Carter. We must have the money before the police come back. So you'd better take your coat off and get ready to dig real fast. Look, sister, the soldier has gone to sleep. Yes, poor dear. He must be all worn out watching Mr. Carter work. Oh, what time is it? 7.30. Oh, dear, I do hope we can find the money before the police arrive. Uh, Mr. Carter? Yes? Please dig a little faster. It's getting late. Oh, oh, oh. That's it, all right. Well, at least I have the satisfaction of knowing we found the right place. Hmm, a little after ten. Maddie ought to be here by now. Are you two still up there? Yes, we are, so don't stop digging. We must get that box before the police arrive. I don't have to dig anymore. I found it. You found it? Sister, just to wake up. Mr. Carter's found the money for us. Isn't he nice? He found it. Oh, what a lovely man he is. A soldier. Soldier. Yes, yes. Will you help Mr. Carter get the box out of the hole, please? You mean he's found it? Yes, yes, I found it. Oh, here it is. Can you reach it? Just a little higher. (coughs) Yep, that's it. I've got it. My, that isn't a very big box to hold all that money, is it? Why, I believe I could carry that myself. Of course we can. Here, soldier, I'll take it. Here you are. Thank you. Now, please jump down into the hole with Mr. Carter. What? Do what? Jump into the hole with Mr. Carter. It's big enough to hold you both. And I think we'll be gone by the time you get out. The hole is over eight feet deep. You better do as she says, Lieutenant. You know how loudly that gun of hers can speak. Okay. Watch out. <coughs> How do you do? Oh, thank you both very much. Yes, thank you so much. I hope we meet again sometime. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, I hope this story never gets around. Nick Carter and a lieutenant in the U.S. Engineers made prisoner by two little old ladies. And two little old guns. You can't forget those. Well, come on, let's get out of here. Give me a boost, will you? Yeah. And I'll haul you out. I rather think they won't get very far. Oh, I'm so glad we found this money before those horrid policemen got here. Oh, yes. We can go in the house and wrap it up so no one will know what it is. Yes. Then we can go back to our old home and live comfortably for the rest of our days. Yes, dear. Oh, watch out for that first step. Uh, that'll be far enough, ladies. Oh, oh. Stand right where you are. Wait, but where did you come from? Watch out for the matter. They're dangerous, I know. What, oh, what do you want with us, officer? I want you and I want that box of money you got there. Wait, and but... don't try reaching for your guns. It won't be healthy for you. Oh, look, Sergeant, there comes Nick and that army man. What? Oh, dear, they must...
must have gotten out of the hole. You, you mean Nick and the other guy was in the hole where that box was? Yes. We hoped they wouldn't get out till after we'd gone. That nice Mr. Carter dug the money up for us all by himself. Nick dug it up? Well, I never... Hey, hey, Mary, have you got the money? Yeah, the money and the dames both, and they won't get away from me, I can tell you. Well, I gotta say one thing for old Sim Carter. He never let a couple of old dames get him in a hole. <laughs> he knew how to handle women, he did. Uh, <laughs> what happened to all your science, Nick? The science was on their side this time, in the form of a couple of guns. And they could shoot them, too, believe me. <laughs> now, you, you both stopped razzing Nick. He did the best he could, didn't you, Nick? Yes, Patsy, I did the best I could. I stalled around with the digging until time for Maddie to show up. Of course, if they hadn't been two old ladies, I could have... Yeah, them. sure, sure, we know. If they hadn't been so weak, you could have overpowered them both, single hand. Hey, Nick, uh, tell me, how'd you ever find where that money was buried? Patsy said you was using some kind of a trick device. Well, just a mine detector, Waldo, same as they use in the war to find hidden mines. Oh. The detector can find hidden metal even when it's buried as deep as this box was. How deep was it, Nick? Eight feet. And if you don't believe me, look at these blisters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Nick, look. See that chap standing there watching us? Certainly I see him. What about him? Red hair, tall, thin. Must live in this neighborhood or he wouldn't be standing there kibitzing. Isn't that the witness Waldo started out to find? Oh, you're right, Patsy. And as Maddie has the thieves and the money and we have our witness, we can consider the case closed. Except for these blisters of mine. <laughs> Nick boy, your old father used to say, never be ashamed of honest toil. Remember that, Nick. Never be ashamed of honest toil, even if you do happen to be doing it at the point of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Nick, how about a few highlights on next week's show just to whet our appetite? Good idea, Ken. My story next week is about a man who was killed by a rifle shot, but the bullet came from the wrong gun. And the ladder was too long. The which was what? The ladder was too long. So what? That's the story, together with the fact that the boys' club met very late that night. That's enough, that's enough. What do you call this weird combination of clues? I call it the case of the wrong clue. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In The Return of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis, and Scubby by John Kane. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places, is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadcasting system. Broadcasting system. Broadcasting system. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's the case of the poker murders. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, a detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Deep in the waterfront section of the city, there lies a condemned slum area. The streets, dark and deserted, lined with empty, crumbling tenements. Deep in a grimy tenement deep within, a masked man sits in a hidden room and plays solitaire. This is the sinister master of crime known as the Ace of Spades. Yes? The six and seven are close to see you, Ace. Send them in. 
Well, here we are, Chief. Yeah, you're five minutes late. I'm sorry, Ace. The cops are watching this area. We had trouble slipping in. Since when have I accepted excuses? <laughs> yeah, boss, we know. What about the other three? Are they waiting at the rendezvous? Yes, sir. Did you both memorize my instructions? We got them down cold, Chief, but suppose there's a hitch. There won't be a hitch. The ace of spades doesn't make mistakes. Of course... If you make one... No, no, we won't, Ace. You can depend on us. All right. Now, you two had better get going. One thing. What is it, Chief? Don't forget to leave your calling cards. I don't want to disappoint my dear friend, Sergeant Matheson. With a retainer they're paying me, I have to see him. This way, Mr. Williams. Mr. Carter, my company's in trouble. Yes? Well, sit down, Mr. Williams. Tell me about it. As you know, we're the biggest underwriters in the business. But this first storage robbery yesterday, well, we can't take any more of those. Oh, the ace of spades, huh? Yes. Whoever he is, he's hit us five times in the last two weeks. We're paying out a fortune in claims. You're working with the police on this? The police? (laughs) They're helpless. The ace of spades has been too smart for them. Take that fur warehouse job last night, for instance. Yes? Every burglar alarm was cut or disconnected. The vault combinations were known beforehand. And the locations of the most valuable furs. What about the guard? Was he one of your own operatives? Yes. One of our best men, too. They locked him into one of the refrigerated vaults. Mm Mm-hmm. The ace of spades men leave the usual calling cards? Yes. It was a five-man job, apparently. They left the six, seven, eight, nine, and ten of clubs. Oh, straight flush. It's a pretty high poker hand. Among his other accomplishments, our friend seems to have a perverted sense of humor. Well, it's a brand of humor I can't say I relish. Mr. Carter, will you help us with the case? I will. Tell you the truth, Mr. Williams, I was just about to drop down and discuss it with my old friend, Sergeant Matheson, in the Homicide Division. You see, the gentleman who calls himself the Ace of Spades interests me no end. I'm looking forward to meeting him... Personally. Hmm. Black ten on red jack. Red four, black five. Yes? The Queen of Hearts is here, Ace. Queen of Hearts. Put her on. Ace, I've got to see you. I thought I told you never to come down here. I had to come just heard some news. Nick Carter... I know. He's been called in by Acme Underwriters. How did you know? I make it my business to know everything, my dear. But Ace, Nick Carter's clever. Dangerous. Yes, I know. It will be intriguing to match wits with him. Now then, my dear, you'd better run along. You've work to do tonight. Aren't you even going to see me? I'm sorry, but I'm busy. I know. You're playing solitaire. Sometimes I think you love that game more than you love me. Come, come, my dear. There's no basis for comparison. Solitaire, like every other card game, is relaxing. Women, when they're as lovely as you, are exciting. Ace, please. Good night, my dear. Nick, you won't be late for Rhoda Stanley's birthday party, will you? No, Patsy. You drop me at headquarters and go right on. I'll join you later. Uh-huh. Oh, it's funny the way I bumped into Rhoda after all these years. Hadn't seen her since college, and then all of a sudden I was standing in a nylon line at Trimble's, and there she was. Yes, and now we're going to her birthday party. Uh-huh. The minute she found out I worked with you, she insisted on our coming. She's dying to meet you, and, well, I promised to produce. You sure you don't mind, Nick? No, no, of course not, Patsy. Oh, it ought to be something. She's married to John Stanley. The banker? Uh Uh-huh, that's right. (laughs) Which is the same thing as saying she's married to $10 million. (laughs) And I was the girl in my graduating class voted most likely to succeed. Well, Patsy, it's a funny thing. Hmm? 
What's funny? Stanley's Bank, the Marine Trust, is putting up the capital to tear down that slum area where the Ace of Spades is supposed to be hiding. Oh, do you really think that's where the Ace of Spades' hideout is? Could be. There are more than 200 abandoned tenements down there. And the two patrolmen murdered in that section seem to point to it. Oh, I won't forget those two homicides in a hurry. Each of them had a playing card pinned right over the bullet holes. Yes, a pair of jacks. Fair sample of the ace's grisly humor. What kind of a man can he be anyway? Infernally clever, Betsy. We know that much. A brilliant planner with a mind that doesn't overlook the minutest details that might trap him. But why all those poker hands whenever he's pulled a job? He's an egotist. Type of criminal who glorifies in his crimes. And Joy's leaving his signatures at each one of them. Oh. This close enough, Nick? Yes, I can walk the other half block to headquarters. Nick, I... Please be careful. Don't take any chances. Now, don't worry. The ace of spades may play his cards according to Hoyle. But I'll play him any way I can to win. <laughs> Hiya, Matty. Oh, Nick. <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, for once, I'm glad to see you. This ace of spades has really got me on the merry-go-round. First, he knocks over two of our best cops. Then he kills this watchman on that warehouse job last night, and he leaves nothing, no evidence, except those blasted playing cards. Yes, I know. Nick, I tell you, this ace of spades is like a ghost. This whole case like a nightmare. Matty, have you got the cards his men left? Yeah, here they are. Common pattern. They sell hundreds of decks like this all over town. Uh, what about the... Fingerprints? Yes. No, none. We powdered every card. Even used the iodine test. Nothing to it. Suppose you searched that abandoned slum area. Look, are you kidding, Nick? Of course we did. The night Burke and Finnegan were killed, we went through it with a fine tooth comb. A devil of a job it was, too. As I can imagine. And as much that place has been blacked out ever since the city decided to dismantle their street lamps in the area to save electricity. Yeah. With all these hundreds of empty tenements, the ace could change his headquarters at will. Why, you could drive a car through there with the headlights turned off and never be seen. Yeah, I know. That's what makes it tough. The place is as black as, uh, well, the ace of spades. I got a couple of men down there now nosing around. Not that I expect to find anything. Uh. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Nolan's calling in from a call box down in that tenement area, Sergeant. Yeah. Shall I switch you on? Yeah, yeah, I'll talk to him. Hello? Hello, is that you, Sarge? Yeah. What is it, Nolan? Well, Connors and myself saw a light in one of these here tenements. What? Are you sure? Yeah, positive. The light's gone now, but we got the place spotted. Shall we go in and investigate? No, no, no. Now, now listen, Nolan. You and Connors stay there and keep your eyes peeled on that tenement. Yeah? I'll be right down with the squad. Okay, Sarge. We'll be on the corner of the big side, see? Nolan! 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 Say that call box was located at the corner of 16th Street and Avenue F, Matty? Yeah, that's right, Nick. A couple of more blocks and we'll be there. From the looks of things, you must have every cruise car on the force in this area now. Yeah. But judging by what's gone before, I don't think it's going to do us any good. Matty, just look at this area. Nothing but rows and rows of dark tenements and boarded up stores. Yeah, well, I look, know. there isn't a whole pane of glass in the place. The streets and the sidewalks are certainly littered with this place. Hey, Nick, I heard a shot. Take it easy, Matty, take it easy. One of your boys up ahead just blew a tire, picked up a piece of broken glass, probably. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, this place gives me the creeps, I guess. I... Uh-oh. There's the call box that Nolan called from. I don't see anything. You, Matty? No. Nolan and Connors must be somewhere around, one way or the other. Better hug the walls, Matty. Yeah. Right now we're out in the open like a couple of sitting pigeons. The ace... Matty. Here in this doorway. <sighs> Nolan and Connors, dead. Yes, riddled by bullets. And look, Matty. The ace left his usual calling cards. The jack of hearts on Nolan and the jack of diamonds on Connors. And Burke and Finnegan drew a pair of jacks, too, when they were murdered down here. Four jacks. Four of a kind. Well, whatever the ace of spades is, Matty, he's consistent. He's still killing. And according to Hoyle... That 
Betsy, what's happened to the master detective you promised to produce tonight? Well, I can't understand what's keeping Nick Rota. He was supposed to be here long ago. Well, we won't worry about it. Let's just have another cocktail, huh? After all, it is my wife's birthday. <laughs> As you know, Betsy, I'm a lucky woman to be Mrs. John Stanley. Look at the birthday present John gave me. This necklace. Oh, I've been noticing that, Rhoda. Matched diamonds, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's a magnificent thing. Oh, that must be Nick now. I'll get it. Uh, what the devil? All right, Stanley, get those hands up. Yeah, and fast. Hey, now, wait a minute. What does this mean? We're playing cops and robbers. That's why we're wearing these masks. But you... Shut look... up, Stanley. I'll do all the talking around here. All right, Joe, get to work on that wall safe. It's behind that picture. You know the combination. Right. John, all my jewelry's in there. Yes, I know, my dear. I'm afraid there's nothing we can do now. Or any other time. Pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Yeah, lady, I sure am. How you doing, Joe? Okay. Just got the safe open. Swell. Now, Mrs. Stanley, I'll take that necklace. Oh, John, my birthday present. Will you give it to me or do I have to tear it off your neck? Rhoda, I'm afraid you'll have to do as he says. No. No, I won't. Oh, Rhoda, your husband's right. We're helpless now. These no, men are... they're not going to take my necklace. All right, lady. Looks like I'll have to oh, rip it off that pretty white neck of yours. Take your hands oh, off my wife. Shut up, Stanley. Stay where you are. I said let her alone, you hear? Take your hands off. Oh, John! John! Nice work, pal. Yeah. Haven't had a chance to use that blackjack in a long time. You've killed him. He isn't breathing. He... Naturally, lady. That was no love tap I gave him. Oh, no. You got all that stuff out of the safe, Joe? Yeah. Everything's worked like clockwork. As the chief would say, according to plan. You'll pay for this. Both of you. That's what you think, lady. Oh, um, here's a couple of calling cards. Just to, uh, remember us by. <laughs> They left the ace of hearts and the ace of clubs, huh, Patsy? Yes, Nick, and both of the men were masked. We couldn't tell who they were. They hit John. They killed him. He tried to protect me. Oh, now, Rhoda, don't try to talk. You've had a terrible shock. Just lie back on the couch and try to rest. The doctor will be here soon. John! John! I'm sorry, Mrs. Stanley. But someday you'll have the satisfaction of seeing those killers go to the chair. Nick. One of those crooks said everything went according to plan. Do you think the Ace of Spades planned John's murder? Yes, Patsy, I do. But it was so wanton. Whenever the Ace of Spades kills, he kills for a reason. He isn't the type to kill just for the pleasure of it. Now, Patsy, did you notice anything about these thugs? Anything unusual that might give us a clue? Well, no, they were both masked, about medium height, wore black gloves. And... Wait a minute, Nick. Yes? I do remember something now. When the man who hit John with the blackjack raised his arm... I saw his cufflinks. And what about them? They were little black aces of clubs. Oh, unusual. Do they look expensive? Oh, yes, very. And not the usual kind of thing you'd pick up in a jewelry store. Probably made to order. Patsy, you're magnificent. I am, Nick? You are. You've stumbled on something we've badly needed in this case. A good lead. From now on, we're going to play a little game. A little game? Mm -hmm. Of what? A little game of poker. <laughs> Mind if I use your phone, Sergeant Matheson? No, not at all, Mr. Williams. Sergeant, my company is demanding action from you and Mr. Carter here. Yes. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Williams. Frankly, we I can't just... wait for anything much longer. You realize the losses Act Me underwriters are taking? Hello. Hello, Boulevard Garage. This is Mr. Williams. Is my car ready? What? Two new tires. I see the old ones are pretty badly cut up, eh? Well, that makes three new tires in all. Uh-huh. Oh, all right, go ahead. I suppose it can't be helped. Car trouble, huh? Yes, but that's the least of my worries, Mr. Carter. My firm's insured the Stanley Jewels along with that diamond necklace for almost $100,000. Unless you nail down the ace of spades pretty quickly. Ah, well, might as well try to nail down a ghost. We'll do what we can, Mr. Williams. I've got a lead on him now, I think. What lead? Well, I'd rather not say until I'm sure it'll be of value. Very well. I don't care how you get the ace of spades as long as you get him. And soon. Good day, gentlemen. Goodbye. Hey, Nick, what's this lead you're talking about? I'll let you know, Matty, when and if it pays dividends. Oh, by the way, did... Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Sergeant, is Nick there? Oh, yeah, sure, Patsy. Yeah, Nick, it's for you. 
Hello, Patsy. Did you find anything? Plenty. I canvassed the big jewelry stores just as you told me to do. And? After walking my feet off and talking to about a hundred supercilious jewelry clerks, I finally made a strike at Rutledge's. They make up those cufflinks? Yes. Did they have a carbon of the sales slip? Yes, Nick, they did. Ah. The man who ordered those cufflinks was Frankie Morello. Morello, huh? Good work, Patsy. Go home now. Soak your feet in hot water. I'll let you know when I need you again. Yes? Hey, Ace of Clubs is here to see you. Send him in. Hello, Chief. You sent for me? Yes, Frankie. Sit down. Thanks. Well, Chief, how'd you like the way Joe and me pulled off that Stanley job, huh? That's an interesting pair of cufflinks you're wearing, Frankie. Little aces of clubs, eh? Yeah, pretty neat if I do say so. Had them made to order. That was very careless of you, Frankie. Ace, what do you mean by that? You wore them on the Stanley job. You gave Nick Carter a clue. You'll find out who you are sooner or later. Yeah, but Chief, I... Carter's a dangerous man with a clue, Frankie. Now he hopes to get at me through you. It's going to be embarrassing to have you around. Hey, Chief, I, I didn't wear these cufflinks at the Stanleys. I swear I didn't. Oh, didn't you, Frankie? No, no, you've got to believe me. Yes. Send in the Queen of Hearts. Right. What? Meet the Queen of Hearts, Frankie. You. Yes, Frankie. It's I. Sorry, Frankie. Chief, No. No. <laughs> state of affairs, Nick. Frankie Morello, our only clue wiped out. Yes. But only you and I knew about that cufflinks clue, Nick. What is this ace of spades, a mind reader? That's who you forget. Huh? When you and I were discussing it at John Stanley's house, someone else was there who could have overheard us. Oh, Nick, you're not suggesting that Rhoda... She was in the room with us when we talked it over. Well, I know, but she was in a severe state of shock. Was she? Nick, you don't mean... I mean that things are beginning to add up. Look, Patsy. Those crooks knew where the wall safe was, even at the combination. Oh, yes, that's right. The ace of spades could have received that valuable information direct from Rhoda. Yes, but we can't be sure of that, Nick. No, but there's one thing we can be sure of. Neither you nor I tipped off the ace of spades about that cufflinks clue. And somebody did. And the ace felt it was important enough to force him to destroy the evidence, his own henchman. And it must have been Rhoda who tipped him off. She was the only other person who knew about the cufflinks. Exactly. I... Oh, I can't believe it. What? Well, I, I knew Rhoda Stanley well. Of course, I haven't seen her for... Oh, Nick, how could Rhoda be an accomplice to the murder of her husband right before her own eyes? Patsy, those jewels in the safe were insured for $100,000. That's a lot of money. Not to mention the millions that John Stanley probably left her in his will. But if Rhoda's mixed up in this, then who is the ace of spades? I've got a hunch, but I'm not positive yet. Whoever he is, he has an intimate knowledge of the jobs he tackles. And all these jobs have been pulled off against Acme underwriters. Patsy, suppose someone had easy access to the files of the company. Files? Yes, on banks, furriage, first storage vaults, and other properties, giving their floor layouts, burglar alarm setups, and so forth. A clever crook could pull off a nice, clean job with this information, couldn't he? Yes. Oh, but there might be any number of men who'd have access to this information... Adjusters, executives, insurance actuaries, any number of people on the inside. True, but we can narrow it down further. This man, this ace of spades, would not only have to be an inside man, he'd have to be someone who got around on the outside, too. Knew all these places by actual experience because he'd visited them. That's the only way he could operate the way he's doing. Wait a minute, Nick. You mean... I'm not sure, Patsy, but I hope to know within an hour. Come on, get your hat, let's go. Go? Go where? To the boulevard garage. That's where Ralph Williams keeps his car. Nick, that garage attendant looked a little suspicious when you told him you were a dealer and that Mr. Williams sent you down to make an estimate on his car. Uh, I'm going to make an estimate, all right. 
Now, here we are. Nick, you still haven't told me why you're interested in Mr. Williams' car. Not interested in the car itself. Just the tires. Uh, the tires? Yes. I understand three of his tires were cut up so badly he had to have new ones. I think I know what cut his tires that way. But I want to be sure. Well, hurry up. That, that attendant is keeping his eye on us. Patsy, I've found what I've been looking for. Nick, I just don't get it. Here, take a good look at all four of these tires. Huh? See the glass particles in the treads? There's old tires, full of them. Yes, but what do they mean? I mean that Mr. Williams has been driving this car over roads littered with broken glass. And the only place in town where there are roads like that is in the abandoned slum section. Then, Nick, what you're saying is that Ralph Williams is the ace of spades. Yes, and I'd bet every poker chip in the pot on it. Investigation, William speaking. Who? Claims Department. Oh, yes, Mr. Redden. Funny, I was just talking to Mrs. Stanley. She's right here in my office now. No, we haven't been able to break that Stanley case. The Ace of Spades got clean away with those jewels. Huh? I know it's a lot of money, but we're licked and we'll have to pay the claim. Yes, I know, and you're perfectly right. But even Nick Carter's fallen down on this one. All right, Mr. Redden. Goodbye. Well, my dear, it looks as though you're in. They're going to okay the claim. When will it come through? The cash, I mean. Sometime next week. And after that, my dear, I suggest you go away for a long vacation trip. In fact, I think I'll join you myself. It's, uh, getting pretty warm in town. Yes, come in. A messenger brought this letter for you, Mr. Williams. Oh, thank you, Miss Hamilton. Hmm. From Nick Carter. Nick Carter? I wonder what he wants. Oh, now, my dear, nothing to be nervous about. Let's see. There, there's nothing in it but a playing card. Yes. But look at that card. It's the Joker. <laughs> Nick, the messenger left William's office five minutes ago. I know. It's almost dark. He'll be out soon. What he does, Patsy, we'll tail him. Nick, why did you send him that joker? Just having a little fun in the ace's own way. But isn't that dangerous? Shouldn't we have just gone up and got him? What if he gets away? He won't. You forget one thing, Patsy. What? The loot. The ace is almost half a million dollars salted away somewhere. And he's certainly not going to leave town without picking it up. That's the big reason why I sent him the Joker. He knows we're on to him now. It'll flush him out. Of course. And he'll lead us right to the hideaway. If everything goes according to Hoyle. Nick, do you think it's in one of those slum tenements somewhere? I bet on it. Can't think of a better place to hide anything. Here, wait a minute. Hmm? Yes. Here comes Williams out of his building now. Yes, and... <gasps> Rhoda Stanley's with him. Hmm. They're getting into a taxi. All right, Betsy. Here we go. Nick, look. They've stopped at the Riverview Boathouse. Yes. They're getting into a launch. But I don't understand. This means they're not going to the tenement area. On the contrary, Betsy. You forgot one thing. The river fronts that area, and the boat running quietly with its... Lights out might get in a lot easier than a car, especially when all the streets are being watched. We can't let them get away, Nick. What now? I'm going on toward the tenement area. You get Maddie on the phone. Uh-huh. Have him throw a cordon around this entire area and tell him to notify the harbor police, too. All right, Nick. I fancy make it plain to Maddie that the harbor police are not to stop the boat. I just keep them under surveillance. We want the ace to pick up that money before he tries a final getaway. <laughs> Nick, it worked out just as you figured. The Ace of Spades came off that boat and went into that five-story tenement right across the street there. Yes, lucky your men were posted onto those docks, Matty. Otherwise, we might have missed him. Well, the Stanley woman's waiting in the boat. We can pick her up later just as soon as we... Uh... Hey, Nick. Huh? 
The ace of spades is coming out. Get back into the doorway. He went in empty-handed and came out with a suitcase. Yeah, that's the swag, all right. Well, here goes. Just a minute, Ace. What? No, drop that gun. Drop it, I say. Nice shot, Matty. Winged him in the arm. Yes, sir, you trumped the ace of spades neatly. Well, Nick, they're starting to tear down these tenements today. Oh, what a place. Even in daylight, it gives me the creeps. Yes, but someday they tell me this is going to be a beautiful housing development with parks and playgrounds for the kids. Maybe, but right now it looks like a kind of death house. And speaking of the death house, I wonder what the Ace of Spades is thinking about now. About black on red or red on black? Uh, Nick, what on earth do you mean? I just spoke to Matty on the phone a few moments ago. He tells me the Ace of Spades sits in the death cell all day and all night, playing solitaire. Say, Nick, uh, how about giving us a few of the ingredients that make up your story for next week? Why, sure, Hugh. Take a beautiful young girl who's positive she's going crazy, just as her mother did before her. Then add her boyfriend, who refused to believe she was losing her mind in spite of the evidence to the contrary. Mix them together, and add a country doctor who alone knew the secret behind it all. And you have the tense and unbelievable situation with which Nick was faced. And uh, what do you call this witch's brew, Nick? I call it... The Case of the Demented Daughter. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcast of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, original music is played by George Wright, script is by Max Ehrlich. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations, each week at the same time. This is Hugh Sanders saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. It's a case for Nick Carter, master detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, master detective. But it's not true, June, darling. <laughs> Don't you suppose I'd know it if you were going crazy? But why do I hear these noises all the time? Why am I so cold when it's, it's really warm in here? Why Listen, do I... Listen, June, you're just working yourself up over nothing. Now, why don't you... Holly like... told me my mother acted the same way, Phyllis. My husband didn't mean she that. said mother heard noises like thunder in her ears. He told me that she was cold and shivering no matter what the temperature was. Alex told me that. Well, even if that's true, it doesn't prove... It does, it does. I'll kill myself before I let them take me away. I won't go to an asylum. I won't. I won't. I won't. A young girl convinced that she is going insane. A fiancé who is not convinced, who doubts that it can be true in spite of the evidence... An appeal to Nick Carter, Master Detective. The uncovering of a strange and unnatural plot. Not for money, not for power, but for hate. This is the story unfolded in The Case of the Demented Daughter.
That must be Randy Wyatt. I made a date for him to see you at 10.30. Is Mr. Carter here yet? Yes, he is. Won't you come in? Thank you. Mr. Carter? Yes? I'm Randy Wyatt. Your father and mine used to be pretty good friends. That's why I'm taking the liberty of asking you to help me now. Why, no liberty at all. Come in, sit down. Thank you, sir. What seems to be the trouble? Well, last night I got this note from the girl I'm engaged to. She sent my ring back with it. May I see it? It's no use, Randy, darling. I'm doomed. And I won't have you burdened with an insane wife. So this is goodbye. Your heartbroken June. I tried to call her as soon as I got the note, but the housekeeper wouldn't let me talk to her. Said she was too ill to come to the phone. Well, have you seen any signs of this insanity she speaks of? I know, and I don't believe it. There's been something funny going on somewhere. She's been a little more nervous than usual when we've been out together this past month, but that isn't insanity. You say when we've been out together. Does that mean that you don't see her at home much? Well, for the past month... She seemed to prefer to get out of the house. Doesn't want to stay home anymore. Well, have you seen her at home at all? Well, I was there one night about a week ago. Her sister Phyllis and her brother-in-law, Alex Benson, were out, and we spent the evening there alone. Did she seem to be the same as usual? Why, except for one little thing, yes. She complained that she felt cold, almost shivery. The house was cold even for me. The thermometer said 78, but it wasn't as warm as that in there. But the fact that she was cold when the thermometer said 78 seemed to prey on her mind. I tried to tell her the thermometer was wrong and that I was chilly too, but she insisted I was just being nice to her. I see. Well, is she any reason to be afraid of going out of her mind? When I was waiting for June the other night, Alex, her brother-in-law, warned me that she was acting queer. Said he felt I ought to know. Told me her mother died in the Harrah Hill Sanitarium. I tried to laugh at him, but he insisted he and Phyllis had seen definite symptoms. Mm Mm-hmm. Anyone else live there with June beside Phyllis and her husband? The housekeeper, Miss Everett, a cook and a maid. Mm, they must have plenty of money. Oh, yes, June's father was a rich man. And he left his entire estate to be divided between the two girls. How long ago did her mother go to the sanitarium? Oh, let me see. June was six then, so it must have been 1932. She died there in 1940. I see. What does this Alex Benson do? He has a very good business, I understand. Doing very well. And this housekeeper you spoke of, has she been with them long? Since a couple of years after Miss Kemper was taken away. She's a peppery old lady, but an excellent housekeeper. She and Phyllis brought June up. I'd like to talk to your fiancé, Wyatt. Can you arrange it? That's what I'd hoped you'd say, Mr. Carter. June isn't crazy, I know that. Just as sure as I know my own name. Well, when can we see her? Around five this afternoon, perhaps? We can try. Where shall I meet you? You better be here at the office about 4.30. We'll go up together. I'll be here. Oh, Mr. Carter, I do hope you can straighten this out. I'll certainly do what I can, Wyatt. You're swell, Mr. Carter. Well, see you at 4.30. Goodbye. So long. Goodbye, Mr. Wyatt. Oh, the poor kid. Losing her mind at her age. I'm not at all sure she is, Patsy. Huh? Look at this note she sent Wyatt. Well, what about it? Writing looks awkward, but she was probably upset. Oh, look closely. See how the pencil bears down much harder in some places than in others? Yes. That's not always in the places where the lines would naturally be heavier. Which means? One explanation would be that somebody was guiding her hand, forcing her to write this. Oh. Patsy, I think we'll do some checking up. Okay. What'll we do? Uh, call Scubby the paper. Ask him for a full report on both Phyllis and Alex Benson. Uh-huh. The society doings and any other information he may find in the morgue. Yeah. Also tell him to check up on Alex's business and financial ratings. All right. Anything else? Yes, I want you to call on the housekeeper. Give her some excuse. Find out all you can about her. I'll tell you what. I'll pretend I'm making a checkup of the conditions under which housekeepers work for some magazine, say. That'll do it. Good. While you do that, I'm going down to the surrogate's office and take a look at the father's will. If there's any conspiracy going on, there's very likely to be money involved. Okay, Nick. See you here as soon as I get the dope by Mrs. Everett. I told you when you called, young lady, I can give you only a few minutes. Well, I'm glad you could see me at all, Mrs. Everett. We can sit here in the breakfast room. Thank you. Now, <laughs> ask your questions and I'll answer them, if they're not personal. Well, they are personal, but only in a general way. How long have you been here? Since uh, 1936, the year after Mrs. Kemple died. Uh-huh. Had you worked previously? I had, 14 years, two jobs. In each case, I left because I was offered more money. If somebody offered me more money than I'm getting here, I'd leave tomorrow. Uh, Are you married, Mrs. Everett? I was. My husband died. 
Any children? I have not. I hate them. How do you find working conditions here? I've seen better and I've seen worse. How do you get along with your employers? Mr. Kemple was a fine man. We got along well. Oh. Do you mean you're having trouble with Mr. and Mrs. Benson? No, Phyllis and Alex are all right. We got along well enough, but that June, I can't stand her. I never could. Oh. Do you have any special reason to feel that way? Or is it because you don't like children? She's a brat. Always was. Used to play tricks on me when I first came here. Left a toy wagon for me to stumble over when she was little, and I fell and broke my ankle. I'd have left here then, but Mr. Kemper offered me so much money I couldn't afford to go. But I've made that June pay for what she did. Why, I've... I'm talking too much. What else do you want to know? You wouldn't want to tell me what they pay you here, would you? I wouldn't. I told you not to get personal. Now, I've got to go. Good day. Goodbye, and thank you, Mrs. Everett. All right, Scubby, I'll tell him. Thanks. Goodbye. Oh, hi, Patsy. Hello. How'd you make out? Here's a typewritten report of my interview. I didn't like that Mrs. Everett at all. Oh, well, she doesn't like June, huh? Mm -mm. Well, good work, Patsy. That covers it. You, you really like it, Nick? I do. Get your hat. We're taking a ride out to Harrow Hills Sanitarium where Mrs. Kemple died. I want to talk to the doctor out there. Right with you, Nick. Walter went out after your phone, but he'll be back pretty soon. Oh, have you heard from Scubby yet? Oh, yes. He says he found plenty of stuff about Phyllis and Alex, but nothing you'd want. Mm. Except that Alex's business is in a pretty bad shape. He needs to expand and has been having trouble getting capital to do it. Yes? Scubby says he couldn't find out whether he'd put any of his wife's money into it or not. I see. What'd you find out at Surrogate's office? I found that Mr. Kemple left a large fortune, divided equally between the two girls. But there were two interesting clauses in the will. Hmm? One was that should either daughter develop a mental weakness of any kind, the other daughter was to have control of the money and administer it for the other's benefit. Hey, Nick, that's something. That's the other, peculiar. It's a statement that since the circumstances surrounding the birth of the two sisters were fully taken into account in drawing the will, no claims on that basis were to be allowed under penalty of forfeiture of all rights under the will. What in the world does that mean? I wish I knew. I called the lawyer who drew it, but he refused to talk about it. So I'm having Walter look up the birth certificates of both girls. Might be some help there. Uh-huh. You think the doctor at the sanitarium could help you? I don't know. I hope so. That's one reason I want to have a talk with him. I'm sorry I can't be of more help to you, Mr. Carter, but my knowledge of the Kemple family is limited to Mrs. Kemple herself, as I said. Doctor, tell me, did Mrs. Kemple know what was happening to her... Oh, yes, some years before it actually happened, it became evident that sooner or later she would have trouble. Hers, as I said, was a case of schizophrenia, split personality. And in her case, the other side of her was homicidal. But you say it can be inherited, Doctor. It can be, but fortunately, it rarely is. Well, thank you for your time, Dr. Lennox, and for your information. I think it'll help us to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> Turn left here, Mr. Carter. The Kemple place is halfway down the next block. Nick, did I hear Walter telling you he could find only Phyllis's birth certificate? That's right, Patsy. No record of June's birth at all. Oh. Wife, do you know where June is born? No, I don't. Oh, by the way, Mr. Carter, I tried to get in touch with June to tell her we were coming, but the housekeeper wouldn't let me speak to her. Said she was asleep. Darn that woman, I don't trust her at all. Is this the house? Yeah, that's it. All uh, right. You'll have to wait in the car, Patsy. Mrs. Everett knows you. Right, Nick. I hope we can get in. Oh, I think we'll manage somehow. If Phyllis is here, she'll let me in. Maybe there's nobody here. Oh, I think I hear someone coming. When there's somebody sick in the house, you ought to know better than to make so much noise. Mrs. Everett, I'm sorry, but we must see June Kemple at once. She's in her room and in no condition to see anyone at once. Who are you? This is Mr. Nick Carter, Miss Everett. Please let us see June. Hmm. What's a detective doing here? I'm not here as a detective. 
Well, there's a friend. May we see June? Very well. She's in her room. You can go up, but make it as short as you can. She's sick. Thank you. Come on, Mr. Carter. I can't understand Miss Everett's dislike for June. She never has a good word for her. Some people are like that, Wyatt. Some people just don't see... Randy! Think... Randy, help! Help! That's June. Come on. Oh, Randy. What, June, honey, what's wrong? I couldn't open the door. I, I couldn't make my hands open the door. It was probably stuck, June. Oh, no, it wasn't the door. It was me. My hands. Why, what do you mean by that, Miss Kemp? It, it's just the way my mother acted when she was sick. Alex told me about it last night. She couldn't make her hands do what she wanted. I tried to open my door, and I couldn't. I just couldn't. I had to try and try before I could get it open. Oh, Randy. It was like a nightmare. A horrible nightmare. Come now, honey, don't cry like that. I just can't stand it. Please, honey. What? Look here. Oh, what is it, sir? Notice this? Why, it... Well, that's wax, isn't it? It is. Wax that someone stuffed in the latch of a door to make it difficult to open. Not impossible, just difficult. Then there is a plot to drive her insane. I knew it. Either that or a plot to make her think she's insane. Nothing very mental about a piece of wax and a door lock. Listen, June, honey, marry me right now. Let me get you out of this house. You'll be safe once I get you away from here. Oh, no, Randy, I can't. It wouldn't be fair to you. Listen. Someone just came in. Now, you got that. Randy Wilder and the detective are out talking to June. And she shouldn't be seeing anyone. She's sick. I tried to keep them out, but I couldn't. I'll go up and see what they're doing. Is everything all right, June? Yes, Miss Benson. There's nothing wrong with June. I'm surprised you felt you had to see her when she's so ill. Miss Benson, this is Mr. Carter, a friend of mine. How do you do? And I wanted him to see June. Well, now that you've seen her, you better go. Come, June. I'll take you back to your room. You better lie down and be quiet. All right, sir. But it's no use. It's no use. Well, Mr. Carter, I guess we... Yes. Come on, White. I'm sorry if Phyllis seems a little abrupt, but we're really very much worried about June. As I told you, Randy, she's exhibiting all the symptoms her mother had just before she was taken away. Alex, this is Mr. Carter. He knew my father years ago. How are you, Mr. Benson? How do you do, sir? Mr. Benson, do you happen to know where June was born? June? Yes. But no, I don't think I do. Oh, wait a minute. It seems to me I've heard Phyllis say that she was born in Barnstable. And where's that? It's about an hour out of the city, I believe, on the River Turnpike. Uh, uh, Phyllis, wasn't June born in Barnstable? Yes, she was. Oh, Alex, I don't know what we're going to do with that girl. She's possessed with that one idea. And since Mother... Oh, I don't know what to do. Come on, Mr. Carter. We better get out of here. Yes. Our work is finished here for now. But, Nick, aren't you going to eat anything before you go? Yeah, uh, we'll grab a sandwich and a cup of coffee on the way. Why, oh, Sim Carter, you have to go out. what are you expecting to find a Barnstable? June was born there. If her birth certificate doesn't give us a clue to that clause in Campbell's will, I'll find somebody there who can. That's you wait here at the office for me. But what do you expect from me, Mr. Carter? You say you found the birth certificate in good order. Uh, after we finally got that guy to open up town hall so we could have a look. <laughs> Boy, was he hopping mad at being called away from his supper. Dr. Jessup, you signed the birth certificate, so you should be able to answer my question. What is there about June's birth that would cause her father to put that strange clause in his will? I couldn't tell you, Mr. Carter. Mrs. Kemple came up here for a rest, and June was born while she was here. Ah. Dr. Jessup, suppose I should tell you that I think someone is trying to make June think she's losing her mind because her mother did. Would that stir your memory? Losing her mind because her mother... Oh, no, that's impossible. Why, she... Uh, pardon me, I must see who's at the door. Certainly, we'll wait. It's strange that they should come to the back door. Nick, he knows something. Sure as you're a foot high, he knows something. Yes, Waldo, I think he does. And I think he's going to talk. Oh, no! Nick, sounds as if he's in... Oh, Dr. Dr. Jessup, what's wrong? Dr. Jessup. You're right. Uh, see Leona Perkins. She, she... Uh, uh, look at Nick. He was shot twice, right through the chest. 
So I see. But we didn't hear no shots. Silence, sir, apparently. Waldo, see if you can spot anyone out there. Right, Nick. I'll get him. Oh, poor guy. I hadn't come here to ask. Waldo! Waldo! Did you... Uh, it's no good, Nick. I thought I saw a guy hiding in the trees there, so I took a couple of shots at him. Yeah, I guess it was just shadows. You ought to know better than to go shooting off that old forty-four of yours blindly that way. But, Nick, I Waldo, you to... stay here. Call the sheriff. Tell him what happened. I'm going to find Leona Perkins before someone tries to eliminate her, too. Now, you got that, Patsy? Tell Matty to have his man keep constant watch on the Kemple house. And tell me just who goes in or out. Uh-huh. And he's to wait until you come and report to you. Right. I'll pick you up at the office on my way back. Oh, and have Randy Wyatt there, too, so he can go with us. Oh, where did you say you are now? In Barnstable, at the home of Leona Perkins. She was June's nurse after she was born. She knows the answers if anyone does. All right, I'll see you at the office, Patsy. Sorry, Mrs. Perkins, but I had to get that call through without delay. Now, you know Dr. Jessup, of course. Yes, of course. I worked with him for 15 years. He sent you to me? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but Dr. Jessup has just been killed. Dr. Jessup? Killed? Yes, shot. By someone who wanted to keep him from telling me what I came to Barnstable to find out. Dr. Jessup, dead. I can't believe it. But before he died, he told me to come to you. But you would tell me what the mystery is about June Kemple's birth. Why are you asking these questions, Mr. Carter? Because June's sanity is in danger. June insane? She can't be. Why not? Her mother was, I understand. Died in the sanitarium. Then you understand wrongly, Mr. Carter. Her mother is perfectly sane and she's still alive. Alive and well. What's that you say? Do I look insane to you? You? Why, why no, no, of course not. Mr. Carter, I am June's mother. You? You are June's mother? I am. June is really my daughter. Miss Perkins, I'm afraid I don't understand. Why was she brought up as the Kemple's child? Mrs. Kemple had one daughter, and she wanted another, desperately. But she knew she was gradually going out of her mind. And she was afraid if she bore another child, it too might be susceptible to the same dread disease. So she decided to adopt a baby, but secretly, to prevent any possible discrimination against it. She made inquiries in several places. Dr. Jessup heard of her search and came to me. How did he happen to come to you? He was my doctor. My husband had just been killed in an accident. And my baby was to be born in three days. We were very poor. And I was frantic with worry. I had no money, Mr. Carter. No relatives. I'd never worked a day in my life. I could see no way to provide for the child who was coming. And you agreed to give up your baby? Yes. In a moment of weakness, I did. When June was born, Dr. Jessup registered her as being born to Mrs. Kemple instead of to me. Oh, perhaps it was wrong of him, but he felt it was the wisest thing to do. You've never seen her since? No, Mr. Carter. Bitterly as I regretted my decision, I'd sworn I'd never try to see her again. And I never have. Did anyone else beside you, the doctor, and the Kemples know of this? No, not a soul. Even Phyllis was never told. She believes June to be her own natural sister. Uh -huh. I doubt that she does now. Mrs. Perkins, you must go back to the city with me at once. Not only June's sanity, but her life may be in danger at this very moment. And you say you found some real evidence, Nick? The best in the world, Patsy. I found Mrs. Perkins here. Well... I don't understand, Nick. You'll know the Where whole story in a few minutes, just as soon as we get to the Kemple's house. Is it a plot against June, Mr. Carter? Is she really all right? Yes, Wyatt, I believe so. It'll take time to get her back on her feet, but basically she's as sane as you or I. But who would want to do a thing like this? It'd only be one person. And how she found out about it, I don't know. But she did, obviously. Uh, Mr. Carter, how much further? I promised once I'd never see June again, but now I... That's one I... promise that is better broken than kept. Now, here we are. Oh, that must be Maddie's man across the street. You three go in. I'll be with you as soon as I get his report. Uh, 
I must protest, Mr. Carter. This is outrageous. Sorry, this Mrs. Time Everett. Night. It has to be done this way. Everybody's here, Nick. All except Phyllis. She's been in bed with a migraine headache ever since dinner. Ah. Uh, well, we'll go ahead without her. Okay. June. Yes. <laughs> you say various things happen to you that seem to indicate that you're losing your mind. Yes, Mr. Carter. Just like my poor mother when, when she was losing her mind. How do you know about your mother? Oh, I... I Alex told me. Alex told you. Uh-huh. Mr. Benson, may I ask if you knew Mrs. Kemple? Why, no, I didn't. She died before I met Phyllis. And how do you know how she acted while she was going to pieces? Well, I've heard the story from Phyllis. Complete with details? Why, why yes. Recently? Why, I guess she has told me more in the last few weeks than she ever did before, but... What are you getting at? I won't let them take me away. I'll kill myself first. I will. I will. Steady, June. Steady. That won't be necessary. There's nothing wrong with you mentally, and there never has been. But but all those queer things. Every single one of those things is a trick, suggestion, planted in your mind. But my mother died in that place. No, June, you're wrong. She didn't. Why, Nick? June's mother is alive and well today. I'd like to introduce her to you. Mrs. Leona Perkins. This is the most fantastic story I ever heard. Are you sure? I am. I have positive proof. Dr. Jessup's story and Mrs. Perkins' story, which can be backed up with documentary proof. And if you want something you can see for yourself, look at June's little finger. I've just now noticed how she has the same peculiar little crook at the end of it that Mrs. Perkins has. My golly, Nick, you're right. It's just the same. You're my mother. My real mother. Yes, June, darling. Your real mother. Oh, oh my. <laughs> Mr. Carter, who in heaven's name would want to do this to June? A person who was afraid that she might be susceptible to the thing that killed her mother, and consequently hated the person who wasn't. A person who wanted to prove that it was someone else, not her, who was the weak one. Carter, do you realize what you're saying? Unfortunately, Benson, I do. But you mean that Phyllis... Phyllis? Oh, of course he doesn't, Alex. That's sheer nonsense. Mrs. Benson, didn't you help June write the note that broke her engagement to Randy Wyatt? Yes, at her request. After you talked me into doing it. And didn't you suggest that June heard things and felt things, and then when you got her believing she did, didn't you suggest to Alex that those things were a sign of mental weakness? She did. I can tell now. She was always asking me if I didn't feel this or hear that. I thought she was trying to help me, but... I was trying to help. Where have you been the last two, three hours? In my room with a headache. No, you weren't. You drove to Barnstable, shot Dr. Jessup so he couldn't tell me the secret and came back here. My man saw you come in. You sneaked in the back door and up to your room, changed your shoes because they got muddy in the doctor's backyard, and then you came down here to brazen it out. Randy, if you look, I'm sure you'll find the muddy shoes in her room, and you'll find the motor of her car still hot. And probably you'll find a gun in her car, too. I'll take a look right now. Stay where you are, all of you. You may find the muddy shoes, but I've got the pistol right here, and I'm going to kill you all. You're a pack of sneaking... Better take filthy... her away, officer, before she hurts someone. Officer? I'll what take her. Oh! I'll sit, I'll take him. Okay. All right, all right. No harm done. Alex, take her upstairs. Keep her in her room. Yes, Mr. Carter. Come on, Phyllis. Sure. Lock me up. Just the way they locked my mother up. You think I'm crazy, but I'm not. I'm as sane as any of you. I'll show you. I'll show you. How could you do such a thing, Phyllis? Why should you hate me so? Why shouldn't I hate you? I've hated you from the moment I found those old letters of father's after he died. Those letters from Dr. Jessup, which gave away the whole story. Dr. Jessup said he hoped I'd never suffer as my mother did. Said he could understand how pleased father was to know that there was no possibility of you having inherited any tendency to a mental weakness. I knew what he meant, and I hated you for it. I wish I'd killed you long ago. Oh, come, Phyllis. You'll feel better in your own room. Uh, Mrs. Everett, will you come with us, please? Of course, Mr. Benson. Take I'll your hands off. I know what a terrible thing. Yes. If you never found those letters, this whole thing might never have happened. They not only turned her against June, they planted the fear of insanity in her own mind. And the hate and the fear together grew into a phobia that was too strong for her. Mr. Carter, I, I don't know what to say. If there's any way I can repay you, you have only to name it. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. I feel as if a load had been lifted off my heart. This is a wonderful thing you've done, Mr. Carter. A wonderful thing. God bless you for doing it. Nick, hmm? in the excitement, I forgot. Forgot what? Waldo. Well, what about Waldo? Waldo is being held in Barnstable on charge of killing Dr. Jessup. What? Yes. He called us before you got back. Said he'd try to explain what happened, 
But the sheriff didn't believe him. <laughs> Especially since two shots had been fired from his pistol and two shots killed Dr. Jessup. Oh, poor Waldo. I suppose the more they questioned him, the more excited he got that he finally talked himself right into his cell. Well, you better do something about it, Nick, before Waldo goes crazy. Uh, b- 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 before he... Okay, okay, Patsy. May I use your phone, June? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Oh, operator, I want the sheriff's office and Barnstable. Yes, the sheriff's office, that's right. And I want to talk to the sheriff himself. Yes, the sheriff. Well, Nick, how about a little look into next week's story? No sooner said than done, Hugh. It all started with a man being strangled in his hotel room in the very early hours of the morning. And mm. then went on to include a piece of silk torn from a shirt, a dictaphone record, and a missing wife. Who was missing because her husband wanted it that way. But he refused to stay missing when she received a letter containing a railroad ticket. It was really the hotel uh, maid. Uh, uh, oh. Patsy, huh? save something for next week. Uh, what do you call your story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Dictaphone Murder. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of The Shadow Comics. In the broadcast of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor and Peggy Mayer. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at this same time. This is Hugh Sanders saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Broadcasting Corporation. Broadcasting Corporation. Broadcasting Corporation. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's the case of the dictaphone murder. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick should be here any minute, Mr. Buckley. Told me on the phone that he'd be here at 9 o'clock. That's why I came so early. Well, it's only a few minutes after 9. Now it won't be long. You see, I've got a great... Oh. Good morning, Patsy. Hello, Nick. Any spe... Oh, good morning, Mr. Buckley, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Carter. When I met you after your lecture at the club the other evening, I said to myself, that's the man I'll go to when I need help. <laughs> and you need it now? Very much. I want you to thoroughly investigate Roger Denham, the man who's going to marry my daughter. Well, what's he done? I don't know that he's done anything. I simply want to be sure that he's the right kind of man to be my son-in-law. Well, really, Mr. Buckley, I don't go in for that sort of thing at all. Oh, that's not the only reason. The Buckley Corporation is going to build a large new office building, and Roger Denham has been awarded the contract for the work. I want to know that he can carry it out successfully. Mr. Buckley, I deal for the most part in crime. It interests me, and I've made it my life work. What you're asking me to do does not interest me. Furthermore, I don't have the time for it. I see. Well, perhaps this will interest you. It's an anonymous letter I received in the mail this morning. I don't put much stock in such things, but, well, here it is. Roger Denham is married, has been for six years. His wife is now on her way to the Royal Arms Hotel. Better warn your daughter. Does that interest you, Mr. Carter? Not very much. Information like that can be checked too easily to offer any problem as far as I'm concerned. Nothing very mysterious about this note. It's typed on a decent grade of paper by a fairly good typewriter. Half of the letter L is missing because of a defective type bar, and there's no threat in it. Except one fact. I'm sorry you won't act for me, Mr. Carter, but I suppose you have your reason. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Oh, morning, Patsy. Nick there? Oh, yes, he is. Just a minute. To you, Nick, Sergeant Matheson. What got you down to your office early, Matty? What do you mean, office? I've been there, and now I'm up here at the Royal Arms. 
You're not busy. You might take a run over here. What's up? Murder. Guy named Roger Denham. Did you say Roger Denham? I did. Why? Friend of yours? No, just coincidence, that's all. What about Denham, Mr. Carter? What's the story, Matty? He's been strangled to death. If uh, you're not busy... I'll I be right over. What room? 312. I'll wait for you, Nick, but make it snappy. I will. So long. Mr. Carter, has something happened to Denham? Buckley? When did you see him last? Mm, yesterday evening. I called on him at the hotel to see if I could find out something about him personally. Why? He's just been murdered. Murdered? Denham? Yes. Police are there in his room now. Let me have that letter again. Yes, of course. Here. Thanks. Well, top of the morning to you, Patsy. Nick. Hello, Walter. Don't bother to sit down, Walter. You and I are going out immediately. We're going to look into a murder. <laughs> Hi, Matty. Well, Nick, you made good time. It's only 9.30. <clears throat> yep. Oh, hello, Buffalo Bill. Well, if it ain't the terror of the police force himself. Uh, stuck, are you? No, I'm not stuck. Just thought Nick might like to have a look-see. Right, Matty. What have you found so far? Well, there's the body, Nick, right on the floor where we found it. He was strangled by some guy with an enormous pair of hands. You can still see the marks on his throat. Mm. Must have been a struggle the way the room was upset, but it wasn't robbery. Nothing is missing, as far as we can tell. Any fingerprints? No, nope, not a one. The maid found the body when she came in to clean about 9 o'clock. Coroner says death occurred about 8.30 this morning. All night party or an early morning blowout? I checked with the room clerk, and he says he saw no visitors this morning. But the telephone operator says a guy named Johnny Casper called about 7.45 this morning. She said she knew his voice because he'd called so often before. If he came here, he'd know the way without asking at the desk. Yeah. Said she wasn't listening, but she uh, <laughs> gathered from what she just happened to hear that Casper wanted to see Denham right away. Well, we can look into that when we... All right. Room 312. Is Mr. Denham there? Who's calling? Mr. Allen of the Buckley Corporation. I'd like to talk to Mr. Denham. What do you want to talk to Denham about? Uh, who are you? This I'm... is Nick Carter. I'm sorry to say you can't talk to Denham. He's just been murdered. Uh, Denham? Murdered? Did you say murdered? I did. What do you want to talk to him about? Why, I'm the chairman of the board for the Buckley Corporation. We've just awarded a contract to Mr. Denham for the construction of the Buckley Building, and I wanted to make an appointment with him to settle a number of details. Uh, and you say he's... Unfortunately, yes, Mr. Allen. Uh, it's terribly unfortunate. Uh, well, goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, some friend of Denham's, Nick? Business acquaintance, apparently. Wanted to make a date with him. Well, it's a little late for that, I'm thinking. Hey, Nick, here's something. Yes, what is it, Matty? It's a piece of silk. Pocket off a shirt, I'd say. Found it clenched in Denham's fist. Ah, must have been ripped off in the struggle. A clue, by golly. Now we can start investigating, Nick. Looks like it. Matty, will you let me have this? Oh, now, look, Nick, that's the only real piece of evidence we got. I know it. I'll take care of it. Just want to find out what Mills made it and what they did with it. Oh, but, Nick, look, why can't... Now, look, I can do it faster than you can, Matty. You know that? Oh, I suppose so, but I still... Waldo, suppose you dig around and find out what Mills this piece of silk came from. Shouldn't be difficult because there's a flaw here in the weave. Should make identification easy. You better get going. Legwork. Always legwork for Waldo. A good detective like me, and I ain't allowed to detect. A good detective follows orders, too. Don't forget that. Oh, sure, Nick, sure. I was just... So long, Waldo. I'll see you at the office later. Okay, Nick, okay. Well, Nick, I guess there isn't much else here we can see. I'll just take a look around while I'm here. Yeah. Huh? The room looks as if somebody had been through it, looking for something. The way it's all upside down. Yeah, that's what I thought. What do you suppose he was looking for? I wouldn't know, Matty. Huh. You see this? Huh? This piece of wire sticking out under the closet door? No, what is it? Well, let's see. Hey, it goes up the closet wall and through the ceiling. The maid's still here? Yeah, right outside. Hey, maid! Yes, sir? Who lives in the room over this? Nobody, sir. It's empty. Or it was yesterday afternoon when I cleaned it up about half past four. That sounds suspicious in itself, an empty hotel room these days. Royal Arms. Desk clerk, please. Desk clerk. This is Nick Carter on the murder of Denham. Who has room 412? Uh, Mrs. Denham has it now, sir. Mrs. Denham? Yes, sir. When did she come in? Uh, just a few minutes ago. Denham reserved the room yesterday for friends, he said. When Mrs. Denham came in, I supposed he meant it for her, so I gave it to her. 
I called Denham to check, but got no answer. What time was that? Uh, about five minutes to nine. Do you know anything about a wire in the closet of 312? <laughs> a wire? But no, Mr. Carter, I don't. That's all, thanks. Matty, I believe this wire is a part of the answer to this murder. Yeah? Let's go up and have a... <coughs> hey, that came from upstairs, Matt. Mr. Denham, come on, Matty, hurry. No good, Nick. He disappeared somewhere. Went down the fire escape and either got to the bottom or slipped into a room on the way down. Mm, too bad. Now, Mrs. Denham, suppose you tell me the whole story right from the beginning. Well, I got here this morning just before 9 o'clock. The clerk said Roger had engaged this room for me, so I came up. I was too tired to unpack, so I just lay down on the bed for a few minutes. I didn't sleep because I had a queer feeling someone was watching me. Then about 15 minutes ago, I got up, washed, and started down to get some breakfast. But after I'd gone a few steps, I found I'd forgotten my lipstick, so I came back for it. As I opened the door, I saw a man in the room, just starting to climb out the window. I screamed, and he, he disappeared. Did you get a good look at him? No, I didn't. But he looked like a large man with, with big hands. I saw those. Mrs. Denham, how does it happen you arrived here just this time? Why, I got an anonymous letter yesterday. Here it is. Thank you. Your husband has been out of the army for six weeks. He is staying here at the Royal Arms. Pretends he's not married and is making big play for daughter of head of Buckley Corporation. Enclosed his ticket from your town here. Better come if you want to avoid trouble. And the letter L, only half prints. Same typewriter on both notes. What was that, Mr. Carter? Oh, uh, nothing. Go on with your story, please. I didn't even know Roger was out of the army. The last I heard was two months ago... When he wrote that he and his buddy, Johnny Casper... Nick, Johnny Casper again. Yes. Go ahead, Mrs. Denham. He said they were getting out any minute, and he let me know as soon as they did. But when this letter came, I thought I... Yes, well... I know. And that's all? Well, yes, I think so. You mind if I have a look in your closet? My closet? Why, no, not at all. Anything here, Nick? That certainly is. A dictaphone machine. What? Uh... There's the wire that comes up from downstairs. This is what I rather expected, Matty. Denham was making a record of an interview we had with someone, but the record is gone. Uh -huh. That's what the guy Mrs. Denham saw was after. Maybe he got it, Nick. Mrs. Denham, how long were you out of this room? Just a few seconds, no longer. I went out and then came back almost at once. Then the man didn't get it, Matty. Wouldn't have had time. But someone got it. That's the clue we ought to have, Nick. I bet it would tell the whole story. Yes, there must have been something pretty incriminating on it to make him kill Denham. Kill? Did you say kill Denham? Oh, no. I'm sorry, Mrs. Denham. I didn't realize you heard me. I'm very sorry, but it's true. Oh. Your husband was killed about an hour ago. Roger, dead. Matty, better take this machine to headquarters. See if there are any prints on it that will help. Okay, get Mrs. Denham's, too, just in case. Well, Nick, you don't I don't know. Machine. Better take no chances. Let me get the serial number on the machine so I can have Patsy check on it, and I'll be on my way. Get on your way where, Nick? To see Johnny Casper. He looks like a good starting point. You see, Mr. Carter, we were buddies in the service. I liked Roger, so when we got out, I brought him back here with me. He'd been a contractor in a small town about 100 miles north of here, and I thought perhaps we could go in business together. I'm a contractor, too, you know. No, I didn't. Oh, yes, I've... Done some pretty big things for a young fellow. Well, anyway, I introduced Roger to Mr. Allen, the chairman of the board of the Buckley Corporation, and to Buckley himself. Then I took him up to Olive's house one night. She's Buckley's daughter. I was engaged to her at the time. Well, I introduced him to her. <laughs> what a heel that guy turned out to be. Just how do you mean, Casper? Well, instead of bidding on the Buckley building with me as partners... He submitted a separate bit of his own. And he entertained Alan and every member of the board at parties. And he made a big play for my girl behind my back. Knifed me every way he could. My pal. You say you were engaged to Miss Buckley. You're not now? Oh, I'll say I'm not. Two days ago, when I called her to make a date, she told me we were through. She was now engaged to Denham. So you have little reason to like Denham. I've never hated anybody in my life the way I hated that man. Where were you this morning about 8 o'clock? Morning? My, 
Why, I was right here in bed. You're sure? You weren't at the Royal Arms talking to Denham. What in heaven's name makes you think Answer my that question, I... Casper. Were you at the Royal Arms? I know I... Well, yes, I was, too. Why should I deny it? I went down to tell Roger to lay off my girl or I'd tell his wife what was going on. And what did he say to that? He told me to go as far as I liked. He was on top and he was going to stay there in spite of the devil and me. Did you two have a fight? With words, yes, but that's all. Got so mad I left him and came back here to think. I see you have a typewriter. You mind if I try it? Why, no, go right ahead. Thanks. Ah. It was you who wrote those anonymous letters to Buckley and to Mrs. Denham. Yes, I did. I'm not ashamed of doing it. I hated Denham. Enough to kill him? Yes, but I didn't. I saw too much killing in the war. Funny, isn't it? I bring my buddy back here to help him out, and he cheats me out of everything I want. Underbids me on the Buckley job and even steals my girl. <laughs> what a laugh. No, I didn't kill him, but I wish I had long ago. But I was referred to you to... And am I glad you were. We don't get many in here like you, baby. I, I want to find out something about... I'm the boy that can tell you, baby. Anything you want to know. I have here the serial number. Now, of... look, let's not talk about numbers. Let's talk about you. You're the number I'm interested in right now. Well, look, will you please listen? Am I listening to every word you say, gorgeous? Go ahead, talk. I want to find out about Dictaphone Machine number 248749AY. Hey, look. What are you doing tonight, Slick Chick? Working. Number 248749AY, please. I bet you do a mean rumba. How's about giving me a whirl tonight, hmm? Oh, look. I want to find out about this... Yeah, baby. I'm trying to find out, too. How late are you working tonight? Huh? Uh, I don't know. No, I bet you're not working at all. Just stalling me along to see how far I'll go. Well, I'll go a long way for you, good-looking. Oh, will you please? Listen, Reb, how's about letting me call you when I get through tonight? <laughs> Maybe I can get a couple of hours together. I know just the place. Come on, what do you say? All right, you win. Call me at Pennsylvania 68601. Ask for Patsy. a baby, now you're cooking on all four. Now, what do you want to know? Where this machine, 248749AY, has been for the last 48 hours. Well, leave me look. <laughs> 248749AY. Leased to a guy named Roger Denham yesterday afternoon. Not back yet. That make you happy, baby? Getting the information does. Thank you. Uh, hey, you can't go like this. It's almost my lunch hour. I was about putting on a pair of bibs together down at Mike's place, hmm? You've got my phone number and my name, and that's all you're going to get from me. Goodbye. Oh, don't be like that, gorgeous. I just want... Oh, there you are, Patsy. We've been waiting for you. Find anything? Nick, do I look fascinating to you? Hey, hey look. Patsy, this is police headquarters, remember? Other men find me irresistible. Do you? Snap out of it, Patsy. Did you find out about the dictaphone? Huh? Oh, yes. Um, leased to Roger Denham yesterday afternoon for 48 hours. That checks, Matty. Huh? He expected a visitor and wanted the interview recorded. Oh, I wish I knew what was on that record. Oh, I was starting to tell you when Patsy came in, Nick. There were two sets of fingerprints on that dictaphone. Denham's and somebody else's. The others don't check with any we got. They must be the murderers when he got the record. Are they extra large? Uh, hey, they aren't, Nick. They're they're small. So they couldn't have been his. Maybe they don't mean anything. Could have been on the machine when Denham got it. Anyway, hey. oh, Waldo. Uh, How'd you make out? Uh, you asked me to find out about that there piece of silk now, didn't you? I did. Well, when you give old Dead Eye McGlynn a job, he does it. Yes, sir. And I had some job, too, believe me. But I came through. For the love of Mike, Waldo, stop talking and say something. I'm trying to, but you keep interrupting me. Waldo, what did you find out? Well, the silk was woven by the seasoned mills. Now, they made up about a dozen shirts out of it, and then they discovered there was a flaw in the stuff. So they junked the rest. And they sold them shirts to the Lionel Men's Shop right here in town. Did you go there? No, I didn't. 
I thought maybe you would like to do some of the detecting yourself. Okay, okay. That's my next visit. The Lionel Men's Shop. Come on, Patsy. Come on. This is Buckley speaking. This is Nick Carter, Mr. Buckley. I find that you bought a dozen white silk shirts from the Lionel Shop a few months ago. Yes, I did. They offered me a special price, I recall. Why? Did you keep them all yourself? Why, no, I didn't. I got them just before Christmas, and I gave several of them away as presents. Could you tell me to whom you gave them? Well, now, uh, let me see. Uh, I remember giving Alan three of them, and I kept five for myself, I think. And the others... Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, my daughter, Olive, gave the rest to Johnny Casper so he'd have some when he got out of the Army. Uh, they were going around together at that time. Nobody else got any? I believe not. Couldn't swear to it, of course. All right, thanks. Sorry to bother you. Goodbye. What do you say, Nick? He kept some, gave some to Alan, and some to Casper. Casper? We keep coming back to him, don't we? Seems so. He certainly had a motive. But if he did it, where does the dictaphone come in? Yes, I, I see what you mean. But who else is there? Alan? Well, I suppose you better check on his whereabouts at the time of the killing this morning. Mustn't leave any stone unturned. Come on. No, Mr. Allen isn't at home just now, Mr. Carter. Can I do anything for you? Perhaps. What time did Mr. Allen get up this morning? At his usual hour, sir. About 9.30. Are you sure of that? Oh, absolutely, sir. He came downstairs in his pajamas and dressing gown to ask me about a suit he couldn't find. It was at the cleaners. What time were you up this morning? I start work at 8 o'clock regularly, sir. It's my habit. And you didn't see Mr. Allen until 9.30? Why, no, sir. Uh, may I inquire why you're asking all these questions? You may, but I'm not going to answer just now. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Come on, Patsy. Let's try something else. Maybe we'll have more luck there. <laughs> Nick, you going to check up on Mr. Buckley? Buckley? Well, yes. You've investigated two of the three men who got the silk shirts. You can't omit Buckley, can you? I suppose you're right, Patsy. We can't afford to... Oh, I wish I had that record Denna made. Mm. That would probably tell us the motive. Just now, we are completely missing a motive. Well, Casper had one. But as you've said, that doesn't account for the record. No, it doesn't. I wonder... Huh? What is it, Nick? Wait. I want to call Maddie. I'm going in the drugstore here. Okay. I'll be right back. All right. <clears throat> Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Oh, Maddie, Nick, tell me. When you examined the prints and the dictaphone, did you find any of the smaller prints lapping over Denham's prints? Uh, why, come to think of it, yeah, Nick. Some of the little prints were on Papa Denham's. Why? Thanks. I'll see you later. Bye. What's going on, Nick? I think I know now where the missing dictaphone record is, Patsy, and when I get that, I should have the motive. And the murderer. Let's go, Nick. <laughs> For goodness sake. Why did you ask to speak to the chambermaid? Because I think she has the answer. Well, what answer could she have? You'll see. You're the chambermaid who found Mr. Denham's body this morning in room 312? Yes, sir. I found him when I went in to clean the room. Did you go to room 412 this morning? Well, I did and I didn't. Just how do you mean? Well, you see, I clean the rooms that's vacant in the afternoon. The deadline's 5 o'clock, so I got to get them cleaned before then. So I cleaned up 412 yesterday, like always. That's a transient room. So this morning I opened 412 to see if somebody's been in. But when I seen it like I left it, I didn't go in. I see. You went to the room at all this morning. Like I told you. I just looked in and see nobody's been in, so I locked it up again. You won't mind letting me take your fingerprints, will you? Fingerprints? What do you want them for? Just for the record. You're not scared, are you? Scared? Why should I be scared? Then you won't mind if I take your prints? No, I... I don't guess so. How, uh... How do you do it? Just press your fingers on this little ink pad. Like this. Yeah. Then press them on this pad. Like this. Yeah. Yeah. Do they match, Nick? Match? Match what? 
So you didn't go in room 412 this morning. I told you, I... I, I know what you told me. Now tell me the truth. You went to the door and you went in. And you took a record off a dictaphone machine you found in the closet. Why? Golly, mister. Can you tell all that from my fingerprints? I can. So you better tell me the truth. All right. Well, here's what happened, and it's the gospel truth. I opened the door like I said. Then just as I started to close it again, I heard a funny noise. I listened, and it came from the closet. I looked, and there was a funny machine there with one of them trick kind of records on it. And you took it? Yeah. I didn't think it was stealing. I just wanted to see what was on it. So I, I brought it down here, and when I got a chance, I was going to play it on one of the machines in the office. But I, I've been too busy. Do you know that Denham was killed for that record? Honest, mister. And if the murderer finds you've got it now, you're next. Gee, I wouldn't like that. I don't want to be killed. Then you better get me the record right now. Sure. Sure, mister. I, I got it hidden in one of the cleaning closets. I'll get it for you, honest. You wait right here. We'll wait. And then we'll play the record, Patsy. I've got to know what's on it. <laughs> Buckley, Nick. Sorry to be late, Mr. Carter, but I got held up in traffic. It's quite all right, Mr. Buckley. Now that you're all here, Buckley, Alan Casper, and Sergeant Matheson, I'll tell you why I called you together. As you know, Roger Denham was murdered this morning in his hotel room, strangled. The only real clues we had were the prints of an unusually large hand on Denham's throat and a silk shirt pocket, evidently torn off during the struggle. We traced the shirts and found that each of you three men had one or more of those shirts. Casper has no alibi for the time of the killing. Alan, according to his butler, has. And Buckley, we don't know about. If you'd asked me, I could have told you where I was. I'm sure you could, Mr. Buckley, right to the very minute, no doubt. So any one of you might have owned the shirt with a torn pocket. We had to get at it another way. Motive. Which of you had the strongest motive to kill Denham? Buckley and Ellen don't seem to have any reason. But Casper did. Now look here, Carter. Are you trying to pin this on me? Sit told... down, Casper, and wait until I finish. I won't pin murder on anyone unless it belongs there. As I said, we needed a motive. But it was only late this afternoon that chance, plus the rational and logical elimination of other possibilities, gave me the answer. I now have the motive, and with it, the murderer. And what is it, Mr. Carter? Yes, don't keep us waiting this way. Here it is. Listen. All right, Patsy. Right. Hello, Alan. What brings you out so early in the morning? I think you know, Denham. Hey, stop that machine. Yeah, Give me that record. What's the trouble, Mr. Well, Ellen? I said stop that machine. Oh, I owe you Take that record and now. I want these gentlemen to hear what it says. Confound you, Carter. I'll put a bullet right in. Put a bullet, right right put a bullet nowhere, murderer. Give me that gun. Come on. Give it to me. That's better. All right, gentlemen. Now that Mr. Allen is quiet again, I'd like you to hear the rest of this record. Start it again, Patsy. All right. Hello, Allen. What brings you out so early in the morning? I think you know, Denham. Little matter of money. Money? What money? Do I owe you some? Hey, what is this? You trying to kid me? No, no, indeed. I uh, just don't understand. You know? You bid on the contract for the construction of the new Buckley building, remember? That's right. You are not the low bidder. You came in second. You were over $50,000 higher than the low bid. Right again. I reported to the board that I was convinced that the low bidder was not equipped to do this job and recommended giving it to you in spite of your price. That's very decent of you, Alan. Decent? You promised me $10,000 if I got you that contract. That's why I'm here. I want half of that $10,000 now before the contract is signed. Hey, Alan, I never promised to pay you to get me that contract. I don't do business that way. Why, you double-crossing gift artist. You'll pay me what you promised or that contract will never be signed, I promise you. But the board awarded it to me. On my recommendation. And they'll award it to someone else if I don't get what's coming to me. I boss that board and don't forget it. They do what I say. And you're going to do what you said you would or else. That's the end, Nick. That's the most incredible thing I ever heard. So Alan killed Mr. Allen, would you care to tell us what happened after the record was shut off? Nothing. I left at once. May I see your shirt? No. Yes. Here, open your basket. <clears throat> That's a good boy. Nick, he hasn't changed his shirt. 
His pocket's missing. Very probably. Didn't even know it was gone in all the excitement of the murder. And if further proof is needed, I believe his hands will correspond to the marks on Denham's throat. I see you have unusually large hands, Mr. Allen. And Denham was a louse. He shut the machine off and told me he'd been making a record of our conversation. Said if I tried to collect what he'd promised me, he'd take the record to Buckley. I knew that would ruin me, and so I... You killed him so you could find the record, so you could destroy it. I wouldn't have believed it possible. Well, you're right about one thing. You're through, finished, as far as I'm concerned. And as far as the state is concerned, too. The chair will finish him. That's the case, gentlemen. Oh, that's for me, Nick. For you, Patsy. Who is it, do you know? Oh, I'll say I do. Wait till he hears what I'm going to tell him. Oh, but I do wish somebody else would talk to me that way. Just once in a while. Hello! Nick, isn't it about time for you to give us a glimpse into next week's story? Why, I shouldn't be surprised if you were right, Ken. Well, suppose you take over then. Right. The ingredients of my story next week are, first, a man who died of heart failure, but who was really murdered. A will, which was the will the old man wrote, but which proved to be not the will he wrote. And a signature, which was forced by a person who wanted it known it had been forged. Sounds like a fine collection of contradictions to me. What do you call it, Nick? I call it the case of the clumsy forgeries. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcasts of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick... Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Waldo by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor and Peggy Mayer. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Incorporation. 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 What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's the case of the clumsy forgeries. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, do we have much more to do on this report? Not much, Patsy. Why? Well, um, it's after five, and I have an appointment with my hairdresser at six. Well, you'll make it all right. I'll see that you do. Far be it for me to prevent you from making yourself as beautiful as you can. Oh, Nick, what a thing to say. No, I was only joking, Patsy. Really, you're a fine-looking girl. Oh, Nick, do you mean that? Well, yes, of course I do. Oh, that's the first personal compliment you've paid me in all the years I've been working for you. I didn't know you ever noticed me, except as your assistant. <laughs> I notice a good many things I don't mention, Patsy. Oh, don't I know that by now? Well, I can... Oh, darn it. I bet I don't keep that date with a hairdresser after all. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Uh, is Nick there, Miss Bowen? This is Dr. Bradford. Oh, yes, just a minute, Doctor. Here, Nick, Dr. Bradford. Oh, thanks. Hello, Doc. Where well, have you been keeping yourself all these months? I haven't seen you in a dog's age. I know it, Nick. Now, that's the old story. A shortage of doctors makes double work for the rest of us. Especially good ones like you. Well, what's new? Well, Nick, I've just run into a very peculiar thing. And I think you can help me. I'm glad to if I can. Let's have it. Well, I've been treating old Gerald Gould for years. Mm -hmm. He's been in bed with a very bad heart for some time now, due to pop off almost any minute. Well, this afternoon, when I dropped in for my regular visit at 5 o'clock, I, I found him dead. Heart failure? To the best of my ability to determine so quickly, yes. But when I started to straighten out the body so it wasn't as twisted as it was when he died, I found a piece of paper under him, on which was scribbled, he killed me. 
he gave me. That's all. Looks as if he started to write something and died before he could finish it. Well, could he have been having hallucinations? I wouldn't say so, but I'd like your opinion before I do anything. Maybe you can find something that I've missed that'll show whether it was murder or not. You at the Gould house now? Yes. Could you take a run over here? Certainly, Doc, if you really think it'll help. Oh, I'm sure it will. But, uh, just in case, suppose you come as my assistant. Say, uh, Mr... Mr... Uh, Mr. Nicholas, how's that? Oh, fine, fine. All right, Doc, I'll be there in ten minutes. <laughs> You see, Nick, this note was under his shoulder, just as if he'd rolled over on it in his last moments. This pencil was there, too. How long had he been dead when you arrived? Only a few minutes at most. Uh-huh. Tell me, Doc, isn't it perfectly possible to kill a man with a bad heart in such a way as to make it look like heart failure? Well, yes, easily. Any stimulant that acted on his heart would do it in pretty short order. But does he show any signs of such a stimulant? No, but that wouldn't prove anything. An autopsy is the only way to be sure. Yes, of course. Well... Let's see if we can find any evidence here to point in one direction or the other. Ah, if anything was given him, it could have been in this glass. The only one near enough for him to have reached it. Hmm. Ah, only one person's fingerprints on it. Let's see the old man's thumb. Yes, same all right. That little scar makes it definite. That's peculiar, to say the least. How do you mean, Nick? Well, if you give a person a drink, do you wipe your own prints off the glass first? Of course not. I... Oh, I see what you're getting at. Somebody did give him something deliberately. That'd be my guess. Just take this along. Have the contents analyzed. I can wrap it in this wax paper. Oh, by the way, have you told the family yet? That he's dead, yes. Not that he was killed. Huh. I asked him to wait downstairs until I was ready for them. Let's see. There are two sons, if I recall. Yes, Raymond is the elder and Peter. What are they like? Well, Raymond is pretty much of a sport, but Peter is a quiet, stay-at-home type. They're both nice fellows, as far as I know. Uh-huh. The Gould have a nurse? Yes. Would you like to see her? She's in the next room. Yes, please. Oh, I'll get her. Uh, Miss Waters? Yes? Miss Waters, would you come in, please? Yes, Doctor. Miss Waters, this is Mr. Carter. Nick Carter. How do you do? Is the detective? Yes. I regret to tell you that Mr. Gould did not die naturally. He was murdered. <gasps> murdered? But, Doctor, you said he died of heart failure. He did, Miss Waters. But somebody induced that heart failure. I want to know. Where were you when Mr. Gould died? Why, um, in the kitchen, I suppose. You see, every day Dr. Bradford comes to see Mr. Gould around 5 o'clock. So about 4.30, I go down to the kitchen to get his supper ready. He likes to eat right after the doctor goes. And I was there till Dr. Bradford called me to tell me Mr. Gould was dead. Was anyone there with you? Cook was, same as always. You don't think I did it, do you? Just checking up, that's all. <sighs> did you give him anything except his regular medicine today? No. You ever use the glass that was here in the corner of this table? Well, that was Mr. Gould's water glass. Anybody could have used it to give him a drink. He drank lots of water. Mm-hmm. Did Mr. Gould keep any valuables here in this room? The well, only thing I know about is that box of his on the shelf under the table over there. He used to... Well, I declare, it's open. Was it usually kept locked? Oh, yeah. Never saw it open before unless he was using it. And look at the keys there on the table. They was always kept under his pillow. Let's have a look at that. No, no, don't touch it. Maybe prints on it that we'll need. I'll lift it carefully like this. Ah. Yes, this copper surface shows up the prints excellently. Well. What is it, Nick? This is strange. Only one set of prints on this, too. Are they Mr. Gould's? Oh, I don't think so. I can't be sure. Well, let's see what's inside. Sorted papers, letter from his lawyer, a few notes. Ah, oh, and a will. Signed and witnessed by Amelia Waters and Delphina Hayes. That's Cook and me. Hmm. Leaves a thousand a year to Peter and the rest to Raymond. Oh, you must be mistaken, Nick. He'd never leave everything to Raymond. Well, that's what it says here. That's queer. That's very queer indeed. Does Raymond know about this will? Oh, no, sir, he doesn't. Cook and I were told to keep it a secret, and we have. I see. Are both the boys here now, Doctor? Well, yes, downstairs in the living room. Good. I'll take the dead man's prints, and then we'll have a talk with the two sons. You know the law says you have to report a murder as soon as it's discovered. 
Why ask me a fool question like that? I just wanted to be sure, Matty. Oh, for the love of Pete. Very right, well, here's the report. Yeah. Gerald Gould has just been found dead in his bed. Apparently died of heart failure. But that ain't murder, Nick. That's a... Uh, well, that... Uh, oh, fooey. But it is murder. Even though the only real proof at the moment is my own hunch. Well, why didn't you say so? I'll have a man up there right away. No use, Matty. You won't find anything. But... Won't find anything. Why not? Because I've got all the clues with me, so don't bother sending anyone up here. But, Nick, if there's a murder, I Not this it. time, Maddie. Leave everything to me. I'll see you in a little while. Goodbye. Then wait, Nick. I'm a... Did you say well, father was murdered? Father was. This isn't really my assistant. It's Nick Carter, the private investigator. Nick Carter? Now, boys, it seems to be a little questioned but what your father died of heart failure. Induced by someone who wanted him dead now rather than later. And that's murder. I can't that's believe it. Do either of you know the terms of your father's will? No, I don't. I've always understood he was planning to leave most of his money to Peter. He didn't exactly approve of me. Where have you two been this afternoon? I've been right here in the living room since after lunch. I came home about 3 o'clock, and I've been in my room ever since. Did either of you go to the sick room this afternoon at any time? I didn't. I didn't leave my room. I haven't been near it. Have there been any visitors? No, if there had been, I'd have seen them come in. Mr. Carter, what makes you think father was murdered? He left a note which said so. And also, there's additional evidence to support that fact in the fingerprints and the glass he used and on the strong box he kept in his room. Could you explain what you mean, Mr. Carter? Not just now. Then I suppose that if no one came in from outside, all of us here in the house, the cook, the nurse, Raymond and I, are all suspects? You are. I'd like to take your fingerprints, if I may. Why? I'll need them as evidence. Just put your fingers on this ink pad. So. And on this paper. Like this. Good. All right, Peter, if you don't mind. Not at all. That's right. All right, thank you, both of you. Now, neither of you will leave town until I say so. All right, sir. But how do you go about finding a killer in a case like this? Routine investigation to start with. Look into the backgrounds and personal lives of everyone concerned. That brings out the motives and frequently gives us information that will help determine guilt or innocence. Together with actual clues present at the scene of the crime, of course. Sounds pretty complicated to me. Sounds complicated to me, too, but... There's one thing about Nick Carter. He has a reputation for always uncovering the guilty party once he gets on a case. Nothing gets away from him. Well, I wish you luck, Mr. Carter. You better let me wish you luck, because it won't be lucky for whoever killed Mr. Gould. All right, Doc, you ready? Right with you, Nick. Good day, boys. Goodbye, Goodbye Dr. Dr. Bradford. Well, Nick, where do you start this uh, investigation of yours? Well, I think that before I do anything else, I better turn these documents I found in the strong box over to Mr. Lind, Gould's lawyer. Oh, I can take them down for you. I'm going that way. Oh, would you? Thanks. I'm glad to do it. That'll let me get to police headquarters a little sooner. <laughs> Matty must be ready to hang me by now. Well, it's darn near time you got here. You tell me there's been a murder, and then you tell me to stay away. Well, I sent a couple of men up there anyway. Well, Matty, as I told you on the phone, they won't find anything. I've huh? got the only clues with me right here in the bag. I'm saving you time. Save me time? Yeah. And give me heart failure. Oh, what a pal. All right, here we are. Here's a drinking glass. Contents unknown, with only the dead man's prints on it. Hmm. Have it analyzed to see what was in it, will you? Yeah, all right, Mr. Carter. Whatever you say. Thank you. Yes, Sergeant. Come in here. Yes, sir. Now, what else, Nick? Here's a copper box with some fingerprints on it. Gould kept his will and some other papers in it. Yeah? And here, for comparison, are the prints of the dead man and his two sons. See if the prints in the box can be identified. Yes, Sergeant. Here. Take this glass to the chemist. Tell him I want to know what was in it. And have the fingerprint boys look this box over. Right, Sergeant. And here, Matty, is a note. Found under the dead man's body. Here, let me see that. He killed me. He gave me... Huh. Well, I suppose he just had time to write this before he passed out. That's what I thought, too. And then when I found this pencil under the body, I wasn't so sure. How do you mean? The note was written with a soft pencil. But the pencil I found is a hard one. So the whole thing is a put-up job. Murder. I told you that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you did. Uh, I, I'm just thinking. Uh, I can think, too, can I? I hope so. Why, you... Uh, Okay, okay. Oh. Now, look, Nick, would you mind telling me about the murder? Very simple, Matty. Gerald Gould had a very bad heart. Somebody gave him a stimulant, started his heart racing, overtaxed it, and it stopped. He died. Huh. So, and without the clues you picked up, 
It would have looked like a natural death. Not bad, not bad. Here's the report, Sergeant. Oh, let's see. Glass contained benzedrine and water. <laughs> it's an awful deadly combination. Certainly is, if the victim had a bad heart, as Mr. Gould did. How about the prints on the box? The only prints on the box are Raymond's. And that means what? Considering that the will, which was in the box, leaves practically everything to Raymond, it's interesting, to say the least. You, you mean he did it? I do not. But I'm going to start finding out who did it if I can. Where are you starting? Going to do some research work on the two Gould boys. Well, good night, Matty. I'll see you soon. Okay. Hey, now look, Nick. Will you keep in touch with me? Oh, by the way, Matty, is Demler Street open again? Yeah, they finished it up yesterday. Why? It's a shortcut for me on my way back to the office. Less traffic saves time. Okay. Okay, so long. I'll be seeing you. Patsy's back yet. I'll be just like her to wait for me when there's no need of it. Calling Patsy Bowen, private investigator. Calling Patsy Bowen. Patsy Bowen. Patsy speaking, Nick. Are you in trouble? No, indeed. Just wanted to tell you to go on home. Oh, did you get your hair fixed? No, I've been waiting here. I never know when you're going to need me. Oh, sorry, Patsy. Go on home go to bed. I'll tell you all about it in the morning. Okay, Nick. Good night. Huh. Poor Patsy. Always gets done out of all of them. Hey, you... Hey, what are you doing? Driving through a red light like that. Who's driving through a red light? Well, you big palooka, are you? What's the matter? Are you colorblind? Look at the radiator of my car and the fender while you smash the whole front end. I don't see nothing. Show me where I hit you. Show you? Now, look here, man. See the way they... <laughs> oh. You, Patsy? Hello. Hello yourself. Oh, gosh, Nick, am I glad to hear you talking sense again. Huh? Talking sense? Yes. You've been lying here in the hospital for almost two days now, muttering and making no sense at all. Two days? Did you say two days? Practically. That sock you got when you hit your head against the windshield almost gave you a concussion of the brain. When I what? Say that again, Patsy. I said that sock you got when you hit your head against the windshield. Is that what you think happened? Why, of course. One of the prowl cars found you lying on the wheel of your smashed car with your forehead all cut and bloody. Patsy, it's a plot. I wasn't hurt when the smash-up occurred. Oh, I was... Nick, does your head hurt you? Yes, it does, but I'm not out of my mind. After the accident, I got out and started to argue with a mug who ran into me when he suddenly socked me in the head when I wasn't looking. Huh? Is the car that ran into me still there? Oh, no. That was a funny thing. The other car was gone. Uh, somebody wanted to get rid of me and apparently thought they had. So they towed the other wreck away. But, Nick, who, who would want to kill you? For a guess, I'd say the same person who killed Gerald Gould. I was afraid I'd find out too much when I started investigating him. Well, he failed this time, and he won't get the chance again. And I'll find out what he was afraid I'd find out just as soon as I get out of this bed. Well, the doctor says you'll have to stay here at least another three or four days. Nonsense. I'll be out of here tomorrow at the latest. Oh, by the way, have you heard anything more about the Gould case? Uh-uh. Sergeant Matheson called this morning to ask how you were. Said he was getting nowhere rapidly. Oh, uh, he said he heard the gold will was to be read tomorrow afternoon at the lawyer's office. Now I know I'll be out of here tomorrow. I've got to be present when that will is read. Oh, but Nick, you can't. And why do you have to be there? I don't know, Patsy. I just know I've got to be present when Mr. Lynn reads that will. But the doctor... Doctor said... or no doctor, I'm going to be at Lynn's office tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> Now that Mr. Carter has arrived, I shall proceed to the reading of the will. What's the idea of having a detective and a cop here? This is a family affair. Uh, Raymond, Mr. Carter and Sergeant Matheson are here at my invitation. And now, if you're ready... Yes, All right, set, right. Mr. Lynn. I shall be brief. This will, drawn up by Mr. Gould six days ago, directs that his funeral expenses and all other outstanding debts be paid first. He then directs that $1,000 a year for life be paid from his estate to his youngest son, Peter. What's that? I said he leaves you $1,000 a year for life. That's a dirty chip. He always said I was to have it all. Please, Peter, this is no time for an argument. But I can't live on that. Who gets the rest of the money? To his elder son, Raymond, Mr. Gould leaves the balance of his estate. Father never wrote that will. This is amazing. Father always said I'd get practically nothing. I'll bet you had a hand in this, Ray. Father would never do a thing like that to me. Not unless he'd been influenced. Peter, how can you think that? You had much more influence with Father than I ever did. Let me see that will. Uh, certainly, here it is. 
see. I told you something was wrong. That's not Father's signature. Hey, oh, wait a minute. Signature. I tell you, Father never signed that will. That signature is a forgery. Are you sure, Peter? Of course I'm sure. Get an expert. He'll tell you. Well, now that I look at it closely, it, it does look wrong. Uh, excuse me a moment. I know. Father would never do anything like that to me. Is this why you wanted to hear the will read? Did you expect sure. this? Well, I expected something, Patsy, but I wasn't sure what. Nick, this changes the whole case you around. Know yeah, it certainly puts sure. a new light on things, doesn't it? You know it. I think I, I begin to see where we're headed. Well, for goodness sake, Nick. Oh, why? Here's Lind again. Oh. There's no question about it, gentlemen. This will is a forgery. I see it now. Ray forged the You're will crazy. and... You're crazy. ...forged the will and then killed Father to get the money. I did no such thing. It was you who killed Father. I? Why should I kill him? I don't get anything out of the will. The boy's right. And it was Raymond's fingerprints on the strong box. Raymond Gould, I arrest you. You don't, don't arrest me. Hey, come back here. Stop Aren't you going to help, to help catch him, Nick? No, no, Matty will get him. He's got the whole police force at his command. I'm more interested in something else. Well, don't you think Raymond is guilty? It certainly looks that way, doesn't it? Oh, Mr. Lind. Oh, Mr. Carter, this is terrible. Never before has such a thing happened in my office. Oh, Mr. Lind. Did you ever see this will before? Yes, and that's why I can't understand it. I stopped in to see Mr. Gould the other afternoon, and he showed me the will he had just drawn up by himself. He bragged about saving a lawyer's fee by using his own typewriter and copying a will I had drawn for him some time ago. He said he'd changed the names of the heirs around, but that otherwise it was just the same. Was it this will you now have? To the best of my knowledge, it was and is. And get the signature... Did he say why he'd changed the will? simply said he'd learned something about his son he never knew before, and that he'd be darned if he was going to leave his money to a cheat like that. So this fake will is a copy of Mr. Gould's own will as he drew it up? I think so. As far as I can remember. Oh, it's incredible. Well, Patsy, let's go back and talk to Miss Waters again. Mr. Gould's nurse? Right. The situation has changed somewhat since I last saw her. Oh, by the way, Mr. Lynn, you mind if I take this phony will along with me? Oh, not at all. If it'll do any good in finding out what's happened... I think maybe it will. Thanks. I'll see you as soon as I learn something. Now, Miss Waters, you said you and the cook witnessed the will which Mr. Gould drew up himself. Yeah, we did. Is this your signature? Why, yes, that's... No, it ain't either. I thought not. Why, for pity's sake? Because this will is a forgery, signatures and all. Well. Did either of the sons ever borrow their father's typewriter? Yeah, they did. Both of them. Every little while. Patsy, go upstairs and get me a sample of typing from that machine, will you? Of course, Nick. Bring you back every letter there is on it. Good girl. Now, Miss Waters, tell me. Was there any friction between Mr. Gould and either of the boys? Him and Raymond used to argue all the time. Mr. Gould didn't like the way Raymond carried on. But him and Peter got along all right. Mm-hmm. Did Mr. Gould have an argument with anyone shortly before he drew up the new will? Do you know? Yeah, he did. I was going by his room the evening before, and I could hear him giving somebody what for. To whom was he talking? Well, now, I, I couldn't tell you. The other voice was so low, I don't know who it was. But Mr. Gould got a letter that afternoon, made him all excited. Maybe that was what he was talking about. Yes, maybe it was. And that reminds me, Mr. Carter... Another letter come today from that same party. You mean the one that got him so excited before? Yeah. Recognize the fancy handwriting. Want to see it? Yes, I think I better. All right, here it is. Dear Mr. Gould, why haven't you answered my last letter? I can't wait any longer. If you don't do what I asked you to, in three days I'm going to start something. And you don't want that, do you? Your friend, Alice Fenwick. Return address. 35 Gladstone Place. Here's your typing sample, Nick. Uh, oh, thanks. Yes. That's the typewriter that was used to type the phony will beyond any question. Good. Well, Patsy, if you'll come along with me, I'd like to introduce you to Miss Alice Fenwick. Huh? Who in the world is Alice Fenwick? Well, after I introduce her to you, you can introduce her to me. I don't know her either, but I expect to shortly. <laughs> a lonely section out here. Yeah, it's pretty well out in the suburbs. We're nearly there now. <laughs> hey, Patsy, hmm? you see that car parked in the dark shadows under that tree? Yes, why? Uh, that's the car that ran into me the night I was hurt. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I recognize that patch of light-colored paint on the rear fender. Well, what's it doing out here? I wonder. Hey, maybe there's some connection between that car and the Fenwick girl. She lives in the next house. Oh, Nick, hurry, let's find out. Maybe it's more trouble. I hope we're not too late to prevent it if there is. Mug who knocked me out plays altogether too rough. 
All right, this is close enough. Okay. Don't make any more noise than is necessary, that's it. I won't. Somebody's having a fight in there, Nate. That yeah, sounds that way. Let's look there, through the kitchen window. Nicky's threatening her. I better get in there and fast. Nicky's choking her. He's going to kill her. All right, you take your hands off that girl. Up with your hands, fast. Where'd you come from? Keep your hands up and your mouth shut. Patsy, see how she is. Sure, Nick. Now you. What are you doing here? None of your business. Who sent you? We've got you cold, so your only chance is to tell what you know. Jack sent me. Told me to scare her so she'd shut up about it. Jack who? Jack Gould. Who's Jack Gould? Old man Gould's son, the, the guy who killed the old man. You sure his name is Jack? Well, how should I know? That's what they call him. Hmm. How's the girl, Patsy? She'll be all right, Nick. More scared than hurt, I think. Okay, I'll call Mary and tell him we're coming down. If he's picked up Raymond and if he can get Peter to join us, our car party will be complete. Then we can settle this case. <laughs> So you caught Raymond, eh, Matty? Yeah. Excellent. Didn't get far, did he? I'll say he didn't. I'm glad you didn't let him get away. He has to pay for what he did. I didn't do it, I tell you, no matter what you say. All right, all right. You know what, Nick? Raymond here says he only ran away because the evidence looked so black against him that he was afraid he'd be convicted. And that's just the way the murderer wanted it to look, Matty. What? You mean he didn't do it, Nick? He did not. Peter killed his father. No, I better sit right where you are, Peter. I want to check my story for me. You haven't got anything against me, not a thing. There's a cop outside the door, son, so I wouldn't try nothing. Are you uh, sure you don't want those other two brought in, Nick? Not yet, Matty. Now, here's the story. About a week ago, Mr. Gould got a letter from a girl named Alice Fenwick telling him Peter had promised to marry her and that on the strength of that promise, she had loaned him almost every cent she had. Several thousand, she says. Yeah? Peter gambled it away and then told her he was through with her. He told him there was a baby coming and insisted he marry her. He laughed at her, so she wrote his father. After a row with Peter, which Miss Waters overheard, Gould changed his will. Somehow, Peter found out about it and got the idea that if he copied the will, which left everything to Raymond, copied it just as it was and forged the signatures, he could claim just what he later did, that Raymond had forged the will and killed his father to get the money. Nick, that's just what he said in the lawyer's office. That was part of his plan, too. Raymond's running away was the action of an innocent man who was scared. So Peter faked the will, then killed father. Correct. And if the plan had gone as Peter had expected it to, I would have been executed for father's death. And Peter would have inherited all the money. You can't prove a word of what you said, Carter. I can or I wouldn't be saying it. It was you, not your father, who wrote the note saying he'd been murdered. You did that to be sure nobody thought he had died a natural death. And you might have gotten away with it, but you left the wrong pencil with the note. Do you call that proof? And after my interview with you two boys that afternoon, you hired a thug to kill me. And it was just pure luck that he failed. That's a lie. And then this afternoon, when you saw me up and around again, you got panicky that Alice Fenwick might be found and tell her story. So you sent this same thug to kill her, too. Peter did all that? He did. The thug didn't know your correct name, so I asked him to come down here and identify you. All right, get him, will you, Patsy? Of course, Nick. Will you come in, please? Okay. All right, you... Is this man sitting here the one who hired you to bump me off and kill the Fenwick girl? Yeah, that's the guy. You lie. I never saw you before. Oh, so that's the way it is. You're going to leave me to take the rap alone, huh? Nothing doing, Jack. You're in this as deep as me. Now, wait a minute, you. Nick, you're a wonder. But there's one thing that bothers me. Why were the only fingerprints we found on the strong box Raymond's? That's easy, Matty. If you were a criminal and wanted to be sure you didn't leave any prints on a shiny copper surface, would you wipe off the box before or after you handled it? Oh, that's a silly question. Why, after, naturally. Well? Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. It was the guy who handled the box ahead of Raymond who was really the guilty one. <laughs> no one ever wiped the box off before he handled it. Raymond, as a matter of curiosity, when did you touch that box? Right after Father's death, while the doctor was phoning, mm -hmm. I looked in the room and saw the box was unlocked. So I sneaked a quick look at the will. That was all. Well, all I gotta say is, son, that your curiosity almost got you executed. If it hadn't been for Nick here. Suppose you watch out next time you feel nosy. You may not get off so easy. <laughs> Well, Nick, 
Rick, it's about time to hear something about next week's story, I think. How about it? Well, next week, Ken, we're going to hear about a moving picture in which Waldo took an active part. But not an active enough part. Other clues were a few yellow hairs, a pair of Hollywood sunglasses. And a movie director whose looks in 15 years didn't change at all. And what do you call this mixed-up mess? I call it the case of the make-believe robbery. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcasts of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, original music is played by George Wright, script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at this same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's the case of the make-believe robbery. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. So I says to the director, well, how about putting me in this picture too? Why should I pay you ten bucks to see? You ain't no cop. Or oh, ain't I, I says to him. I'm Waldo McGlynn, that's who I am. I don't wear no uniform, but I'm the best doggone detective in this town. Well, when he hears that, he says, Okay, give the other cops a hand holding back the crowd there. Well, why don't quiet, you give me... Quiet, quiet, everybody, quiet. Let me have your attention, please. We're ready to start shooting. Each one of you police knows the job you're to do. Let's get started. Okay, now here's the layout. Bandit car drives up, the two crooks get out of the car, walk into Ryan Gold's jewelry store, and go straight through the store to the offices in the back. The camera will follow them as they go. We're not taking any sound now, that'll be dubbed in later. Then, as the crooks come out of the store again, they'll get in the car and drive up the street. The sound truck and camera will follow them for some other shots later. Is that clear? Uh, you know, you know what he means? Yeah, I know. All right, stand by. Everybody in the scene, act natural, please, and don't look at the camera. Here comes the bandit car. On your toes now. All right, you two crooks, look around. Now walk into the store. Don't hurry. Now, straight down the main aisle to the rear. That's it. Now go into the office. You know what to do there. All right, now stand back. Don't shove. Take it easy, will you? Gee, McGlynn, this is exciting being part of a real moving picture. Oh, I don't know. It's all right if you ain't never done it before. Have you ever been in a picture before? Have I been in a pic... Have I been in a picture? That's what I said, have you? Uh, you, you know, this ain't a bad way to make ten bucks, just standing around watching some other guys work. Uh, I bet you've never been in a picture. Hey, those were pistol shots. Come on. Hold it, you dope. Those were part of the moving picture, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to find out what you'd do if Who I... are you, kid? Uh, look, when I was out in Hollywood, I used Why to be the top... Well, the two oh. are coming back now. All right, you two. Now, just take it easy. Nobody's going to stop you. That's it. Now get into your car and drive off down the street. We'll follow you for the other seats. Now get going. We'll be right behind you. You policemen hold back the crowd until we get well down the street, and then you can let them go. You'll get your checks at headquarters tonight. 
Thanks, and so long. Well, that's that. I sure wish I could make ten bucks. Help, hey, please. hey, what is it, lady? The cashier's been murdered. They shot him down in uh, cold blood. Take it easy, lady. He ain't dead. This was he just a... He ain't dead, I tell you. Shot through the head. He's really dead. <laughs> Mr. Carter, you got to do something. I'm ruined. That's why I'm here, Mr. Rangold. Mary, I'm amazed that at least one of your cops wasn't bright enough to have seen through this phony moving picture business. Oh, don't rub it in, Nick, please. Was headquarters ever approached at all? Never. The individual cops were the only ones they contacted. One million dollars away, the beautiful stones they took right out of the main safe and killed my cashier. Oh, don't you carry insurance on your jewels, Mr. Rangold? Oh, sure, I carry insurance, but I lose all my stock stones. Ah. Well, did you know about this moving picture business in advance? Oh, sure I did. About 11 o'clock this morning, a guy who said he was Fred Harlan, a director for Colossal Pictures, come in and asked me, could they use my store for making a movie? Said they wanted a one-story building like mine, not too big, but important. I said, would the sign over the store show in the picture? And he said, yes. So I told him, okay. Did this man who said he was Harlan have any credentials? Oh, sure. Sure, his papers was good. Colossal Pictures, it said. Who was here with you at the time? Uh, there was me, my nephew, Lester Green, and my cashier. What did this Harlan look like? Well, a little bigger than me. Blonde hair, good looking, about 45 maybe. It was wearing sunglasses, the Hollywood kind. Mm -hmm. You keep the safe open or closed during the day? Always. It's closed. So much jewels it contains. When we want something, we unlock it. Take out what we want and then quick close it and lock it again. Who had the combination? Uh, me, my nephew Lester, and my cashier, nobody else. Keep the burglar alarm on or off during the day? Always, it's on. Uh, we have a button to turn it off, and we want to get in. See right here. The... Look, the alarm is still on. Why didn't it go off when the safe was open? If the alarm wasn't turned off, we can be sure the cashier didn't open the safe for them. Let's see. Uh-huh. Here's why the alarm didn't work. What you got, Nick? Now, the alarm wire's been cut. Piece taken out of it to make sure it would stay cut. Uh. Hey, Nick. Since the safe wasn't forced open and the cashier didn't open it, that means the crooks had the combination. Mr. Reingold, you say only the three of you knew the combination? Yeah, that's right. And one of you three helped in this robbery, and the cashier is dead, which lets him out, I should say. Well, then you think me or Lester, we should rob ourselves? It's been done before. Oh, come in, come in. I got here as quick as I could, Mr. Reingold. Who are you? Well, I'm Mickey Armbruster, the store detective. What were you doing while they pulled off this fast job? Well, I'm off on Monday, Sergeant. I work Sundays as watchman, and Lester takes over for me on Monday. Oh. Mr. Rangold called me, so I came right down to see if there was anything I could do. I don't think so, thanks. By the way, where is Lester? Since the robbery, I ain't seen him to no good. Well, let me know when he comes back, will you? I'd like to talk to him. Oh, sure, sure. Right away, I'll tell you. Waldo, was the sound truck a colossal truck? Well, no, Nick. I noticed it came from the Kramer Sound Equipment Company. Why? That's strange. You'd think that if Colossal was doing the job, they'd furnish their own truck. Colossal had nothing to do with it, Nick. We checked. That part was as phony as the rest of it. Uh, maybe there ain't no Fred Harlan, neither, Nick. That's the odd thing about this, Waldo. There is a Fred Harlan. Huh? Well, there was, years ago. He used to be top director in the Colossal lot. Maybe this wasn't that Harlan, Nick. That thought occurred to me, too, Matty. Well, we've done all we can here. You said there were no fingerprints? My men couldn't find one anywhere. Oh, it was a slick job. And let's go. See you later, Mr. Rangold. Yes, sure, sure. Matty, I suggest you have some of your men check up on this Rangold and this nephew of his, Lester Green. Yeah. Also, check the Kramer Sound Equipment people and see if they can help us. Waldo and I are going to drop in on Scubby and see what he can dig up for us and Fred Harlan. Right, Nick. Be seeing you. Now, Mr. Kramer ain't here now. When'll he be back? I don't know. Look, have you seen a fellow with blonde, wavy hair around here in the last couple of days? Blonde, wavy hair? Yeah. Wish my hair was wavy. I tried my sister's hair curl and stuff, but it didn't do no good. Did you see that guy around? Maybe I should have wore a hairnet like she does. Look, I... dimwit, can you answer me a plain, simple question? Sure, well, go ahead. Ask me a question. Ask me a question. Look, has a guy with blonde, wavy hair been around here lately? The fellow directed the movie this noon had wavy hair. That's the one I mean. Have you seen him? Yeah, he was directing the crooks. And they shot off guns and a woman came rushing out and yelled murder. But she didn't fool me. I'm too smart. 
Martin. Yeah, yeah, I'll see you. She said somebody had been killed, but I knew better. A man was killed. That's why I'm... Well, you, huh? Well, maybe you've never been to the movies. They shoot a guy and blood runs all down his face and he falls down. Oh. That's only ketchup. I read about it in the book. Why, you dumb half-witted dope. You ought to what be... What are you doing here, Lenny? Huh? Oh, I was just hanging around. Well, why don't you go home? I told you not to hang around the office. Oh, I won't lie. Hey, you Ted Kramer? Yes, here I am. What can I do for you? I'm Matheson, homicide. Oh. You seen a man with blonde, wavy hair around here recently? Well, you must mean Fred Holland, the movie director. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, sure. He was in here yesterday. Hired my sound truck. He uh, tell you anything about himself? Well, he said he was an old-time director. He showed me his credentials. Said yeah. he was doing a job for Colossal, but they weren't furnishing the truck because the job was too small. He had to furnish the cameraman, too. Know who he was? Yeah, he's a friend of mine. I recommended him, and Harlan hired him. Darn good man, too. Does a lot of picture work. Uh, what did this Harlan look like? Oh, about 5'10", good-looking, man of about 45, I'd say, mm. uh, wore big Hollywood sunglasses. But it was raining yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I know, but you know these Hollywood nuts. All right, he tell you anything about the job he was going to do? Yeah, he did. He, he was all excited about it. Said he was just shooting a few scenes, but it would give him a chance to show that he was still a good director. Mm -hmm. He was trying to make a comeback, he said. Your truck's not back yet, huh? No, no, he, he said he'd probably keep it all day. Well, okay. Thanks, sir. Uh, See you later. So long. Well, here you are, Nick. This is everything I can find in the files about Fred Harlan. Thanks, Cubby. Hey, look at the bunch of stuff he's got there. That Harlan must have been quite a guy. Oh, he sure was. Here, Waldo, you take these clippings. Okay. Scubby, you take these. Yep. I'll go through these others. Okay. Oh, here's a picture of the guy, Nick. Oh, let me see. Uh, that's the guy, Nick. That's the lad who directed the movie this morning. Sure as you're a foot high. Yes? It's the date of this. Oh, taken 15 years ago. No change in his looks in 15 years? I wish I could do that. Nobody can do that, Scubby. That's what interests me. Hey, Nick, he had his horoscope told, too. <laughs> oh, anything for publicity, Walter. Yeah, I see. Hey, and here's an article about him and his fingerprints, too. Hmm? He didn't miss a trick. Let me have that, Walter. Yeah, sure. Oh, here are the last ones, Nick. Reports of his accident and the follow-up stories. Accident, huh? Serious? Mm, almost fatal. Doctor said he suddenly cracked up while he was driving. Went over an embankment and was badly broken up. Hey, let me see those, will you? Oh, sure. Here you are. Thanks. Hmm. Ribs broken, arm broken two places, leg cracked, bad cuts on head, long jagged cut under right ear. Cut under right ear. Yes, I seem to remember seeing a scar like that very recently. You mean Harlan still has it, Nick? I've never seen Harlan, Scully. But I've seen that scar somewhere today. Where, Nick? I'm not sure. Spent months in the California Medical Hospital under the care of Dr. Edward Wilson. That all, Scubby? Yeah, that's all. He dropped out of sight after that. All right, thanks. That helps a lot. Now I'll call the office and see what's happened there. Then we'll look up Harlan himself if we can find his address. And if there is such a person... Anything new? Oh, uh, not much, Patsy. The boys are... Oh, one moment, Sergeant. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Patsy, Nick. Have you heard anything from Matty yet? Oh, he's right here. You want to talk to him? Yes, put him on. Nick wants to talk to you, Sergeant. Oh, thanks, Patsy. Hello, Nick. Matty, anything new? Well, the boys just found the sedan the crooks used about six miles out of town near the river. The sound truck is in the river. They're hauling out soon as the crane gets there. Any reports on Rheingold or Lester Green yet? Yeah, we've been working fast. Nothing much on Rheingold, except that he had his stuff completely insured, so he won't lose a nickel. But this nephew of his, this Lester, seems to have been quite a lad in days past. That's so? Yeah. Has a long record with the Hollywood police. Oh, nothing serious, just some studio brawls and several arrests for reckless driving. Lost his job at the studio because he was so wild. You mean he worked in a studio? Yeah, he was a bit actor for a while. And he'd know the movie technique, wouldn't he? What? By golly, Nick, he sure would. Has he turned up yet? No, he hasn't. But we got the boys watching for him. Good. Going out to have a look at the truck when they get it out of the river? I'm on my way there now, yeah. Well, take Patsy with you, will you? Why, sure. What do you want her to do? Put her on. I'll tell her. Okay. Here, Patsy, Nick, won't you? Thanks. Yes, Nick? Patsy, listen. I want you to go with Maddie. 
Get the license number of the crook's car so we can trace it. Uh-huh. Get copies of any fingerprints Matty finds and any other dope you can get. Bring them back to the office. All right, Nick. Uh, call Dr. Wilson at... Carter here. I want to see Carter. Oh, hold it, Nick. I'm sorry, but Mr. Carter's not in just now. Who are you, please? I'm Lester Green. Lester Green. Just the boy I want to see. Well, who are you? Sergeant Matheson, Homicide Bureau. Oh, so you're the guy. What the devil do you mean by telegraphing Hollywood? Checking up on me. We wanted to find out what kind of a guy you are. And we did. Oh, yes, so I get into a couple of jams out there. What's that to you? Plenty. Right now? Right. Well, I was just a kid when I was in Hollywood six years ago. I'm different now. Says you. You got into jams out there. Now you're in a jam here. Who says I'm in a jam? I do. You want a poke in the nose? Just one little poke, mister, and you'll find yourself behind bars. Okay, Nick, I'll take care of everything. Bye. Now then, what do you know about the robbery of your uncle's store? The store? Yeah. Was robbed? Yeah. When? Oh, I suppose you don't know nothing about it. Well, no, I don't. Huh? <laughs> well, then you won't mind answering a few questions for me, will you? Oh, gosh, no. Well, that's better. Now, I got to go out to have a look at that truck, so suppose you come along with me. On the way, you can tell me everything you've done since you got up this morning. be way out in the sticks by now. Are you sure we're going right? That's what the cop said. Straight ahead to the next gas station and turn right. Yeah, maybe this address we're going to is a phony, Nick. Just because Harlan gave it to the man he rented the sedan from, don't, don't prove he really lives there. You know? Doesn't prove he doesn't either. Mm. Oh, look, there's a gas station up ahead, Nick. One of them little one-pump places. Good. That must be it. I hope he's got something to eat there. I'm starved. How many you want, please? Fill it up. Should take about five gallons. Okay. By the way, do you happen to know if a man by the name of Fred Harlan lives around here? Harlan, sure thing. Lives about half a mile up this road. Seen him lots of times. Good-looking fellow. Blonde, wavy hair, about my height. Wears big sunglasses. Yup, that's the fellow. But does he always wear those sunglasses? Oh, sure, all the time. Oh, once he took them off to wipe them, I seen he had a bad cast in his left eye. Guess he don't want nobody to see his bum eye. Anybody live up there with him? Oh, never see anybody. Always alone when he come in here. You want anything else? Oh, you better look at the oil. Okay. Do you know anything about his business? Oh, yeah, he was here a couple of days ago. Told me he was movie director. Said he was going to have a chance to make a picture and get his yacht back again. It's the same guy, all right, Nick. And it is Harlan. Maybe. Have you seen him in the last few hours? No. He went out of here this morning early. I ain't seen him since. Well, his dog is still there, though. I hear him barking a while back. The mean creature, that dog. Harlan told me once I better keep away from his place if I didn't want to get that up. I see. Well, how much do I owe you? Well, six gallons gas is a dollar twenty. Uh, your oil's all right. Here you are. Uh, you got anything to eat here? Uh, got some hot dogs and some candy bars. Uh, hot dogs. Them's for me. Uh, give me two. Uh, you want mustard or cold slaw on them? Yeah, put them both on. I ain't fussy. And a pickle, too. Give me two hot dogs. No mustard or anything. Not even a roll. Just the plain franks. Two? Uh, without no rolls. No nothing. A uh, used plane? That's right. Well, it seems to me you've been crazy, but it's your business. I thought you never ate them things, Nick. I don't. I'm buying them for a friend. I hope he likes them. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, Nick, it's almost dark here under these trees. Yes. Oh, oh. Isn't a very attractive place Harlan lives in. That must be the dog he told us about. Yeah, the, the, the dog. I, I hope he don't decide to take a bite out of my leg. Well, if my plan goes right, Walter, this dog won't take a bite out of either of us. Now, let's see if Harlan is home. Seems to be no one here but the dog. Well, let's see if we can get this door open. Uh, this was easy. Now what? Now well, I open the door just a crack like this. And give Mr. Fred Harlan's dog the two beanies I bought for him. Nice doggy. Bet you're hungry. Here, see how these taste. 
You think you're going to be his pal for life because you brung him a little hot dog? You're crazy, Nick. Perhaps, and perhaps not. You feeling tired, doggy? Well, lie down, take a little nap. That's the way. Now close your eyes. Hey, what are you doing, Nick? Hypnotizing him? Yeah, now we can open the door all the way and walk in. Well, well holy mackerel. That hound is dead to the world. What did you do to him, Nick? Just fed him the two hot dogs he bought at the gas station, that's all. You mean them two weenies did that to him? Those two weenies, Waldo, had a couple of knockout drops in them. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Now, let's see what we can find here. Now, this room hasn't been used recently. Try the next one. Uh, no, this one ain't either. Uh, dust is thicker than the rug. That's just the kitchen. Yeah. And they use this room all right. What a mess. If you start hunting for clues in this place, you got yourself an all-night job. And I can't spend that much time on it. Well, let's have a look upstairs. Yeah. Come on. You, you know, the, the guy at the gas station said he never spent much time here. Well, maybe he just lived in one room in the kitchen. I think you're right, Waldo. Yes, and this is undoubtedly the room he used when he was here. Nick, do you suppose the crooks talked Harlan into a deal and then, then bumped him off when they were through with him? Waldo, the fact that the man who ran this show looked like the Harlan of 15 years ago leads me to believe that there's been an impersonation. Yeah? But, but who impersonated who? That's what I'm trying to find out. Now, first, let's pick out some good fingerprints. Should be plenty of them on this dressing table. Yes, here. And here. Lift them off for the files. You mean, you mean the way you showed me the other night, huh? Yes, use the clear scotch tape. Okay, Nick. Hey, did you notice all the makeup he's got here? Yes, and there's several pictures here that look like those taken 15 years ago. You notice? Yeah. Looks as if they've been used as models for making up. Here, what's this? Huh, hairs. Blonde, wavy hairs. Hey, that's what we're looking for, ain't it? Yeah. Uh-huh. Now we're getting somewhere. Waldo, these hairs didn't come out of a head. They came off a wig. Off in a wig? How do you know? Have no roots on them. Made hmm. up in a wig, huh? Now I know that was an impersonation. Oh, oh Nick, Nick. I just, just happened to see this here in the, in the wastebasket. What is it? It's a piece of wrapping paper from, from Rheingold's jewelry store. Right. Do you see what it says on it here? To be called for. Yes. Look at the name of the one who was to do the calling. Yeah. Well, well, what's the connection between him and Harlan, Nick? A very strong one, I believe. You got any ideas? I have. Right now, we're going back to the office to gather up lo what loose ends we can. And you're going to bring Harlan's dog along with you. Bring the dog? Are you crazy, Nick? Maybe I am. I bring him along just the same. <laughs> the truck up out of the river, they found this megaphone in it. And it has fingerprints on it. You mean the water didn't wash them off? Water doesn't hurt Prince Waldo. Patsy, did you get a picture of them? Uh-huh. Sergeant Matheson gave me one. Here. Now, where did I put that news picture? Ah, oh, yes. Here it is. Now, let's see. Ah. The prints on the megaphone match the picture of Harlan's prints exactly. Then, by golly, Nick, it was the original Harlan who did the job. Is that good or bad, Nick? Anything that helps solve the case is good, Patsy. And if Harlan himself did it, it's certainly one step near the end. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Oh, yes, just a moment, please. I'll put Mr. Carter on. And Nick is Dr. Wilson of the California Hospital. He's the one who treated Harlan after his accident. Oh, yes. Hello, Dr. Wilson. Yes. Uh-huh. I see. Wouldn't have recognized him, huh? Yes, of course. Well, Doctor, do you know where he went after he left the hospital? Oh, he did? I see. Well, thanks very much, Doctor, for taking the time to call me like this. I really appreciate it. Goodbye. Well, Nick? Just as we suspected. When Harlan left the hospital, it would have been difficult for even his old friends to have recognized him. He was badly oh. cut about the head and had lost over 50 pounds. Dr. Wilson said he was in pretty bad shape. And he came back here to live. Nick, Nick, I'm getting all balled up here. If Harlan actually is Harlan, 
He couldn't look the way he did 15 years ago before the accident, but if he does look the way he did then, it can't really be Harlan, which it is. Oh, boy, you are tangled up, aren't you? Patsy, call Mary and tell him to meet us at Rheingold's store. Waldo, how's the dog? You're still sleeping, Glory B. He's a mean son of a gun, that one. Okay, put him under your arm and let's go. Put him under your arm and let's go. It's all I can do to lift a brute off the floor. No, don't gripe, Waldo. Just be glad it isn't a Great Dane. A Great... Oh, nuts. Come on, you. Hi, Matty. Hello, Nick. Ah, so you brought Lester, too, huh? Excellent. Yep, I thought we might as well all be here for the fireworks. So, Mr. Carter, you got news for us, yes? I have, Mr. Rangold. I have news, the solution of the case in the name of the murderer. Uh, you hear that, Mickey? That's the kind of a detective you should be. The way you should catch more people stealing in my store, maybe. Well, how'd you do it, Mr. Carter? I don't mind learning something when I can. I studied the facts and found out more facts. I discovered that this robbery today was the result of years, probably, of careful planning, of leading a double life. The killer being himself half the time and somebody else the rest. I learned that a man was so badly broken down through a nervous collapse in an automobile wreck that his own friends wouldn't have known him. And he traded on that fact, got himself a job of trust and confidence. In fact, he became an employee of a jewelry store. He was a store detective. Well, what do you know about that? Carter, are you insinuating nothing? I'm insinuating nothing. I'm giving facts. You got yourself this job here, watched and schemed and planned, and when you were ready, pulled this phony movie set up and robbed the safe. Well, that's hard to believe, Nick. Has he got proof? Waldo, let the dog in. Okay, Nick. I'm glad I am to do it. Hey, hey, what's all this, Nick? Why the dog act? That dog belongs to Harlan. He also belongs to Mickey, as you can see by the way he greets him. For a while, I thought somebody impersonating Harlan had done this robbery, but I finally realized that the man who impersonated Harlan was Harlan himself, now known as Mickey Armbruster. Well, I'm mixed up. <laughs> you got more proof than a dog, Mr. Carter? I have. When Matty takes Mickey's fingerprints, he'll find that they match these prints of Harlan's I found in a newspaper. And they'll match the prints found in the megaphone the phony movie director used. And you'll find Mickey knew the combination of the safe also. It took time to get it, but he was in no hurry. When he was here in the store Sunday watching, he cut the burglar alarm wires as a safety precaution. And he wore the dark glasses while he was playing Harlan to conceal the cast in his eye, which, as Mickey, is so plainly evident. Well, Mickey, am I right? Yes, Carter, you're right. I thought my plan was foolproof, that by impersonating myself as I looked 15 years ago, I'd throw you all off the track. My jewels, Mickey, you bum, where are my jewels? Why, you'll never see them. My pals will take care of me when the time comes. Who work with you, Mickey? You don't really expect me to tell you that, do you? They're friends of mine. I'm going to need friends before this is over. You don't have to tell us who they are, Mickey. We'll find them without your help. As a movie director, you should know better than to take moving pictures of your pals and then not destroy the film. That's the best evidence in the world. The camera was on the soundtrack when we drove it into the river. It was, but it just happens that the camera was watertight and the film is still good. It's being developed right now. And when we get a look at it, we'll be able to pick up your pals and recover all of Ryan Gold's jewelry. The movie you were making may have been a phony, but the film you took was real. And your conviction is going to be real, too. You can depend on that. Well, Nick, before you give us a peek into your story for next week, I want to talk for a moment to the young men of America. You know, it is no longer true, if it ever was, that men join the Army only if they can't get jobs anywhere else, or if they're not fitted for some other job, or if they're too lazy to look for one. The new American Army of today is a compact, carefully chosen group of skilled technicians with brains and ability. Young men seeking to enter the Army today must be able to understand and profit by technical training that is second to none. The skills that the men in the new American Army acquire, no matter what branch of the service they may be in, equals and often exceeds that demanded by many of the best-paid civilian trades. You can do no better for yourself and your country than to join the new American Army and become an informed technician in at least one of the many specialized fields offered. Excellent advice, Ken. Well, Lake, uh, what about your story next week? Well, next week, Ken, I'm going to tell you about an adventure I had recently when an explosion of unknown origin burned down a warehouse. An alarm clock missing from an ex-soldier's trailer proved that the fire was incendiary. And a bit of green paint on a crowbar led us directly to the firebug himself. Who wasn't a firebug at all, 
but a crook who wanted to get rid of some very incriminating evidence. What do you call this story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Missing Alarm Clock. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcasts of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis, and Scubby by John Kane. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor and Peggy Mayer. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at the same time. This is Ken Powell saying so long until next week. program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability of solving crime is unequal in the history of detective victims, Nick Carter, Master Detective.
Huh? Seen the crowd around here? If you mean them two guys who just went in the room? Yes, I seen them. Oh, so that he's already gone in, huh? Yeah, looks pretty dangerous to me the way them walls are being looking. He's dangerous. I told him so. Why, any minute, them walls... Yes, yes. Hey, wait a minute. Whoa, What's whoa. that? Walls came in. Stick! Stick! Watch out!
so he wouldn't know that we had the information about it. Well, you better take the clock, just the same. All of you stay here and wait for the other one to be sent down. Then you and Maddie check carefully to see if the way the clock is wired up is the same or different. Sure. Come to the office. I'll be waiting for you. This information may be very valuable. <laughs> Coffee. And I've seen a little bit dull around here this morning. I was just looking through it. <laughs> as long as you don't believe anything you're reading, it won't hurt you, I guess. <laughs> oh, uh, did you find anything interesting at the fire? Oh, I don't know. Might be the work of the Jersey Firebug, since an alarm clock was used to set it off. The Jersey Firebug? Yes. Why the surprise? Well, there's an article in this magazine I'm reading on him and all the fires he set. Huh? Oh, one of the series on pyromaniacs, apparently. That's so. Will you explain that system you use? Well, sure. Pictures, diagrams, and descriptions tells all about the clock. Well, does it show how the clock was hooked up? Oh, well, not in detail, no. It just says it was used to set off the fire. Huh. Well, does it mention the fact that he always robbed the safe first? No. Uh, did he? Hmm. Well, someone should have read that article and tried to imitate the Jersey like that, right? Without knowing about the clock. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, did you find out to whom the army serial number belongs? Oh, after considerable telephoning around and getting stunted from one person to another, I finally got what she wanted. She oh. saw Jay Huston, let out a couple of months ago on a medical discharge. Anxiety neurosis, they told me. I checked the U.S. yes, but they have no record of his having any job. You find any address for him? Well, the only address they had was the Sunset Trailer Camp out on Long Island. Hmm. If you were discharged because of an anxiety and neurosis, you must be the kind of man who would set fires and things. Oh, Patsy, you ought to know better than that. But Nick, if... Patsy, when they discharge a man from the army because of a neurosis, it doesn't mean he's cracked up or crazy. An anxiety neurosis is like overwork, run down. Boy, it's undoubtedly perfectly sane. Too many people, just as you did now, think a man with a medical discharge is nuts and refuse to have anything to do with it. <laughs> All he really needs is a room as a chance to pull himself together again. Be just the same as you or I. Oh, but Nick, it's true you found that the fire seems to lead directly to him. Well, even if you did it, Patsy, it has nothing to do with it having a medical discharge. No war angle to this whatsoever. Uh, and who's never been in the army become fireplace. Well, I'm sorry, Nick. I, I guess I just didn't think. Yeah, just like a lot of other people. Well, I'm not trying to be tough with you about this, Patsy, but it's just that... Hi, uh, Nick. Well, how are you, Patsy? Well, uh, hi, Waldo. From the look on your face, you must have some news. Uh, well, what did you find, Walter? You were right, Nick. The clock we found at the warehouse is picked up altogether different from the one Matthew had. Not the same at all. Oh. If it were, no space to crack, and an article in a magazine telling how to keep down. Uh, uh, I'd say it all adds up to let the Jersey firebug out completely. In which case, there better be in our way to the Sunset Trailer Camp to have a talk with Charles J. Haskell. <laughs> Isn't it, Nick? Yeah. Must be more or less permanent, too. The only thing looks. Oh, poor Waldo. What caused that, you might? Oh, I was just thinking how sore Waldo was that you wouldn't bring him along. Waldo is one of those things called a procrastinator. You can give him a job to do, but because it's just routine running around, he tries to put it off as long as he possibly can. <laughs> oh, well, uh, this is the Hatton trailer, this green one with the white trim. It matches the description the man that gave you. This is the right location. Yeah. And if the door being open means it has to be around somewhere. Well, we can look in, can't we? That won't hurt anything. Yeah, that should be all right. But I hope it shows up soon. Oh, well, there you are, Nick. Oh, nice. Well, oh, well, well, the right arm of the law. What happened to you? You're right behind us. The next time I looked around, you disappeared. Oh, I got stopped at that last red light. Then I got boxed up behind the truck and couldn't get out. <laughs> Everything happens to me. <laughs> um... Is this the uh, Hopkins place? Yes, we were just going to have a look inside while we were waiting. Let's look here. Hmm? Look at that. Yeah. He's made fun of a crime in his war Hey, two very pistols, canteen, cartridge belt. And two sacks like the one Nick found after the fire, with the same identification on them. Yeah. And there should be a third one. Empty faces. I guess, right? 
for Truman. Magnesium flare. Oh, what a beautiful gray segment. It certainly looks like it has some had something to do with it. And the greenish blue sort of explosion the Watson saw could easily be a magnesium flare. Yeah, it don't look so good for Mr. Houston. He's got some pretty fast explaining to do. Must be around somewhere. He wouldn't have let the door open this way. What the devil are you doing in my trailer? Are you Charles Hudson? Yes, so what? Stand up here to see you. We're out, so we just looked in. How'd you get in? Um, the door was open, so we walked in. Yeah, that's a likely story. I left the door locked. You must have broken it. That's what you did. What do you want? Are you sure you locked the door when you left? Sure, I'm sure. You calling me a liar? Not at all. But it was open when we got here. Yeah? Well, look here. You forced it open. See? Here's the mark of the Jimmy. Huh? I thought you right. Why is Jimmy open? We didn't do it, Hassan. Believe me. Why should I believe you? I can see what I see. The lock's busted and you're inside. Now, look here, Hassan. Cops don't go around breaking in doors that way. Cops? They're the worst of the whole bunch. A lot of white. All, all right, all right, Hassan. Wait a minute. When did you leave here? Yesterday morning. What's it to you? What have you been doing since then? Why should I answer a lot of silly questions? I don't have to. you better take it easy. Now, we want some information. If you won't tell us here, I'll have to take you down to headquarters and make you answer. What did I do? Kill somebody? What have you been doing since yesterday morning? <laughs> Isn't it bad enough to have no home but this lousy trailer? No place to bring my wife where we can live together? No job, no nothing? But you have to come here and accuse me of heaven knows why. We're not accusing you of anything yet. Uh, tell me, Hassan, uh, what happened to that stack of magnesium flares that's missing from your collection? What do you mean, missing? It was here when I left. Well, it's not there now. Any idea what happened to it? No, I haven't. You probably took it. Hey, my alarm clock has gone too. Well, that's good. You bust in my door, steal my stuff, then ask me a lot of silly questions. I'm not accountable to anybody anymore. I got my discharge. I'm a free man. Free as anybody can be with the world the way it is. Look, Haskell, you're not making things any easier for yourself by doing this. Hey, hi, Charlie. What? What's What's a... job for? What job? The trucking job you had. What do you mean, trucking job? You're crazy. I thought you didn't have any job. You must know it was just a temporary job I took yesterday. Sucking some furniture. Yep. Furniture, did you say? Yes, furniture. For the Emerson Warehouse. It was oh. a rush job. They had a lot of stuff to get out in a hurry and needed drivers. Paid over scale, so I took it. I needed the money. And I still have no job. Next, you hear that? Hear what? Look, Haskell, you go to work for Emerson. You're going all night. The warehouse burns down by a fire. Set with magnesium flares like you've got there. And you I had nothing to do with any fire. No? Your army number is on the bag we found in the building when the fire was out. A bag just like them two you got in there now. Son, you and I are going down to headquarters. I want to know a lot more about this. Hey, you can't take me. No? Huh? Oh, yes, I can. I'm going to. Tell me this. Uh, no, not just yet, honey. I want to look around a bit. Sir. Oh, okay, I'll be seeing you. Come on, Haskell. We're going for a ride, you and me. Okay, you can't. Come on, come on. Beverly, so mixed up, he got into a jam without realizing what he was doing. I'm not satisfied as he is. Don't forget, the lock on the door was broken open. Well, couldn't he have done that as a blind? Oh, he could. I'd better look around for prints, though, on the door first. Uh-huh. They can compare them with Haskell's prints. There'd be plenty of those inside. And if they match? That would prove Haskell was a liar. And if they don't? Well, that's something else. Wouldn't prove much one way or the other. Not until we get some more facts to go with him. And that's our job right now, Betsy. Getting all the facts we can. So the prince didn't know. Well, couldn't that mean that somebody was working with Haskam on this? It could. Well, give me and Haskam as innocent. Good afternoon. You the owner of this camp? Yeah, sure I am. But we're full up right now. See? I'm glad to hear it. And I just want some information. Oh, sure. Glad to tell you what I can. See? You know Charlie Haskin, don't you? Oh, sure. Yeah. Nice young fella. He didn't have a chip on his shoulder all the time. Not a very sociable fellow, I should imagine. Sure ain't. Does he have any friends in the camp here? Sure don't. I've seen him talk to the young couple living beside him, but that's all. See? I suppose you know most of the people in this camp. Oh, sure do. There ain't no chances just now. It's kind of the housing Jordan. Uh-huh. All nice people? Oh, sure. Yeah. All except the guy got the tail of the other side of Haskell. Don't like him. He don't live there. Just use it to go kind of office. 
Office? What kind? I don't know. But there's always a lot of queer-looking men running in out there every night. I wish I could get rid of them, but they ain't found no good reason. Well, what's the name of the man living there? Hey, Jones. I mean, Jones. That's not a funny name. I'll look my Sounds funny, all right. Jones home now? No, no, never there during the day, only at night. Okay, thanks for your trouble. So long? Hey, so long, mister. Glad to help you. Eh? We, um, call him with the Jones, Carolyn. We are, Patsy, immediately. Before Mr. Jones gets back, I hope. <laughs> Hmm? Oh, yes, it is. Say, may I speak to you a moment? Mm-hmm. Sure. What's on your mind? How well do you know Charlie Haskell? Well, he's in trouble. Maybe, maybe not. That's what I'm trying to find out. How well do you know him? Oh, just a feature. You don't make friends easy, that's I don't. So I know it. What was that about a job? Oh, why, yes. Well, this fellow offered me a job done in a truck yesterday. He was rushless, you know. When I was busy and I knew Charlie needed money, so I told him about it. Who offered you the job? Oh, a fellow named Jones. Uh, lives in that trailer right ahead of you there. I see. Okay, thanks very much. Oh, don't mention it. Hey, I hope Charlie makes out all right. Oh, and that certainly ties up, doesn't it, Miss? The mysterious Mr. Jones seems to be indicated as our next point of contact, at least. Oh, looks as if Jones was out, Miss. Mr. Jones? Not so easy this time. His door is locked. Yes, I think he'll go in anyway. He didn't draw daylight like this. The owner said Jones was never around in the daytime. Yeah, we can't wait. There. Oh, that was easy. I'll bet you did it, Stay outside the door. If anybody looks as if they were coming in, start swinging. Mm-hmm. And I can get out fast. Right. Hey, listen. From here, you can look right into Haskins' cell and see his war souvenir plainly. Maybe Mr. Jones... Maybe. Now, don't forget. If anyone comes, you'll think. Oh, I was only kidding. 
You sure you can convince them? Why are you questioning them? Kept all his books and records, his names, dates, shipments right there in that trailer. Lord, you thought no one would ever see it, so you don't have to be careful. Well, just how did he operate me? Well, look, the manager of the Emerson Warehouse, Sam Taylor, deserves two of the largest rooms for himself. Mm-hmm. He bought meat wholesale and had it brought to the warehouse and distributed it from there. Mm-hmm. It stayed at the warehouse only for a short time, so he didn't need refrigeration. But recently, with so many patriotic butchers refusing to handle black market meat, the stuff piled up until the two rooms were full. Taylor didn't worry about the meat falling, but he did worry that government inspectors might trace some of the shipments back to him and find all the stuff that was stored there. Oh. So he decided to get rid of the evidence by burning down the building. Which he did. And he did that part very completely. But he never dreamed we'd be able to trace it back to him as we did. And finding right there in that trailer the gin he used to pry open Haskins' door with the green paint still on it, and finding the winding handle that belonged to the alarm clock we remodeled to use in starting the fire, put the blame squarely on his shoulders. And let Charlie Haskin out in time. Fortunately, yes. I wonder if this break in Haskins' table will make him any more pleasantly disposed for the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. It's tough when a young fellow like that showers on everything. I'm going to try to pull him out of it. I asked Manny to let him know. They told me you wanted to see me. Come in, Aston. You don't think I'm a crook? No, I don't think you're a crook. And I never did. But if you've been a little more cooperative, we can help. Why should I be? Nobody ever cooperates with me. You don't give them a chance. Chance to what? You have to be friendly. They're all against me. I can't get a break anywhere. Now, now, look. Nobody's against you. That little tough luck, same as a lot of other men just out of the service have had. And you've made a personal issue out of it. Just your own personal reaction to an unpleasant situation. How do you figure that? I can't get a job. I can't get a place where my wife and I can live together. I can't no, no, get... hold on, hold on, hold on. That's a fact. See if we can't do something about this. You know any other men who don't have jobs? Sure, plenty of them. You know any other men who haven't found a place to live? Yeah. But what's that got to do with... Everything. Are all these other men you know convinced that the world is out to do them dirt? Well, no. Not all of them, but I know a couple of them. Oh, yes, Aston, you're one of a small minority of guys that take it out and break it. It doesn't help the situation at all. Well, maybe, but I haven't had a... I'm an auto mechanic, and a darn good one, too. I'm sure you are. Suppose I find you a job. Will you take it? Sure, I'll take it. And if you and your wife will be satisfied with a furnished room until something better offers... I can fix you up with that, too. Interested? Sure. Wait, if I can have Mary here with me, I, I, I feel a whole lot better. About everything, I guess. Oh, good. Here's $50. That'll help you to pay your wife's transportation and buy whatever things you need. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, look, Mr. Carter, I, I don't need your money. We'll make out somehow. Now, look, if you can spare it, it's a loan. I expect you to pay me back when you can. Thanks, Mr. Carter. You're swell. That's Miss Carter, Always trying to help somebody when he can. Why are you doing all this for me? A stranger. Captain, we all owe you, boys, who are in the service. More than anything ever before. And if anything I can do will help to pay that debt and get you started on the right road, I want to do it. I'm going to see that you get what's coming to you. Oh, oh, oh. That's what you usually say to the crooks you catch. You're going to get what's coming to you. Oh, yes, Betsy, I do. But this time, I'm talking to a friend. Right, Hudson? Right, Mr. Carter. Oh, gotcha. Friend is a wonderful thing to have, isn't it? Well, Nick, how about letting us in on your story for next week? Glad to do it, Phil. My story includes the list of the diamonds stolen from Mrs. Larkin's safe, the print of a pointed shoe in the garden, a telephone number that refused to answer, and the place where diamonds are worth more than anywhere else in the world. And there was excitement, too. When our plane dropped down through the fog trying to locate that ship at sea, oh, I was sure my last hour had come. Clues and excitement, eh? Sounds like a good combination. What's the name of the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Unwilling Criminal. <laughs> Nick 
Sweater, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Fictive stories of Mick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcast of Mick Carter, Master Detective, Ron Clark is starred as Mick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Maddie is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Peggy Mayer and Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations every week at the same time. This is Bill Tonkin saying so long until next week. program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Yes, it's the case of the Red Goose Murder, another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Listen, Patsy, why do you have to come back to the office at this time of night? I just want to be sure that I finished everything before I left Scubby. With Nick away, it sort of leaves the responsibility on my shoulders. Okay, but shake it up, will you? Uh, the last show starts at 8.40, uh, and it's 8.20 now. This won't take but a minute, Scubby. I simply want to have everything in order for the morning. <sighs> that was a good feed we had, wasn't it? Mmm, that salad was out of this world. Oh, doggone it. I knew we should have stayed away from this place. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Mr. Carter there? Uh, not at the moment. Who's calling, please? Art Bradley, manager of the Red Goose. When do you expect Mr. Carter? I can't say exactly. Uh, can I do something for you? I'm his assistant. Well, maybe you could help me out. Well, I'd be glad to if I can. Suppose you tell me why you called. Well, it's like this. My girl singer has just died very suddenly. Oh. She was all right a half hour ago, but when I stopped in her room just now, she was slumped on the floor dead. Looks very odd to me. Well, why don't you call the police? Well, I was going to, but the police visiting my nightclub would hurt business. And she may not have been killed, so I wondered if Mr. Carter... You see, I met him the other evening at one of his lectures. Oh, I see. I wondered if he wouldn't come over and see what actually happened before I do anything further. If you have any suspicion that her death wasn't natural, Mr. Bradley, you'd better call the police. Yes, I suppose I had better. Uh, who should I call? Can you tell me? Uh... Oh, look, Mr. Bradley, leave it to me. I'll take care of it for you. Oh, well, that'll be fine. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now what, more trouble? Oh, not for us, Scubby. I have to call Sergeant Matheson. Then it's us for the movie. Oh, swell. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for a minute we were going to miss that western. Oh, no, sir. Homicide. Sergeant Matheson. Oh, hello, Sergeant. This is Patsy. Oh, hiya, Patsy. What's up? Uh, Art Bradley, manager of the Red Goose on West 7th Street, says his girl singer is dead, and he thinks maybe she didn't die naturally. You better take a look and see what's what. Nick going over? Oh, uh, no. Nick's out of town for a few days. You'll uh, have to solve this alone, if you can. What do you mean, if I can? <laughs> I solved murder cases before you was born. Just because Nick has helped me out once or twice... I, I apologize, I... Sergeant. Happy hunting to you. Yeah. Bye. Come on, Patsy. We just got time to make it. Right with you, Scubby. Let's see how the movies do it. Just for a change. <laughs> Oh, this is just the way you found her, Bradley, huh? Nothing been touched? Nothing, Sergeant. You see, I opened the door to the dressing room to speak to her, and there she lay on the floor. I shut the door again and called Mr. Carter. Good. Yep. Yeah, it's murder, all right. You see this? That mark around her neck, you mean? Yeah. Strangled with a fine cord or a wire, maybe. It's murder, sure. Only dead a few minutes, too. 
Not more than 15 or 20, I'd say. Uh, how did you happen to come to her dressing room, Bradley? Well, it's payday today, and I brought up the payroll sheet for her to sign. See, I'd given her envelope downstairs sometime before, but she hadn't signed for it. How much did she make? 150 a week. Hmm, good racket she was in. Made more than I do. Uh, that her handbag on the dressing table? Uh, yes, I think so. Ah, notice it's open. Let's see if she's still got all that dough. Empty, by golly. Not a cent left in it. Hey, that must have been the motive for the killing. Yeah. Robbery. Uh-huh. Beautiful kid like that killed for a measly 150 bucks. Wait till I get my hands on the guy that did... If you do, Sergeant. What? Patsy, what are you doing here? And the demon reporter, Scubby Wilson. Hiya, Maddie. We were almost to the movies when Patsy's feminine curiosity got the better of her. She just couldn't stand the idea of a murder investigation going on without her being here to poke her nose in it. Uh-huh. Well, Patsy, now that you've poked your nose in, you can just poke it right out again. I don't need no help from you. Why, Sergeant, I wasn't trying to help. I was just interested. Mm. Uh, is that where she killed, Sergeant? Yeah, strangled with a cord or a piece of wire. Oh. 150 bucks stolen out of her handbag. And no more questions, see? Yes, Sergeant. But please, may I just watch? Okay, okay. Just don't bother me. I won't. Uh, Bradley, how many rooms on this floor? Well, there are three rooms on the second floor, Sergeant. My office, this dressing room, and the dark room. All on this side of the building. Dark room? What's that for? Well, that's where the girl who takes the flashlights of customers in the club develops the pictures she takes. Oh. As soon as she gets three or four snaps, she comes up and makes prints for the customers to buy. Then she could have been in and out of this room any time. Well, yes. Yes, she could. I want to talk to her. Sure, sure. Hey, if all three rooms are on this side, they must all look out onto that roof next door. Yes, they do. The adjoining building is a one-story flat-roofed affair, same length as this one is. Uh-huh. Windows always kept open, Ollie? Oh, on hot nights like this, yes. You ever see anyone on that roof? Uh, from this club, I mean. No, I don't ever remember any of our people ever going out there. No reason why they... Oh, oh, uh, Marie... Just a minute. Yes, Mr. Bradley. Uh, Sergeant, this is Marie, the girl who takes the pictures. You oh. said you wanted to talk to her. Yeah, I do. Uh, Marie, uh, when did you see this girl? This. Uh... Paula! What's happened to her? Is she... Yes, Marie. She's dead. She's been killed. Oh, poor Paula. When did you see her last? Well, it was just after her first show, maybe half an hour ago. Was she all right when you saw her? Oh, yes. She, she was as happy as anything. She came upstairs just as I finished printing my last batch of photos. I asked her for an autographed picture of herself. And she said that if I'd take one, she'd autograph it for me. You took one, did you? Yes, I snapped it right then. You developed it yet? No, I was just going to now. Uh-huh. Well, let me see it as soon as you get it done. Might get some ideas from it. I'll have it for you in ten minutes, officer. And may I watch you, Marie? I used to take pictures when I was a kid. Uh, I'm Patsy Bowen, Sergeant Matheson's assistant. Yeah, my assistant, my pain in the neck. Of course, Miss Bowen, I'm glad to have you. Did you ever develop your pictures when you took Oh, them? no, I couldn't do that. Yeah, women. They give me a pain. Uh, Mr. Bradley, how many employees do you have here in the Red Goose? Why, well, there are 12 in the kitchen crew, seven in the orchestra, five front men in the lobby and inside, the Czech girl, flower girl, and Marie. I want to talk to them, all of them. Get them up here. Now, look, Sergeant, couldn't we sort of take it easy, just talk to them one at a time, kind of private-like... I don't want to upset the whole club. Give a club a bad name, you know. Oh, don't give it another thought, Mr. Bradley. Sergeant Matheson is the soul of discretion and the epitome of integrity. Hey, are you calling me names again? Oh, not at all, Maddie. They were compliments, if you only knew it. Well, pipe down, will you? Okay, Bradley, I'll take it easy. But I want to talk to every one of them. Alone or together, I don't care. Now, come on, let's get started. Hey, Sergeant. Yeah? Got some news for you. Yeah? What is it, Scubby? Your homicide squad is all through. Just left. Oh, some news. That helps a lot. <laughs> ah, you finished your checkup? Yeah. Yeah, we've accounted for all but two waiters and one of the front men. And all three of them have been with me for years. They can't be mixed up in this. Who says they can't? Anybody could be mixed up in it. But we'll let them go for now. I want to ask that Marie a few questions. She's the one nobody can check up on. Let's go back up and see what she's got to say for herself. If you don't mind, Sergeant, I'll stay down here. You two go right ahead. Ask her anything. All right. Come on, Scully. Right with you, Matty, old boy. 
Mrs. Bradley says she only makes 35 bucks a week. What she can get out of the customers. She could have needed that money. Oh, she seems like a nice kid, Mary. I don't think she'd be mixed you up. You too? In... When will you guys learn that appearances don't mean a thing? Oh, there huh? you are. Oh. I'm just going to look for you. Marie's been waiting to show you the picture she took of Paula. Here it is, officer. Yeah. Just think, she'll never autograph it for me now. Uh, looks happy enough. And look at this one, Sergeant. What? That's a picture Marie took while Paula was singing her last number. See her in the background? Yeah. And see whose picture it is. Hey, that's Alworth Van Keppel, the millionaire playboy. Uh-huh. Does he come here often? Oh, about once a month, and always with a different girl. Blonde this time. He always gets his picture taken, too, and he's always good for a swell tip. Marie, suppose you and me have a little talk. Now? Yeah. Oh, I have to go down and deliver these pictures before the customers leave. Okay, but make it snappy. Mm. Uh, I'll go with you, just in case. In case of what? Just in case. Wasn't Marie nice, Cubby? She made me extra copies of the last batch of pictures for my scrapbook. Patsy, uh, let me see that picture of Ann Keppel again. Well, sure, Scubby. Ah, uh, it's a good one, isn't it? Hmm. Patsy, how many men do you see in the orchestra of this picture? Huh? Oh, gee, Scubby, they're so far in the background, it's hard to tell. Well, look closely. Mm -hmm. Five, six. Six? Why? Well, Bradley told us there were seven men in the band. The picture shows only six. Huh? I wonder where the other one was. Uh, how are you folks oh. making out? Find anything yet? Oh, uh, Mr. Bradley, you said there were seven men in the band. Yes. Well, this picture taken during the first show tonight shows only six. That's so. Well, let's see. Yes, the guitar player, Steve Dawson, isn't there. See, that's funny. Any idea why he wasn't there when this picture was snapped? No, no, I know he was there when the show started, and he's there now. I saw him as I came up. I don't understand it. Scubby, huh? do you suppose he could have... Oh, Bradley, oh. Uh, Marie tells me this was Paula's last night here. She was going to work for another club beginning tomorrow night. Mm, yes, yes, that's true. Well, how come you didn't tell me about that before? I guess it just slipped my mind, Sergeant. Why was she leaving? Well, she got a better job. More money than I could pay her. That's all. Sergeant, while Paula was singing her last number, the guitar player was missing from the band. Do you suppose he could have come up here and, and done this? A guitar player, huh? Hey, Bradley, do these musicians have a dressing room here anywhere? Yes, yes, they do, on the third floor. They keep their stuff in lockers up there. How much longer are they going to be playing? Let me see, it's 9.10 now. They break at 9.30. Uh-huh, so we got 20 minutes. Let's have a look at this guitar player's locker. Maybe he knows something about this. Uh, which one is this uh, Steve's locker? It's the third one from the left. Got his name on it. Good. Oh, not locked. That helps. No, nothing in this old jacket. Just the racing form. Hey, what's that written on it? Huh? Oh, Central 8740, Mike. That's probably his bookmaker. Yeah, probably. These boys play the horses pretty heavily, I understand. Oh, yeah? Then the Steve could need money, maybe, if the nags weren't running for it. Anything else there, Sergeant? No, Patsy, only this old guitar case. Hmm, and that's empty. Gosh, they use nice velvet for the lining, don't they? Well, maybe it was nice once, but it's pretty well shot now, Patsy. Oh, yes. Look at this big tear in it. It's... Oh, Sergeant, look at this. What? Money. Hidden in the line. Right. Seven twenties and a ten. Say, that's what I paid Paula tonight. What? So Steve took it. But, but why did he have to kill her to get it? He could have got it without that. Well, we don't know that he did kill her, Mr. Bradley. The guy that got the money is the guy that did the killing, according to my book. Hey, Bradley, get Steve Dawson up here. We'll see if he can get out of this. Certainly, Sergeant. I'll have him meet you in Paula's room right after the band breaks for intermission. And you can bet I'll keep my eye on him until then. Uh, Mr. Bradley, do you have a phone we could use? Yes, of course. There's one in my office. The room right next to Paula. Thanks. Come with me, Scubby. I've got a job for you. Anywhere with you, beautiful. Just lead the way. <laughs> You say you want me to call this number we found on Steve's racing form? Right, Scubby. And ask for Mike. Oh, do you want me to ask him anything special? Oh, no, just say it's Steve Dawson calling. Yeah. Then stroll around and see if maybe he won't let something slip about Steve's finances. Okay, what can we lose? Here goes. Right. 
Eight, seven. Oh, I wish I knew what this Steve's voice sounds like. Well, just talk a little husky, as if it were a bad connection. Mike will never know the difference, I hope. The Purple Pig. Good evening. Oh, hello. Is Mike there? This is Mike. Who's talking? Steve Dawson. Oh, yeah, Dawson. You got the money ready for me? Well, I've got part of it. Part of it? Hey, listen, you know what I told you. You have it all when I call for it tonight or else. The whole 300 bucks you borrowed and the $100 interest for the two weeks you had it. Well, isn't there some way I can let you have part of it now and the rest Cut a little... Cut the stall and Dawson. 400 smackers in a bunch by 1 o'clock tonight for trouble. And I mean trouble. Okay, Mike. Goodbye. So Steve did need money. He sure did. $400 by 1 o'clock tonight and no fooling around either. So Steve might have needed that money so bad he'd be willing to kill Paul to get it. Well, it sure looks that way from where I sit. I wonder Scubby, if... Scubby, what's that on the floor over under the window? Huh? Oh. Looks like tar. Tar? Yeah. Tar off somebody's heel. Maybe somebody was out on the roof and got some on his shoe. Mr. Bradley said nobody ever went out there. But look here. Here's a smudge on the windowsill, too, Scubby. Do you suppose... Have you got a flashlight, Patsy? Yeah, my, my swirl one's here in my bag. I Paul. think I'll have a look at the roof outside this window. <clears throat> there might be footprints or something. If you're going out there, I am, too. Give me a hand. Okay, beautiful. Here. Easy now. Uh, there uh, you are. Hey. Tar on this roof is soft, isn't it? Yeah, tar roofs generally get that way on warm days. No, I don't see any prints here anyway. Uh -uh. Well, that doesn't prove anything, of course. Soft tar wouldn't hold prints very well. Uh, Scubby, this fireplace must fire escape. Oh, I'm getting all mixed up. Must be the one that goes up to the musician's locker room. Well, it probably is. I remember seeing one when we were up there before. Uh, is Paula's body still in her room? No, they took it away after the homicide boys finished their investigation. Oh, I'm glad of that. I don't... Oops. What's the matter? <laughs> I tripped over something. Caught my toe in it. Well, there's nothing here, Patsy. Oh, wait. Huh? Ah, here's an old guitar string. Maybe a trip on that. An old guitar string? And Steve plays the guitar. Funny, isn't it? How do you mean funny? The sergeant says Paula was choked with a cord or a piece of wire. Of course. And finding this guitar string here is no coincidence at all at all. I wonder. What do you mean, I wonder? Huh? Oh, I don't know, Scubby, but that's what Nick always says when he's not sure of something. Oh. His master's voice, huh? Uh, something like that. Uh -huh. I'm just trying to think the way Nick would do it if he were here. Oh, I wish he were here, too. Oh, I don't know. It looks pretty open and shut to me. I know it does, but that's always the time Nick says to... Scubby, there's one of the musicians just coming into Paula's room. That must be Steve Dawson. Yeah, come on. I want to hear what he has to say. You want me, Sergeant? Yeah, come on in. Have a chair. Uh, mind if we join you, Sergeant? For the love of Pete, what are you two doing out there on the roof? Oh, just looking at the stars, that's all. Do you mind if we come in? I don't mind what you do so long as you don't get in my way. Thanks. Help me up, Scubby. All right, here you are. Now, easy. Watch the sill. There. There. Yep. Oh, thanks, Scubby. Uh, won't you come in, too, Mr. Wilson? Oh, delighted, Miss Bowen. So kind of you to ask me. Will you two ever stop clowning? This is a murder case. Murder? What have I got to do with the murder? Everything, if I ain't mistaken, Dawson. Where were you at about 8 o'clock tonight? 8 o'clock? Yeah. Well, playing with the band, same as always. That's so. Patsy, where's that picture you had? Here it is, Sergeant. Thanks. Now then, Steve, show me which one in this picture is you. Why, uh, I don't seem to be there. Uh, when was this taken? During Paula's last number in the first show tonight. Now, where were you? Oh, yeah, I, I remember now. I, I was late coming in. Mr. Bradley said you were there when the show opened. Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I had to step out for a minute. You need money pretty bad, don't you? Money? Yeah. No, I just got paid tonight. I got plenty. You didn't get paid enough to repay the loan Mike made you. 300 bucks plus 100 interest. Hey, what's that? Where did you find that out? Mike told us. Mike? What do you know about Mike? And he's calling for it at 1 o'clock tonight, isn't he? I don't know what you're talking about. No? Then why did you kill Paula Windsor tonight and then swipe $150 from her purse? And don't try to lie out of it. We found the money in that old guitar case in your locker. I didn't kill her. I swear it. Sergeant, we found this on the roof just outside the window. What's that? A string for a fiddle or something. So what? Could be a guitar string, Maddie. What? That settles it, Dawson. 
You saw Bradley give Paula her salary earlier tonight, so you sneaked off the bandstand during her last number, came up to her room, and tried to sneak her purse. She caught you, and you killed her. No, I didn't kill her. I didn't. You strangled her with a guitar string you happened to have in your pocket and threw it out the window. I didn't kill her. She wasn't even in the room when I took the money. Oh, so you admit you stole the money. Yeah. Yes, I stole it, but I didn't kill her. She was just finishing her song when, when I got back downstairs. No good, Dawson. If you can make a jury believe that, you're a better man than I think you are. But I tell you, I didn't kill her. Look here, Scotty. I took the money Here's a slip of paper on her dressing table with that same number on it that we just called. C-E-8740. wonder what she was doing with that. Playing the horses, maybe. I doubt it. Sergeant, yeah. may I ask Mr. Dawson a question? Oh, you again. All right, ask it. Let me get out of here. Uh, Mr. Dawson, what did you and Paula have in common about the purple pig? Nothing. Mike is the manager there, and he's my bookie. Paula was supposed to start singing there tomorrow night. Mike met her here when, when he came over once to see me and gave her a job. That's all. So that's where she was going. Yeah. Bradley was all burned up about it, but Mike offered her more than Bradley did, so she gave notice. Come on, Dawson. You and I have a date at headquarters. Look, Sergeant. I'm I... booking you for robbery and possible murder. Now hold out your hand. I got a bracelet for it. But I tell you, I, I just... you tell me don't count. <clears throat> Ah, so long, Miss Patsy Carter. If you pick up anything I missed, uh, give me a ring. I'm always happy to hear from you. Why, thank you, Sergeant. Well, Scubby, what do you think? I think if I killed a girl with a guitar string, I'd never throw it out the window where it would be found first thing. Well, that's the way I feel. And it seems to me that if Paula did catch Steve Dawson stealing her money, he wouldn't be likely to go fishing around in his pockets to see if he had an old guitar string he could kill her with. Gosh, you're right, Patsy. He'd more likely strangle her with his bare hands. You know, Scubby, I think the murder had nothing to do with the robbery. I think whoever killed Paula did it deliberately and used the guitar string to throw suspicion on Steve Dawson. Which would account for his leaving it right outside where it would be sure to be found. Uh -huh. And I noticed another thing, too, Scubby, that makes me think Dawson didn't kill her. It's not proof, but it's something to think about. Yeah, what's that? Well, when I saw Paula's body, I noticed that she had unzipped her dress as if she were going to take it off. Uh -huh. And her shoes were off, and one of her stockings was unfastened. Which means she'd been in her room long enough to start changing her costume. Good girl. And if she'd been leaning over and fastening her stockings, the killer could have crept up behind her without being seen. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. Oh, poor kid. Just look at this picture of how the Marie took tonight. She's laughing and looks as if she didn't have... Scubby! Huh? Look at this picture. Look at the mirror. Hey, there's the figure of a man reflected in the mirror. Huh. From the angle at which the picture was taken... He must have been standing on the roof just outside her window. Well, he probably thought he couldn't be seen, but the camera caught him in the mirror. Oh, it isn't plain enough to make out who it is. No, the picture doesn't show him very plainly. But it's definitely a man in a black coat, and the musicians wear white. So it's not the guitar player. Scubby, this man has a flower in his buttonhole. It's the right buttonhole instead of the left, the way most men wear them. Hey, let's ask Bradley. Maybe he'll be able to recognize who it is. Right, Scubby, come on. We'll show Sergeant Matheson yet. Uh, Mr. Bradley? Yes? Uh, Mr. Bradley, we've got something to show you. Can we go somewhere where it won't be so noisy? Yes, yes. Suppose you go right in here. <laughs> With the door closed, you can at least hear yourself think. Ah, yes, this is better. Now, what have you found that would interest me? And Mr. Bradley, this picture was taken this evening in Paula's room right after the first show. Oh, yes, I remember Marie saying that she took one. If you look in the mirror, you can see the reflection of a man standing outside her window on the roof. What? Yes. Yes, I see. Hey, it's a pretty pity it isn't a better picture of him so he could recognize who it is. And Mr. Bradley, have you ever been out on the roof outside your office? What? No, I never go out there. Then how do you suppose the spot of roof tar got on the rug in your office? I wouldn't have the it least... It probably thing. came off your shoe, Mr. Bradley. I see there's still some tar on the heel. But I did... Your right heel. Say, look here, are you implying that I killed Paula? I am. I didn't realize it until I saw you again just now. But you wear your flower in your right lapel. Practically no one does that. You're a pair of idiots. Why should I kill Paula? I had no motive to do a thing like that. I don't understand about the motive part either, Mr. Bradley, but I'm sure you killed her. Now, see here. 
Just because I happen to be standing outside Paula's window when Marie snapped that picture doesn't prove that I killed her. Just went out for some air and then went back to my office. She was alive the last time I saw her. You've forgotten one thing, Mr. Bradley. Your fingerprints are on the guitar string you strangled her with. All right, so I killed her. What are you two going to do about it? I'll have you two taken care of so fast. Sit you down, e- Mr. Bradley. You can't scare me with that little pop gun. Don't kid yourself, Mr. Bradley. Patsy knows how to use that gun, and she will if she has to. And a twenty-two makes just as good a hole in a man's heart as a forty-five does if it's aimed right the way Patsy aims. Thank you, Scubby. Now, will you sit down, Mr. Bradley? Now, Scubby, if you'll call Sergeant Matheson, he can put both the robber and the killer in the same cell. You mean you're going to be at that typewriter for another hour yet? Well, I'm sorry, Scubby, but I have to have a full report ready for Nick when he comes back. Uh, and I want to get it down in black and white while it's still fresh in my mind. Okay, okay, I quit. I'm going home. I'll see you again sometime, I hope. Why, I hope so, Scubby. Give me a ring sometime when you're free. Oh, darn you, Patsy Bone. If I wasn't in love with you, I'd wring your neck. <laughs> Good night, Scubby, dear. Good night. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yes. Mm. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. This is Matty, Patsy. Oh. I just wanted to tell you, Bradley made a full confession. He did? Yeah. Oh, that's good. I'll put that in my report, too. Oh, uh, what'd he say? He said he planned to kill Paula tonight, so he waited on the roof outside her window for her to come back from the floor show. Uh-huh. It was while he was standing out there that he saw Steve Dawson swipe the money out of her purse. Oh. Well, that gave him the idea that he could have a perfect alibi by making Steve the goat for the killing as well as the robbery. Hmm. So he went up the fire escape to the musician's room, found an old guitar string Steve had thrown out, and got back outside Paula's window just in time to see Marie snap her picture. I see. And then, while she was changing her clothes, he crept up behind her and strangled her. Oh. And threw the guitar string out on the roof where it'd be found by the police. Or by someone else. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Did he say what his motive was? Yeah. He loved Paula, but she turned him down cold. He discovered her, you see. Gave her her first job. He felt she owed him something, but she told him to his face that he had done nothing for her and that she was leaving him for a better job with a better man. Well, that made him so mad, that and the fact that he really loved her desperately... That he decided if he couldn't have her, nobody else was going to. Oh, the poor guy. Love is an awful thing sometimes. Yeah. Especially if it's not returned. Yeah, but look, Patsy. There's one thing I don't understand. You said you told him his fingerprints were on the guitar string. Now, what was the idea of that? Well, Nick always has something to clinch the case with. So I happen to think of that. But you ought to know a guitar string wouldn't take any fingerprints. Well, sure, Sergeant, I knew it. But Mr. Bradley didn't. Well, Patsy, in the absence of Nick, I suppose I'll have to get my hints on next week's show from you. How about it? I sure can do, Carl. The case started when both Vince O'Neill and Otto Lerner found they were married to the same girl. Hmm. What did Nick do about that? Well, he started out to find the girl and straighten things out, if he could. And he found her, I suppose, knowing Nick. Oh, yes, he did. But when he located her finally, she could no longer give him any information. She'd been using a new jar of cold cream and taking a bath. Well, what did that have to do with it? Why, everything. That and the fight on the train. Yeah. All right, all right. What's the name of the story? We call it The Case of the Extra Husband. Nick Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. 
In the broadcasts of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Mansum is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, Scubby by John Kane. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at the same time. This is Carl Caruso saying, so long until next week. Auctions are exciting. We've never heard of a public auction where the bidding went up, up, up to murder. There's your promise of thrilling mystery entertainment again tomorrow night over these mutual stations on Bulldog Drummond's case called Upholstered for Murder. That's Bulldog Drummond, Mondays on Mutual. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. And now for today's thrilling Nick Carter adventure, the case of the Blue Mink, presented by Old Dutch Clint. As our story opens, Nick and Patsy are entering a large department store very early in the morning. Nick, I didn't know you were retained by the Fur Protective Association, too. You've probably forgotten, Patsy. It's been years since they've had occasion to call on me. Oh. This new series of fur thefts is really serious, they tell me. And you think this department store is the best place to catch up with them? I do. They've suffered the biggest losses of any store in town so far. Oh. Come on, here's the elevator. Mm-hmm. Oh, four, please. And you think I'll be able to spot a thief if I see one? Oh, I hope so. As a rule, women who steal furs have a large receptacle of some kind, a bag or bundle in which they can hide the furs while they make the getaway. Also, they have a sort of shifty look about them. You watch closely. You've had a lot more experience with the crooks than most sales girls have, Patsy. Gosh, I hope you're right. I'll try anyway. All right, come on. This should be pretty well. Miss Cheryl, the detective on this floor, uh, said she... Mr. Carter. That's right. You're Miss Cheryl? Yes. And this is Miss Bone, who's going to be our new sales girl. Oh, well, for a while, anyway. I only hope I can make good. Oh, I'm sure. I hope so, too. Now, if you'll come with me, Miss Bowen, I'll show you where you can leave your things. Oh, j- just a minute, Miss Cheryl. Me. Suppose I see a customer who looks suspicious. What do I do? Call Miss Cheryl if you can, and call me. Then keep your eyes open and don't leave the customer for a second if you can help it. All right, Nick. I hope this works. Wish me luck. Just use your common sense, Patsy. That's always better than luck. So long. <laughs> speaking. Nick, this is Patsy. Ah, oh, Patsy, how do you like being a clerk in a department store now that you've had a full day of it? Nick, I think maybe I have one of those fur thieves here now. She's got a big bundle, just the way you said, and she's acting queer. Well, where are you calling from? I'm using the phone right here in the fur department. She can see me, but she can't hear what I'm saying. Anyone else there? No. The other girl who's usually here at this time had to leave early. Went home at 4.30, and I can't find Miss Cheryl anywhere. There's just this one customer here, and she's... She's acting awful suspicious. All right, Patsy, here's what you do. Stall her along. Let her see everything in the place, but keep her there until I get there. Uh Uh-huh. What does she look like? Oh, she's a rather large woman, dressed in a brown suit and dark red hat with a yellowish sort of trimming on it. Has a big bundle done up in wrapping paper and small bundle and a handbag. Oh, she has a large lapel pin in the form of a horse's head. I ought to recognize her from that description. I'll be there in five minutes and have a look at her. Maybe I'll know her when I see her. Right, Nick. Goodbye. Are you going to finish waiting on me, miss? Oh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I was trying to get some other fur pieces brought over from my warehouse. They just got some new ones in, and they're beauties. Do you like anything you've seen so far? Oh, this next piece isn't bad, but I want something more expensive. Well, suppose you look around and see if you find anything that suits you better. I think I will. You don't need to wait. I'll let you know if I find anything. Oh, that's quite all right. I have nothing else to do. How nice. Um, I'll tell you what I really like. 
When I was coming in the store this afternoon, I saw just the neck piece I wanted in the left-hand main window. Do you suppose you could get it for me? Oh, I'm sorry, madam, but I'm not supposed to leave the department. But that's exactly what I want. Oh, won't you please see if I can take a look at it? Well, as you can see, madam, there's no other girl here to watch the stock. I couldn't leave just now. But there are no other customers either. Couldn't you make an exception just this one? I'm sorry, madam. Isn't there something here that would suit you as well? You're a smart girl, aren't you? You're smart for your own good this time. Well, how do you mean, madam? Just this. <gasps> oh! <laughs> If Patsy's mistaken about this woman, it could be, you know. I doubt if she'd call me, Waldo, unless she was sure of a fact. Ah, sure, Nick. But you know women always hey, jump it. Big bundle, brown suit, red hat, and horse head pin and a lapel. Yes. What are you stopping for, Nick? That's the woman Patsy called about. You sure? I am. The description matches exactly. Come on. But, Nick, you, you can't arrest her without some kind of evidence. I'm not going to arrest her, Walter. We're going to follow her. I want to find out where she goes. Well, then what? Then I'll find some excuse to take a look into that bundle she's carrying. Unless I'm greatly mistaken, they're furs. Stolen furs. <laughs> That line at the ticket window. I never knew so many people went to the opera. Mm, just 8.15. Half an hour before the performance starts. Well, why in the world? You had to get us down here so early. I can't see. But well, I had to be here to see if that woman walks through this lobby. Miss Bowen, suppose we're wrong about this. Oh, listen, Miss Cheryl, how can we be wrong? It was right after that woman left that we found that wad of gum folded up in this envelope, didn't we? Right where she was standing when she knocked me out. And it wasn't there before. Yes, that's true. But we don't we know. We know it's a ticket broker's envelope and calls for four seats for tonight's performance here at the opera, don't we? Yes. And but if it... the tickets that were in this envelope belong to her, she'll be here tonight. And I'll recognize it. Oh, I wish Mr. Carter were here. Oh, so do I. But I've been calling him for the past three hours and no answer. What? Even Waldo's gone. So we've got to find out for ourselves who's sitting in R2, 4, 6, and 8. I guess you're right, Miss Bowen, but... Oh, I'm... don't you worry. We'll work it out somehow. Oh, look at that gorgeous fur coat on that girl just going in. Hmm? It's blue. It's blue mink. That's all blue mink. That was stolen from our store. Are you sure? Certainly I am. It's the only one in this city. There are only three of them in the world, and the other two are privately owned at the West Coast. Oh, that mousy little girl wearing it couldn't be a third. Well, mm -hmm. she's got our coat on, that's all I know. We've got to get inside and get back. You got your ticket? Uh, yes, but how about... Well, I've got nothing. I'm going in. Take it, please. The label of the coat you. will prove it's ours. Oh, no, it won't. The first thing a thief does is to change the lining and the label. You've got to be sure before you accuse her. But I am sure. That's the... Oh, wait a minute. Look where she's sitting. In R4. One of the seats marked on the envelope. Ooh, she's a thief. But she's not the one who was in the store. We've got to wait here and see who sits in those other three seats. Then we can capture them all at once. Hey, Nick, we've been following this dame through all these little towns for a heck of a while now. Do you think she's going anywhere? Well, either she's taking a very roundabout way to where she's going, or she knows we're following her. Well, I'm going to see where she goes if it takes all night. The whole first act is over, and nobody is in those other three seats. And I'm not going to wait any longer. I want that coat. Wait. She's going into the lobby. And she's leaving the coat in the seat. Uh, uh, let's go down and casually take it. Take it? What about her? We want her, too. Come on, follow me. I have an idea. But easy yeah. now. No, 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 no. Don't hurry. Oh. Now, let's just sit down here in these end seats. I don't like this. Oh, I don't like it either, but I think it's the best way. Well, now what? We'll get up. 
And the coat goes with us. Like this. Nobody watching. You've got more nerve than anybody I ever saw. Now walk up the aisle. Slowly. Well, don't hurry. Yeah, that's it. Do you see that girl who had the coat? Yes. She's over there, the drink stand. If she should she see... She won't. Come over here behind this pillar. Now, here's my idea. She must be one of the thieves, but she's not the one I want. You take the coat back to the store, and I'll wait here and follow her after the show. Maybe she'll take me to the rest of the gang. But she'll make a whale of a fuss when she finds out that her coat's gone. It's a stolen coat, isn't it? Oh, let me look at the label. Oh, this is a parrot. Label. There never was a blooming coat made in Paris. That's what I told you. The thieves changed the label. So it must be the coat stolen from your store. Now, you go ahead. Yeah, and I'll... Oh, 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 oh. You. If you want to stay healthy, just walk quietly out the door. That one on the left. And don't look around. Hey, you Start can't... Start walking and don't run. I'll be right behind you. Come on, Patsy. We'd better have walked. Yes, I... I guess we better... That's it. Now, you see that dark blue sedan up the street a little way? The tall girl gets in the front seat, the short one gets in back. And no argument. Where... Where are you taking us? You'll find out by and by. When you do, you won't like it. Now get moving. In the case of the blue mink, Patsy, together with Aris Alishero, floor detective for a big department store, recovered a blue mink coat, which had been stolen from the store while Nick and Waldo were on the trail of a suspected fur thief. But just as the girls got the coat back, they were forced into a strange car at the point of a gun, bound for an unknown destination. The time is now a few minutes after intermission. Sergeant Matheson of the Metropolitan Police has just arrived at the office of the Opera House in answer to a strange oh, summons. Oh, no. The coat, the beautiful blue fur coat, it is good, it is good. Look, Mr. Helbine, I can't make heads or tails out of this. What's this blue fur coat she keeps talking about? Well, I don't know, Sarge. In a mission after the first act's about over, when this girl sets up a holly, you can hear three blocks away. Yeah? Near as we can make out, she had a blue fur coat that disappeared. She's been practically in hysterics ever since. I thought maybe you could get the story out of her. Yeah, some job you wish on me. All right, you. what's your name? Gussie. Gussie Farmwood. All right, Gussie, uh, what happened? I have a blue fur coat. I go outside to get a drink, and when I go back, it is gone. And she will kill me. I know she will. You mean the coat was stolen? No, no, no. I do not steal it. I, I borrowed it to go to the opera. No, 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 no. I don't mean that. Did somebody steal it from you? Yes, they steal it. And now I cannot go home anymore. Did you see who took it? No, it is. God, that is all. I know, but I tried to get up here before, but I couldn't get away from a fussy old dame out front. What is it? Is that anything wrong? Well, I'll say there is. Just when intermission is about half over, I saw a man force two girls to walk out of the lobby and get into a blue sedan parked just down the block. And I could see he had a gun in his pocket. And I heard him say, when you find out where you're going, you won't like it. All right, wait a minute, wait a minute. You sure of this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm the doorman here, you know. I was standing just outside. I heard it as plain as I can hear you now. What kind of a man was he? He was... uh, Well, well, he was an ordinary man, like a a businessman. Only pretty hard boiled he was. And one of the girls had a a blue fur coat with her. A blue fur coat? Did you say blue fur coat? Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Why? So two girls stole Gussie's coat and somebody stole them. Can you describe these girls? Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. One of them was the sort of a tallest... Yeah. I want that description of the two girls sent out to all precincts at once. Yes, sir. Let me know as soon as anyone gets a lead on them. Yes, sir. I want my call. I want my call. Now, look here, Gussie. I brought you down here to headquarters so I could talk to you quiet-like without nobody butting in. Now, where'd you get that coat you had? Oh, please, mister. I do not feel it. I, I Hi, just... Nick. Oh, hello, Nick. Hey, what you got there? A bunch of fur. Probably all stolen. Patsy called me from the department store where I'd planted her and told me a customer she had was acting funny. Yeah? So Waldo and I started down to have a look at this woman and met her coming out of the store. 
I recognized her from Patsy's description and followed her. She led us right to the old factory building where they remodeled the stolen furs. Hmm. We found a workman there relining the coats and brought them both in. Oh, nice going, Nick. You say you're on a stolen fur case yourself? Right, Nick. One with a twist to it. What's the twist? Well, it seems that Gussie wore this blue fur to the opera and a couple of girls stole it from her. And some fellow, the doorman says, was hanging around before, pulls the gun on the two dames and forces them into his car. Looked as if he was waiting for them. Any descriptions of the man? Sure. The yeah, the doorman at the opera saw the whole thing. One of the girls was about 45, short, kind of blonde-gray hair, blue eyes, wore a dark blue suit with Alice a... Alice Sherrill. But, you know her, Nick? But the description of the other girl fit Patsy? But, by George, I believe it would. You think it was, Nick? heavens. Patsy and Miss Sherrill, a floor detective at the store, doing a little detecting on their own. Maddie, they may be in trouble, real trouble. I remember now... Miss Cheryl told me a blue mink coat was stolen from the store a couple of weeks ago. Somehow they got on the trail of it. And someone got on their trail. Well, we've got to find out about this in a hurry. Gussie, whose coat was it? Do I got to tell you? She killed me, sure. You certainly do got to tell me, and quick. It was the lady I worked for. She always gets new fur coats all the time. So I just took this one to go to the opera with. Anybody at home when you left? There was a little girl, Virginia. She, maybe, she could see me. Does she know where her father and mother were tonight? Oh, yes. Her mother left her the telephone number. It was in Oakdale. Hey, Maddie, let me have that phone with you. Yeah, what are you going to do, Nick? To find out if it's Virginia called her mother to tell her Gussie had taken a coat. From what Gussie says, it's very likely she did. I thought we saw Gussie go out with a coat. Yeah, but Nick, I... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Operator, this is Nick Carter. I want to find out if a call was made tonight from the Dutton residence in Cedar Ridge to some place in Oakdale. Yes, that's right. For the love of Pete, Nick, what's the connection between this kid and a guy kidnapping Patsy? Look, Matty. Gussie said Mrs. Dutton was always getting new fur coats, didn't she? Yeah. Well, that looks like part of the fur gang. So if this kid phoned her mother that Gussie was wearing her new fur coat, her father, who's probably the head of the gang, drove into town as fast as he could to get it back before it was spotted as a stolen coat. Why, sure. Well, got to the opera house after the show started, so he hung around. That was when the doorman saw him. Yeah? He probably missed Gussie in the crowd at intermission, but saw Patsy and Miss Cheryl. So he took them and the coat, which is what he really wanted. Well, for the hey, love wait, of... wait, wait, wait. What's that, operator? Well, there was. About 7.15, huh? Thank you. That's all. Let's see. Dutton got the call around 7.15. He could have driven down in about an hour and a half. We should get him to the opera house after the show started. Yeah, that checks. Yeah, but look, Nick, if Dutton has got the girls, he certainly wouldn't take them to his home. And where would he take them? And what would he do with them? Matty, that's what we've got to figure out, and fast. <laughs> What a dirty old place this is. If it was going to lock us up somewhere, he might have picked a pleasanter place than this. If we only knew where we were, maybe we could figure out some scheme to let somebody know. Huh? If we could only... Oh, there he comes back. Oh, I hope it's well, not... You weren't alone in this, huh? How do you mean? You told somebody else about the coat, did you? Well, no one... Oh, yes. Yes, we did. Right after we found it. And who'd you tell? Speak up. I, uh... I called Nick Carter and gave him all the details. Yeah, I thought so. Somebody's been here and taken all the furs and worked in the storage vault in the basement. Took my tailor away, too. Just called his home and they haven't seen him. Don't know what's happened to him. Why don't you tell this, Carter? And no funny business. Oh, well, uh, you, you, you see, we we told him that... Listen, you, stop stalling. If you want a little while longer, give us the details and make it snappy. Well, the girl who had the coat at the opera gave us your names. And when I called him, I told him your names and where you live. <sighs> Where do I get my hands on that gussy? I'll wring her neck like I was a chicken, stealing my coat and blabbing everything she knows. Well, what do we do now, Eddie? Well, let me think. I... Yeah, I have it. Young lady, you're going to call your Nick Carter on the phone. There's an old abandoned hunting shack out in the woods about two miles off Route 47. You're going to tell him you've caught the fur thieves and that you're stuck out there without any cash. <laughs> While Nick is conferring with Matty at headquarters, Waldo sits in Nick's office, waiting for the next development in the case. 
You heard Nick Carter's office. Nick Carter's first assistant to Waldo McGlynn speaking. Is Nick there, Waldo? This is Patsy. Oh, no, Patsy. He ain't. Uh, can I help you? Put him on, will you? I tell you, Nick ain't here. Do you want me to... Hello, Nick. Oh, I'm so glad you're there. This, this ain't Nick. This is... Yes, uh... Nick, it's all right. We've caught the fur thieves we were after. But this ain't Nick, Patsy. This now, is listen what... carefully. Very carefully. This is extremely important. You must be crazy, but I'm listening. We chased the thieves way out of town in Miss Cheryl's car. And just as we finally caught up with them, we ran out of gas. Nick, I want you to come out and bring us all back to town. I don't dare leave the thieves to look for any gas because they might get away. But we caught them thieves ourselves. We... Now, get these directions straight, Nick. Better write them down. Write them down? Now, we're near an old hunting shack on a small side road that turns off Route 47 about three miles north of Woodmere. Three miles north of Woodmere. You got that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the shack is about two miles in off the main road. Huh. We'll be waiting for you inside the shack. Hurry up, will you, Nick? It's awful lonely out here. You better hurry. He's awful worried about you, Pat. Yes, about two miles. But we caught them, Nick. Hallelujah. We caught the crooks. Bye. Well, if that ain't the crazy... I gotta get this to Nick immediate here. Hallelujah. We caught the crooks. Uh, that ain't the silliest thing I ever... Sergeant Matheson. Oh, this, this is Waldo. He's Nick there. Yeah, sure. Hold on. If you're Nick, it's Waldo. Yes, Waldo? Uh, Nick, I just got the doggondest message from Patsy. From Patsy? Where is she? Well, now, now, keep your shirt on while I tell you this. She kept calling me Nick. I, I told her it was Waldo, but Yes, she yes, kept... yes, Waldo. What did she say? She said she got the thieves and ran out of gas at an old hunting shack about two miles out on a small road that turned off Route 47 about three miles above Woodmere. And she's waiting there for you. Did you say anything else? No, that's all. And do you know how she ended up? Well, naturally not. What was it? She says, Hallelujah, we caught the crooks. Hallelujah? You sure? Well, sure, I'm sure. I ain't if you know. Thanks, Waldo. Goodbye. Grab your hat and your gun, Matty. We're going places. <laughs> You're uh, sure the whole thing is a frame-up, Nick? Of course huh? I am, Mary. I told you when Patsy wants me to know she's in trouble, she uses the word hallelujah somewhere in the conversation. Uh, we set that up years ago. Probably the guy who kidnapped her made her send the message, huh? Exactly. He thinks he set a trap for us and that we'll walk into it. Well, we'll string the trap on him instead. <laughs> changed your plan? No. I'll let the car stop outside the shack. And when I start walking in, I'll pick them off. They won't have a chance. Not with this moon. Oh, won't you they please? can see me and I can see them. Oh, hey, what's that? Oh, that you? Yes, Patsy. Are you all right? Oh, yes, Nick. He was going to kill us after he shot you. Hey, you shut up. Shut up, will you? How about the guy, Nick? Looks pretty bad, Matty. How do you live to pay the penalty, I'm happy to say. And after I finished talking to you, or rather to Waldo, he took us to that shack to wait. Oh, Nick, I was scared. She certainly was, Mr. Carter, but not so much on her own account. She was afraid that you might get hurt. I was afraid somebody might get hurt, maybe killed, and I didn't want it to be... Uh, the wrong person. Well, that's highly commendable of you. Oh, just think. If Gussie hadn't borrowed the blue mink, Patsy and I might not be here. Oh, please. That's not exactly a cheerful thought. Patsy, there's one thing I still don't understand. When you two found that ticket broker's envelope with the seats marked on it, why didn't you go to the police instead of trying to handle it yourselves? Well, well, to tell the truth, Nick, I just didn't think of it. Hmm. I suppose it's because, well, as a rule... We don't go to the police for help. They usually come to us. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is a copyrighted feature by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. 
Maddie is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis. Script written by Jock McGregor, storyline by Peggy Mayer. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use Old Dutch Cleanser. 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 Old Dutch Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, finding that imitation diamond in the crook's pocket is certainly proof that he was in on the robbery. Certainly would be, Patsy, if I had found it there. But you must have. I saw you take it out of his pocket. You did. I was trying to start something. Well, oh, I don't understand you at all in this case, Nick. You're doing the craziest things and not getting anywhere. Ah, oh, that's where you're wrong, Patsy. I expect to catch the robbers before I go to bed tonight. And that's a promise. <laughs> Now, the case of the imitation robbery. Today's exciting adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As our story opens, Nick and Patsy are in the jewelry shop of Nelson Stroud, talking to the proprietor. It is late fall, and there's a hint of snow in the afternoon air. The Jewelers Protective Association tells me you reported that you're being systematically robbed, Mr. Stroud. It must have been going on for weeks, Mr. Carter. So many of my best unset stones have been stolen. Then it wasn't from holdups, Mr. Stroud? Holdups? No. It was a lot slicker than that. Oh. You see, it's like this. Day before yesterday, Saturday, I happened to see an imitation diamond in the tray with a dozen or so real diamonds. So I became suspicious. Uh -huh. You say you just happened to spot the phony stone? Yes. So yesterday, Sunday, I came down to the store and checked through all the trays. And I found 29 paste stones mixed in with the real ones. Well, how much will the 29 diamonds that are missing be worth, Mr. Stroud? At a rough estimate in the neighborhood of $65,000. Golly. And you think somebody brought 29 imitation gems in here and walked out with 29 real ones? I know it. Well, how does it happen none of your clerks spotted the fakes? These fake stones are too good, Mr. Carter. That's the trouble. Here, look at this one. Why, Nick, that looks genuine to me. Yes. It is an excellent job, I must admit. A close inspection would, of course, reveal them at once. But about all the clerks do as a rule is to run their eye rapidly over the tray after serving a customer and check the number of stones before putting them away. Mm-hmm. Would well, you have any ideas how this substitution might have taken place? I don't think. I know. Some crook or gang of crooks has come in here time after time asking to see our unset stones and palm the real ones, leaving the fakes in the tray. Oh, but that would have taken weeks, Mr. Stroud. It couldn't be done too often. And even then, the criminal will be taking a long chance of not being recognized. But it must have been done that way. Oh, not necessarily. No, it looks to me as if the crook or crooks had inside help in this. Nonsense. All three of my clerks are fine men with good references. That remains to be seen. Show me what you have here in the store in the way of burglar alarms. Of course. You see, there are counters on each of the three sides of the store. Each counter has an alarm buzzer under it, operated by pressing a button with your foot. Then the vault where the unset stones are kept has a special alarm on it. Well, how is that operated, Mr. Stroud? Well, if the dial that works the combinations turned back to ten first, it automatically rings an alarm. They're all connected direct to police headquarters and the Protective Association. Uh-huh. The unset diamonds are kept in that vault? Yes. Here, I'll show you. There. You see, this vault is filled with little trays, only about an inch high. Each tray is numbered to identify the different grades of stone. Oh, golly, Nick, look at that. There must be a hundred trays in there. Just about. Mr. Stroud, I think I have a plan that'll test the reaction of your clerks. Tomorrow afternoon should be a good time. I'll let you know definitely the exact hour, because I'll need your cooperation. Of course, Mr. Carter. Uh, what are you planning to do? It's a little unconventional, but it's been done before. Now, here's the plan. About four o'clock, I'll send Miss Bowen here to see... And Nick says he's ready for the test. So will you please disconnect the burglar alarm system? Uh, you're sure this is necessary, Miss Bourne? Well, you're interested in having these thefts stopped as soon as you can, aren't you? Of course. Very well, I'll make the necessary arrangements. 
How long before Mr. Carter will be here? From what he said, he should be along any minute now. Something I can do for you, sir? Oh, oh a gun. Put your hands on the counter. All three of you. And keep them there. But I... This is a stick-up. No monkey business. Hands on the counter there, you with the black hair, and quick. That's better. Now, you two. Get around the other side of the store with Golalux. Now, look here. You can't... Shut up, Goldie. And keep your trap shut. All right, you other guys. Get around Goldie, I said. And walk slow. So nobody looking in will think there's anything wrong. Okay. Now, you, Baldy. Uh, me? Yeah, you. Open up that vault. I I can't. Uh, I don't know the combination. Open a vault, I said. But I said For I the last can't... time, will you open well, up that... All right, all right. Now, haul out all those trays so I can get at them. Wait a minute, Baldy. Don't be picking out just a tray with the cheap stones. I want them all. Yeah, yeah, all right. Okay, that's enough. You can put them back now. What? what? what you... All right, Mr. Stroud. Well, Mr. Carter, I hope you learned something. Yes, yeah, so all three of your clerks passed with high marks, Mr. Stroud. Baldy here turned the vault dial the wrong way, which would set off the alarm. The other two stepped on their alarm buzzers. I watched their feet. Then if the alarms had been connected, there would have been three separate alarms rung in headquarters, Nick. Right, Patsy. Oh, by the way, Mr. Stroud, you better connect the alarm system again, just in case. Mr. Stroud, what's been going on here? I don't get it. Uh, this is Mr. Nick Carter of the Jewelers Protective Association. He just wanted to be sure you boys were on your toes in case of real trouble. Oh. Uh, you through now, Mr. Carter? All through, thanks. Then let's get back to my office. Uh, you can put the trays back, boys. It's all right, sir. This all seems very silly to me, Mr. Carter. Did you really learn anything from that little stunt? I did. Who's the young fellow with the blonde hair? That's my nephew, Bill Devlin. And the middle-aged man with the bald head? Well, that's Arthur Ryan. Been here for six years. Darn good clerk. And who's the good-looking chap with the black hair slicked down so neatly? Chap by the name of Robert Hill. He's new here, but as far as I know, he's absolutely okay. I called the firm he's been with, and they gave him excellent references. Maybe so. But he instinctively reached for a gun and a shoulder holster when I first drew my guns. Nothing against him yet, of course, but I'd keep an eye on him. Well, maybe he's used to having a job where he needed protection, Nick. Entirely possible, Patsy. I wouldn't want to say until I knew more about him. You said yesterday you thought this was an inside job, Mr. Carter. Well, I think now that you're wrong. What do you mean, now? I'll show you. Here. I found this under the silverware counter this morning. That's so. Well... Well, what is it, Nick? Wad of chewing gum, Patsy. And there's a diamond inside it. Diamond in a hunk of chewing gum? Yes. It's an old game. Cook comes in, palms an unset stone, and when the clerk's not looking, sticks the stone to the underside of the counter in the chewing gum. Huh. Then, a few days later, he comes in, scrapes the gum off, and walks out. <laughs> that way, if the stone's missed when he steals it, he can submit to a search and there's nothing on him. And I bet that's how all 29 of my stones disappeared. It's possible, Mr. Stroud, but I doubt it. I still think it's an inside job. And I'll tell you what... Uncle Max. Uncle Max, you said to let you know if anybody I'd seen before came in to look at unset stones. That's right, I did. Why? Well, there's a man out there now who's been in at least twice before. Ryan's waiting on him. Any way I can get a look at him from in here, Mr. Stroud? Uh, yes, I have a secret panel here that lets me watch the store without being seen. Now, right here. Good. You mean that tall, thin man in the brown suit, Devlin? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Oh. I think, Mr. Stroud, I'll have a talk with that gentleman. Oh, now, be careful, Mr. Carter. I, I, I don't want a lawsuit on my hands. Well, Morgan, interested in diamonds? Huh? Oh, Nick Carter. Mind stepping into the office a minute, Morgan? I'd like to have a word with you. Look, why don't you mind your own business, Carter? I'm minding mine. I'd like to help you mind yours. This won't take but a minute. And I think you better do as I suggest. Okay, copper. If there's any funny business, I'm telling Save you. Save it, right... Morgan. Right in here. Look, I don't know what right you got to drag me in here like this. A lot of diamonds have been taken out of this store lately without being paid for. You've been in here several times to look at unset stones. 
So I just want to see if any of those stones have stuck to your fingers. Wouldn't be the first time. Well, you cheat too far. Now, look here, Carter. We simply can't go We can in this case. Morgan's long record at headquarters makes me very suspicious. All right, stand still, Morgan, while I see what you have in your pocket. I'll sue you for this. I'll sue the store, too. See if I don't. Well, what's this? Huh? Here in your vest pocket. A diamond. So he is. I, I, I... I never saw that before. I swear. Now, will you confess, or must I? I never saw that before. Look, there's something wrong, I tell you. Yes, something is. Let me see that stone. Certainly. Here you are. Uh, I thought so. It's a fake. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. And I still say I never saw that thing before. But it don't make no difference now, see? You can't arrest a man for having an imitation diamond in his pocket. No, Morgan, you're quite right. You Mm. can't. You can go now. I'm going fast enough, but I ain't through with this. I'm going to sue this store. You'll hear from my lawyer later. But you can't let him go like this. Genuine or imitation. He's at the bottom of this. Yes, I think you're right, Mr. Stroud. Then why did you let him go, Nick? Finding that imitation diamond in his pocket is proof, isn't it? Well, yes, it would be if I'd found it there. What? You mean you didn't? No, I put it there and then pretended to find it. What? The fake stone Mr. Stroud showed me yesterday. I hope you know what you're doing, Mr. Carter. This is all Greek to me. Yes, Nick. What in heaven's name are you doing? Playing games? Why, Patsy, you know me better than that. Well, I thought I did. Oh, by the way, Mr. Stroud, didn't you tell me none of your clerks knew of these thefts? That's right. I left the fake stones in the trays where I found them. Well, if you were so sure this wasn't an inside job, why didn't you want the clerks to know about the loss? Well, you see... Well, it was really only when I found that wad of chewing gum under the counter that I finally decided it was an outside job. Hmm. I see. Well... In that case, I believe I'll search your clerks before they go home tonight. What? May turn up something. What time do you close? 5.30, but I... 5.30 now, so... Or 5 o'clock now, rather, so I guess I'll wait, if you don't mind. I don't like it, but I guess you'll do it anyway. Go ahead, wait if you want to. (sighs) Better take your overcoat off, Nick. It's pretty warm in here. Thanks, Patsy, I'll do that. Might as well be comfortable as we can while we're waiting. to be through in the store by now. I told them to come in here when they were ready to go home. I can wait. I still say this is the craziest way to find out... You wanted to see us, Uncle Max? No, I did. Gentlemen, a number of unset diamonds have been stolen from the store recently. Mr. Shroud says you're all okay, but just as a matter of routine, I'd like to search each of you before you leave tonight. Any objections? No. All right, Devlin, I'll take you first. Yes, sir. You're clean. Now you, Hill. Yes, sir. Nothing on you? Huh. All right, Ryan, you're next. Well, I don't... I don't well... Right? You can go now. Thank you. Uh, good night, Mr. Good night. Good night. Oh, Nick, that was the silliest exhibition I've ever seen you give. Why, those men could have a dozen stones concealed in their clothes and you'd never have found them. The girl's right. That was no search at all, and you didn't really think one of them would be fool enough to try to walk out of here tonight of all nights with a diamond hidden on him? Perhaps I was looking for something else. Huh? Something else? Did you find it? I won't know till later, Patsy. Oh, for goodness sake. I'll go and see that everything's locked up for the night. If you'll excuse me. Now, I want to get the names and addresses of those clerks before I go. Oh, where did I put my pencil? Had it earlier this afternoon. Maybe it's in your overcoat pocket, Nick. Uh, maybe. I'll have a look, anyway. Well. Nick, you're looking in the wrong coat. That's Mr. Stroud's coat. Yes. So I've just discovered. And look here. Diamonds. Two beautiful diamonds. Yes. And these aren't ponies. They're the real thing. They were in Mr. Stroud's coat? Yes, Betsy. Two genuine unset diamonds in Mr. Stroud's overcoat pocket. Now back to the case of the imitation robbery. Today's exciting adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. It's a few minutes after Nick found the two real diamonds in the overcoat pocket of Mr. Stroud, the jeweler, and Stroud has just returned to his office and is locking up the store for the night. 
Anything else, Mr. Carter? If oh, uh, yes, just one more thing, Mr. Stroud. Will you give me the addresses of your three clerks? There they are on that phone list. Oh, yes. Copy them down for me, will you, Patsy? Of course, Nick. And will you let me look in your vault once more before we go, Mr. Stroud? I suppose so. But I'd like to get home sometime tonight. You'd like to stop the robberies, too, wouldn't you? Naturally. By the way you're going at it, I can't see... There you are. Now what? I'm going to pull out certain of these drawers of unset stones. This, this, these two, this, and these two. Now, Mr. Stroud, will you tell me, please, whether or not there are any phony stones in any of the drawers I have not pulled out? Let me see. I know you've pulled out every tray that has a fake stone in it. How did you know? I have a good memory, Mr. Stroud. You can close the vault now. Ready to go, Nick? Yes, Patsy, all set. Good. How could you tell which trays had the phonies in them, Mr. Carter? Those seven trays are the ones Ryan pulled out first when I pretended to rob the place. Well, that shows he's a good man. Wanted to get rid of the bad stones and keep the good ones if he could. Well, that's really clever. Now, look, I don't want to hurry you, Mr. Carter, but I'd like to get my dinner. If you need me, you can reach me at Deal's Restaurant. I eat there every night. Well, that is, unless you'd care to join me. No, thanks, Mr. Stroud. I have something else to do right now. Come on, Patsy. All right with you, Nick. After you, mademoiselle. Oh, merci, monsieur. Expect any results in the near future, Mr. Carter? I do. In the very near future. I hope so. Well, good night. Good night. Get in touch with me when you have anything definite. Good night. <laughs> hmm. It certainly doesn't sound very optimistic, Nick. And I can't say I blame him much. The way you've been acting today. It isn't like you, Nick. Well, this case isn't like any other either, Patsy. It's always a good idea to fit your methods to what you're trying to do. Well, good night. I'll see you in the morning. But you're not going back to the office? No, indeed. I expect to finish up this case this evening. I have something else I want to do tomorrow. <laughs> Darkest hole. We should put that dog on light switch. Dog right on the lights. Uh, that you, Morgan? Yeah. Gosh, you gave me a scare. For a minute, I thought you were a cop. Well, you're getting scared at last, are you? It's about time. Been trying to tell you we can't keep this up forever, but no, you're new at all. Now look where we are. What are you doing here? Why'd you come here to my apartment? I came here for my share of the ice. I'm through. Washed up. After what happened in Stroud's office today, I ain't sticking what around. What did happen? Uh, that copper Nick Carter searched me. But so what? He didn't find anything, did he? That's the beauty of the way we got this racket fixed. They can search any time they like and find nothing. Yeah, you know so much, Ryan. Carter did find something. What? He found a fake diamond in my vest pocket. You blundering fool. Why the devil did you have one of the I pony... didn't have it. Carter planted it on me. I was framed. Framed? Why? I don't know. But I do know he wouldn't have framed me if he wasn't on me. From now on, I'll be watched like a hawk, so I'm leaving town on the first train out. Anybody follow you here? Yeah, not a chance. A bloodhound couldn't have trailed me the way I came here. And I climbed up the fire escape in the back, and I got in through the kitchen window. And I ain't had a light in here, either, in case somebody might be watching from the next door roof, maybe. I hope you're right, Morgan. Don't worry. You're in the clear. But I ain't, see? So I'm getting out of here as soon as I get my half of the stuff. Can you find it in the dark? Sure. I can find it all right with the lights off, but a dozen detectives couldn't find it with the lights on. In the base of this lamp right here. Very cleverly concealed in a hollow special wall. they packed in cotton so you can shake the thing, not here. Nah, either. come on. Never mind the lecture. Let's have the stones. Well, I've got to get them first, don't I? There they are. I had count them. Let me see. There ought to be 28 of them. 29 we got away with when we left in the gum for a phony clue. Yeah, we have to have some light to see how we're dividing them. I'll get a blanket. If you want some light, huh? I'll give it what to you. The... How's this? Nick Carter! How the deuce did Don't you... let my gun scare you. You play pretty, I won't have to use it. But if you get rough, so do I. Uh, okay, Carter. What do you want? So a dozen detectives couldn't find the diamonds, huh, Baldy? I thought you'd have them hidden away pretty well, so I've been waiting in the bedroom until you found them for me. You mean... You mean you was here when Morgan, I... Morgan, you passed within two feet of me when you came in. I wish I'd have known you was here. I don't doubt it. Well, boys, that was a very interesting conversation I heard you two having. 
You can put it in writing later when we go down and see Sergeant Matheson. He'll be very happy. Get him, Ryan. Oh, you want to play? All right. All right. Come on, please. Watch yourself, boy. All right. I didn't want to shoot you guys if I didn't have to. And it looks as if I didn't have to. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Hi, Matty. Nick, got a couple of crooks for you. You want them for a Christmas present? Sure, I want them. Tell me more, Santa Claus. Tell me more. All right, send the squad car up to 1753 North Garvin Street. <laughs> Now we return to Nick Carter. As we pick up our story, we find Nick and Patsy at headquarters in Matty's office. Mr. Stroud, the jeweler, has come down to identify the stolen gems. You're sure these are the diamonds stolen from your store, Mr. Stroud? As near as I can identify unset stones, I'm sure. Uh, uh, but there are only 28 here. 29 were stolen. Well, you forget the one you found in the wad of chewing gum. Oh, of course, Mr. Carter. I didn't think of that. Did those two men confess, Sergeant? Yep. Got everything down in black and white now. Nick knocked all the fight out of me. <laughs> I seem to have been all wrong in my opinion of your ability, Mr. Carter. I apologize. I thought you were just fooling around today. Well, I almost thought that myself, but knowing Nick, I should have had more faith in him. Look, Nick, don't fool around without he's got some idea in mind. But you have to admit, Mr. Carter, you would have been stuck if this accomplice of Ryan's, this Morgan fellow, hadn't come into the store while you were there. Well, that was a help, certainly, but I could have got along without him. How do you suppose I happened to be in Ryan's flat in the first place? Why, I suppose you trailed him there. Oh, wrong, Mr. Stroud. I beat him there. I was waiting for him when he got there. But how could you do that? Nick, you ain't told me the whole story now. The fake holdup told me all about that clerk, Ryan. Well, go on, Nick. Give out. No secrets. Yeah, come on. Well, I told you that Ryan started pulling out certain trays of diamonds from the vault before I made him pull them all out. Uh-huh. Later, when I pulled out those same seven trays, Mr. Stroud... You told me those were the trays that contained all the phony stones. Yes, that's right. I told you that he was trying to be sure that if any diamonds were stolen, it would be the fake ones. But you forget, at that time, none of the clerks were supposed to know there were any fake stones. So he could only know where they were if he himself had put them there. Well, of course, Nick. <laughs> it's so simple when you tell it. His real idea was to get rid of the phony stones before they were discovered, if possible. But it couldn't have been Ryan. You searched him and found nothing. Now, Mr. Stroud, you really wouldn't expect him to walk out of there with a diamond on him when he knew he might be searched any time, would you? No. No, no, he was too clever for that. Well, for the love of Pete, who did take them out of the store? It couldn't have been Morgan, could it? That would have been just as dangerous. Quite right, Matty, quite right. Neither of them carried them out. Huh? Mr. Stroud took the stones out for them. Now, look here, Carter, if you're insinuating easy, that I... Easy, easy, Mr. Stroud. I'm not saying you knew you were taking them out. Huh? Now, here's what happened. Morgan came in the store every few days, always being sure Ryan was free to wait on him. He gave Ryan the phony stones. Ryan substituted them for the genuine ones, then put the real stones in your overcoat pocket. What? Nick, you mean those stones you found there this afternoon were put there by Ryan? Exactly, Patsy. What? When Mr. Stroud had dinner in that restaurant he said he went to every night, he hung his overcoat on a hook. Yeah. And Morgan, an expert pickpocket, picked the stones out of his overcoat pocket. Oh. In that way, neither Morgan or Ryan had the stones on them at a time when they might be searched. Huh. It's a wonder I never felt them in my pocket while I was on my way to the restaurant. You wear heavy gloves, don't you? Oh, yes. And you put them on as soon as you leave the store, don't you? I do. Well, see, there's practically no risk. Hmm. Diamonds aren't very big in an overcoat pocket, you know. Well, I'll be doggone. Oh, by the way, Mr. Stroud, here are two diamonds that I found in your overcoat pocket this afternoon uh, while I was waiting in your office. <laughs> Morgan must have been surprised when he searched your pocket for them tonight and didn't find them. Well... <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Carter. You seem to have taken care of everything. If Morgan hadn't waited to try to get those diamonds from you as you left tonight, I might not have been able to beat him to Ryan's room. But he did. And I did. Uh, there's one more thing, Nick. You said when you held up the store that Ryan turned the dial on the vault the wrong way so as to set off the alarm. Well, why should he do that if he really wanted the fake stone stolen? Patsy had nothing to lose. He knew the other two men had already pressed the foot buzzers and sounded the alarm that way. And it was safer for him to do it the way he ought to in case either of the other clerks was watching him. Oh, I gotta admit it, Nick. You're a wonder. I suppose you planted the fake stone on Morgan like you did so as to put him on his guard and start him worrying, huh? That's the answer, Matty. Oh. There's an old saying, you remember. When thieves fall out, 
Honest men get their chance. Yeah. Well, these two thieves decided to fall out when they saw what was up. And Mr. Stroud, an honest man, gets his diamonds back. Which is as it should be. Quite a tale, Nick. Uh, What happened to Ryan and Morgan? They were brought to trial, Bob, and sentenced to spend many long years behind bars. And believe me, they'll be a lot older than they are now when they get out. I'm glad to hear it. But what about the clerk who reached for his gun during the fake holdup? Did you ever find out about him? Oh, yes, yes. It seems that he used to be in the state police out west when he was younger. Really very simple when you know the answer, as Patsy says. Now, what can you tell us about the adventure that Old Dutch Clench is going to bring us next week? Well, Bob, it's a story of what happened in one of our great observatories when two men of science each claimed to have made an important discovery. If they'd only stuck to arguing, it might have been all right, but the argument ended in murder. And a peculiarly fiendish type of murder, too, as well as a very difficult one to track down. But did you find the killer? Oh, yes, finally. With the help of a mad old man who didn't even know what he was telling us. Uh, what do you call the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Heavenly Body. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser. Remember, when you go shopping tomorrow, get the cleanser preferred by more women in America than any other. Old Dutch Cleanser. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Script is written by Jock McGregor. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance therein to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use all Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Old Dutch Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. But Nick, with the man you're chasing murdered and the stolen diamonds gone from their hiding place, how can you possibly hope to carry on? That's simple, Patsy. We just follow the clues. Clues? What clues do we have? The gold-headed cane, the angle from which the knife was thrown. And the ink spots on the bills. Of course. When we put them all together, they spell the end of our search. But there's no time to be lost. We dock in less than two days. Now the case of the gold-headed cane. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As our story starts, we find Sir Armin Coleman and his servant Gig being shown through the Filbert Diamond Mine, one of South Africa's biggest. I say, Mr. Hopkins, it's awfully decent of you to take your time to show us through the mine. Being general manager of a mine like this must be quite an undertaking. Yes, Sir Armin, it keeps me pretty busy. But you're, we're always happy, you know, to show visitors how diamonds are mined. Yeah, but how do you know one of these visitors won't walk off with some of the diamonds? You uh, don't seem to have any guards here. Uh, we don't need them, Sir Armand. Before you leave the mine, you have to pass through a special exit gate where an X-ray machine shows the attendant whether or not you have any diamonds on your person, no matter how cleverly concealed. Oh, I see. Clever idea, that. <laughs> Blimey, look at all the diamonds spread out on the table, Sir Armand. Hey, Jew, they are beauty. Yeah, those are some of the choice samples of diamonds found in this mine. May I look at them, Mr. Hopkins? Uh, uh, closely, I mean. Well, certainly. Oh, Mr. Hopkins, could I ask you a question, please? Yes, of course. Uh, what is it, Gig? Uh, uh, this picture here on the wall, is that the mine we've just been through? Yes, Gig, it is. You see, we came in here, went down through this way, then turned here, came back along here. 
We're now standing in this room here. Blimey, we've had some walk, ain't we? <laughs> uh, where's this exit gate you've been telling us about? Well, you see this passage? Yeah. He's out of this room. Well, the gate is right here, just around the corner. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. That sure is some map. <laughs> well, Sir Armand, you ready to leave? Yes, thank you. Uh, through this way, please. This has been a most instructive... Oh, oh, found it, my ankle, and I dropped my cane again. Oh, I'll get it, sir. Oh, here it is. Your ankle hurt much, sir? No, it's all right, Gig. Let's get on. Uh, your bad leg troubling you, Sir Armand? A uh, little, yes. Must be this long walk we've had. Well, here we are. Here's the exit gate. Uh, you go first, Gig. Yes, sir. <laughs> Stop under the archway until the attendant says he's satisfied you're not carrying any diamonds out. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Glad I didn't try to get away with nothing near. <laughs> Okay, you can go out, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Couldn't find nothing on old gig, eh? <laughs> you next, Sir Armand, if you will, please. Mm, of course. There's a queer sensation. Oh, I'll oh, 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 hit my ankle again. Here, I've got the cane, Sir Armand. I'll keep it till you come out, eh? Oh, very well, Giggs. You're all right, sir. You may go. Oh, thank you. You have to go through this too, Miss Hopkins? Oh, yes, indeed. Everyone does from the owner down. Take no chances on anyone. Okay, Mr. Hopkins. Well, Sir Armand, uh, that's about all. It's been very interesting, I assure you. Thanks, no end, Mr. Hopkins. Been just fine, Mr. Hopkins. We go out this door here. That's right. You'll find your car just outside. Goodbye. Goodbye, and thanks again. Did you get those diamonds, Sir Armand? I certainly did. The trick worked like a charm. And Mr. Hopkins will never know I got the idea from one of the stories he told us. <laughs> That's good, sir. <laughs> Come on, Gig. Let's get back to the hotel and pack. In 12 hours, we can be on the boat headed for the States and a life of luxury. <laughs> Uh, take this message, Miss Gerald. Yes, sir. Fifty carats of first quality diamonds stolen from Filbert Mine in daring robbery. Suspect believed to be on boat bound for United States. Lost discovered in checkup late this afternoon. Famous American detective Nick Carter called in on case. Have you got that, Miss Gerald? Yes, sir. See that it gets out at once. All news, sir. <laughs> It's been a wonderful trip, Nick. Except for this cold of mine. Oh. oh. Poor girl. You know, it's the first time I've made a transatlantic crossing by plane. Yeah, I don't mind taking time for a trip like this. Particularly when it's at someone else's expense. <laughs> you know, from what John Filbert said... Oh, well, uh, Filbert is the owner of the diamond mine, Nick? Yes, I met him at a convention some years ago. Uh-huh. From what he said, he's more worried about how the diamonds got out than he is about the loss of these particular stones. You'll find out, Nick. I'll bet on that. Huh? Hope you're right. Oh, come in, Hopkins. Yes, Mr. Gilbert. Uh, Nick, this is Charles Hopkins, our general manager. Uh, Hopkins, Pleasure, Mr. How do you do? Uh, he was the one who showed this man Coleman through the mine the day the thefts occurred. Oh, yes, yes. Mr. Hopkins, Mr. Filbert here tells me you're sure Coleman is the man who got away with the gems. He must be, Mr. Carter. Our display table is checked every night, you see. So when we missed the stones, we went back over every visitor for that day. Mm -hmm. The only one that presented anything out of the ordinary was Coleman, who dropped his cane as he went through the exit gate. So we figured the cane must have something to do with it. Very probably. Well, if Coleman secreted the stones in his cane, he must still have them with him. I think the best plan will be for Patsy and me to fly directly to the ship he's sailing on and see if we can find them. So if you'll radio the skipper that we're coming and give me a full description of the man and his servant, we'll be on our way. Oh, oh, before you go, Nick, I, uh, I want to give you a small retainer to cover your expenses, at least. Uh, you have the money, Hopkins? Uh, yes, sir, right here. Uh, two $500 bills. <laughs> I have to apologize, Mr. Carter, but I accidentally spilled some red ink on the corner of them while they were on my desk. Oh, that doesn't matter, Mr. Hopkins. Thank you. Now let's get on with the details. We have to reach Coleman's ship before it docks, and we haven't too much time. Ah, it has been such a beautiful stroll around the deck, Monsieur Coleman. I say, Madame Duquesne, I think a cocktail won't go badly before we go down to dinner. Huh? That is such an excellent idea, monsieur. Shall I mix the cocktail, sir? Uh, no, Gig, you may go. We won't need you until after dinner. Oh, yes, sir. You'll find everything you need right there. 
Madame Duquesne, we've gotten to know each other quite well these last few days. Yes. Why don't we stop being so formal? You call me Armand, and I'll call you Sarita. Ah, that is another of your lovely ideas, Monsieur Armand. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I mix the cocktail? I am very good at it. If you like. You'll find the things on that table. You would like a Manhattan, Armand? They are my favorite. Whatever you desire, Sarita. Huh? First of all, oh, the cork stick. No, shall I? Oh, no, 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 I have it. <laughs> oh, Armand, I've spilled it all over my hands. Now I shall have to wash them. Well, the wash basin's in the other room, Sarita. I'll mix the cocktails while you're gone. Hurry now, I shall return at once. Mixing drinks is a man's job anyway. A woman's job is to look pretty and feed a man's vanity. <laughs> Do I feed your vanity, Armand? You do indeed, my pretty. And I'm happy that you do. I shouldn't... Uh, 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 what is that uh, funny noise, Armand? Are you drinking uh, already? Uh, Please wait for me. Uh, now, Armand, I'm ready for... Uh, who are you? What are you? Uh, Armand, who is that? Uh, Armand! Uh, good time, Mr. Carter, but even so, you're too late. Too late? For what? To talk to Coleman. He was killed a half hour ago. Uh -oh. Killed? How? A knife in his throat. The woman who was with him when it happened reported it to me. She said she was washing her hands in the dressing room when she heard a funny noise. When she came out, Coleman was lying dead on the floor. Hmm. Did she see anyone else? Yeah, there was a man in the room. But he dashed out when he saw her. She said she wouldn't know him again. She was so scared. Now, this is something I hadn't counted on. Look here, Captain! I want something done about this man, Redding. Uh, I'm busy just now. Drop in later, won't you? I want action now. Two days ago, this Redding moved my deck chair to one side and put his own chair where mine should be. He insulted uh, me. I'm too busy he... to do anything about that now, sir. Now, come uh, back this evening, will you? Yeah. Oh, all right, all right. But I'll poke this guy, Redding, right in the snoot if he doesn't... Sorry, Mr. Carter. Just one of the things in the captain's life. <laughs> yes. Well, shall we take a look at Coleman's cabin? I'd like to get started on my investigation. Perhaps what I'm looking for is still here. This is Coleman's stateroom, Mr. Carter. Dr. Samuels, this is Nick Carter and Miss Bowen. Carter, this is the ship's doctor. How do you do, sir? How do you do, doctor? How do you do, doctor? Now, that's Gig, Coleman's servant. Oh, yeah. Is everything the way you found it, doctor? Uh, yes, Captain. You said Mr. Carter was coming, so I've made my inspection without moving anything. Oh, thank you, thank you. Hmm. Doctor, would you say that this knife was stabbed into the throat or thrown? Well, I, I did think that it was a peculiar angle for a stabbing, but... The throwing hadn't occurred to me. You find anything on the knife, Nick? The handle seems to be clean. No, no prints. Uh-uh. Gig, where were you when Coleman was killed? When Sir Armand and the lady came in after they'd been walking on deck, he told me he wouldn't need me till after dinner. So I went out and talked to a man I met yesterday. When I came back, the captain and the doctor was here. I, I verified that part of it, Mr. Carter. Hmm. Looks as if Coleman was mixing a drink when he was killed, doesn't it? That's what Madame Duquesne uh, told me when she, she was the one who was with him at the time. Oh, I see. Well, if he was standing there at the table where the drinks are, the knife must have been thrown through the window, judging by the angle at which it entered his throat. Yes, you're certainly right about that, Mr. Carter. Oh, Patsy, do you yeah. see that gold-headed cane Filbert told us Coleman carried? Yes, it's standing over there in the corner. Ah, good. You want it? Yes, please. Have you seen that cane before, Mr. Carter? No, but I've heard about it. Here, Nick. Thanks. Imagine this head comes off. <coughs> well, there must be a catch here somewhere. Ah, well, that does it. Hmm. Why? Well, inside we find the motive for the killing. You mean the diamonds? I mean the diamonds are gone. You expected to find diamonds in the head of the cane? I did, Captain. When Coleman left South Africa, he had about 50 carats of flawless diamonds hidden there. It's empty now. 
So I should guess that the killer has taken the stones. Then all we have to do is search the ship, find the diamonds, and arrest whoever has them as the murderer. Yes, you could do it that way, Captain, but maybe I can save you some time. If I can do a little figuring. Uh, you know, Mr. Carter, there's one thing that puzzles me about this. Yes? What's that, Doctor? Well, the woman who reported the killing, Madame Duquesne, said she came to the captain's office immediately. Now, allowing for the time it took her to get there and the time it took me to get down here after that, the man should have been dead about 20 minutes. But I found that he'd been dead at least an hour. Is that so? Nick, I wonder why she waited over half an hour before reporting the murder. Yes, Patsy. I wonder, too. <laughs> Back to the case of the gold-headed cane. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As we pick up our story, we find Nick, Patsy, and the captain standing on deck outside the window of Coleman's stateroom. You see, Captain, it's just as I said. A knife thrown through this window at anyone standing at that table would enter the throat at the exact angle that the knife entered Coleman's throat. Nick, this is a curious coincidence. Oh, what's that, Patsy? The name on this deck chair right under Coleman's window is Redding. Yes? You remember that the passenger who busted into the captain's office was complaining about his chair having been replaced by one belonging to a man named Redding? Yes. Well, here it is. So Redding wanted to be in this particular spot no matter whom he annoyed, huh? Mm-hmm. Patsy, take down the names of the passengers in the adjacent chairs and see if any of them saw anything of this. Sure thing you know, Nick. What are you going to do? Going to see what Mr. Redding has to say about this. <laughs> Well? Pardon my intrusion, Mr. Redding. Just curious to know why you changed your deck chair from wherever it was to the position it now occupies. They put my chair in the wrong place to begin with. What's it in your life? I'm acting on behalf of the captain. His chart doesn't show your chair in its present position. I can't help that. That's the spot I was promised. Mr. Redding, do you happen to know a man named Sir Armand Coleman? 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 Yes. Never heard of him. Oh, I see you have a burn on the palm of your right hand, Mr. Redding. Been working recently? What I have on the palm of my hand is no concern of yours. Quite correct. I was just curious to know if you got it by practicing knife throwing. Knife? Get out of here. Get out. I've had enough of this. Very well, Mr. Redding. Oh, uh, by the way, did you hear about the murder on board a while ago? Murder? Mm-hmm. I'd like to know what you're getting at with all these questions. You suspect me of the murder, perhaps? I was going to say, when you interrupted me, that I'm about to make a very interesting call. I'm going to call on a woman who saw the killer and says she can identify him. So long, Mr. Redding. See you later. <laughs> Have you had time to find out about those other passengers? Nobody saw anything, Nick. They were all downstairs, uh, below decks, I <laughs> guess I should say. Yes, I guess you should. Is that you, Mr. Carter? Oh, yes, Captain. Anything new? Maybe, and maybe not. I'll leave you to judge. Okay, what is it? Well, as soon as Madame Duquesne, the murder witness, got back to her cabin, she called for a plumber. Said the drain in her wash basin was stopped up. As it happened, the plumber was free, so he went there at once. He cleaned out the drain and left. But when he got back to his quarters, he discovered one of his wrenches were missing. He asked Madame Duquesne about it, but she said she hadn't seen it. And he's sure he left it there. Well, very interesting indeed. I'm on my way to her stateroom now, Captain. You want to come along? Maybe we can find the answer. <laughs> Madame Duquesne isn't at home here. Well, I think we'd better get in and have a look at her room anyway. I have a key, Mr. Carter. I'll let you in. Thanks. All right, Patsy. See if you can find the wrench. I'm sure it's hidden somewhere here. Right. What makes you so sure Madame Duquesne has it, Mr. Carter? I believe she stole Coleman's diamonds. Then try to find a safe place to hide them. She got the idea of putting him in the wash basin drain, so she sent for the plumber. 
Watched what he did, then stole one of his wrenches, and when he was gone, opened up the pipe again and hid the diamonds inside. Well, why didn't she just put them down through the drain in the basin? Too big to go through the strainer, I should say. Oh. I found the wrench. Good. It was under the mattress. Now, oh, suppose we have a look at that drain. Right. Well, hurry up, Nick. I can't wait. Oh, just a minute, just a minute. There. Oh. And look at these, Captain. What? Well, magnificent stones, aren't they? Why, there's a fortune there. What are you doing in my room? Looking for diamonds, Madame Duquesne. And we found them. <gasps> Madame Duquesne, you're under arrest for the murder of Sir Armand Coleman. No, I did not kill him. But you did steal the diamonds, didn't you? Yes. I admit I took the diamonds. When I came out of Coleman's dressing room, I saw a man standing there with Coleman's cane in his hand. When I spoke to him, he dropped the cane and disappeared. And you got curious, examined the cane, and found the diamonds. Yes. I could not resist them. I hid them here in my room. Then I reported the murder as if it had just happened. In heaven's name, why did you do that? I had to. Gid knew I was with Coleman. He knew we were to be together for dinner. If I had not reported it, I should have been blamed for the murder myself. Can you prove you didn't kill him? No, she didn't do it, Captain. But she knows who did. Don't you, madam? I, I believe I would recognize him if I saw him. Good. And I think I know who it is. Will you come with me and identify him? I will be glad to do that. If you let me get my... Oh. Sandra Kane. Oh. That, that shot came through the window. She's dead, Nick. Come on, Captain. After it. There he goes. Up for it. Stop! Stop! Stop or I'll shoot! If you want me... He's going over the rail. Don't jump, man. There he goes. You two can play at that game, Captain. Stand by to pick us up. Don't cut or you'll kill yourself. You fool. Man overboard. Man overboard. Man overboard. Well, it takes a brave man to dive into the ocean as Nick did, but Nick is never the man to let a criminal get away from him. In just a moment, we'll hear the conclusion of today's story. <laughs> Now for the conclusion of the case of the gold-headed cane. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. Stopping his liner in mid-ocean, the captain rescues Nick from the icy waters together with his unconscious captive, Redding. The latter is put to bed in his cabin under the doctor's care while Nick thaws out in the captain's quarters. An hour later, Nick drops into Redding's cabin. You think he'll pull through, doctor? Yes, I think so. He lost some blood from the wound in his leg where you shot him, but it's nothing serious. Can I talk to him? Oh, no, not just now. He's sleeping. I just gave him a sedative to quiet him. He's very restless. He's sort of wandering in his mind. He kept calling for someone to get him out of this. I didn't get the name, he said, but it sounded as if he was being paid by someone to uh, do what he did. Well, that's a new angle. I think I'll have a look through his things. If there's anyone else mixed up in this, I'd like to know who it is. Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen to see you, Mr. Filbert. Well, Nick, glad to see you back. Glad to be back, John. Uh, did you accomplish anything, Nick? Well, yes and no. I found the man who stole the diamonds, but he was dead when we found him. Oh, that's a tough break. But I got the diamonds back for you. Here. Excellent, excellent. Uh, you never seem to fail to get what you go after. In this particular case, John, I got more than I went after. Yes? Is Mr. Hopkins around? Well, well yes, yes. I, I'll ask him to come in. Yes, Mr. Filbert? Ask Mr. Hopkins to step in here. Yes, sir. I want him to hear the rest of this story. I think it'll interest him even more than it will you. Well, right. If you want to see me, Mr. Filbert? Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. Yeah. Have a successful trip? I did. Found the thief and recovered the diamonds. And had a very pleasant plane ride in the bargain. Good. <laughs> Mr. Hopkins, I'm puzzled about one thing. Yes, Mr. Carter. You said the diamonds on that display table near the exit gate were checked every night, didn't you? That's right. As I understand, these diamonds were stolen about noon. Correct, sir. And why wasn't the loss reported until late on the following day? Uh, why, uh, well... I thought that... It was to uh, give the it... thief a chance to get safely aboard the boat that sailed for the States that evening, so he'd be out of the country before the loss was reported, wasn't it? See here, Carter. Are you accusing me of something? John? Uh, yes, Nick. When I was here before, 
Hopkins gave me two new $500 bills as a retainer, remember? Yes, I recall that. And he apologized because he'd spilled red ink in the corner of them. Yes, yes, I recall that too. What would you gather when I show you these five new $1,000 bills that also have red ink spilled on them in precisely the same places? See here, Carter, I... Be quiet, Hopkins. Uh, go on, Nick. Uh, where did those five bills come from? I found them in the stateroom of the man named Redding, the man who killed the diamond thief, Coleman, and tried to steal the stones from it. I, I don't follow you, Nick. Well, here's what I think happened. Sit down, Hopkins, and be quiet. Well, hey, uh... John... I believe Hopkins allowed Coleman, who was really an international jewel thief, to steal the diamonds from the display table. Probably even suggested the idea to him in some way. And let him pass them through the x-ray machine by getting away with that phony cane trick. See here, Coleman. And he hired Redding, another international crook, to kill Coleman and get the stones away from him. He paid him these bills, which I found in Redding's cabin. You can't prove a word of that, Carter. Uh, that is pretty complicated, Dick. Uh, what would Hopkins get out of it? He and Redding would undoubtedly split the proceeds. The $5,000 was advance expense money. Hopkins could have identified Coleman as a thief. But as Redding would have the jewels, they'd not be recovered. So Hopkins is in the clear. Redding is in the clear if he's not called for the killing. And Hopkins and Redding split the proceeds when they sell the gems. All that deduction based on a blot of red ink. It proves nothing. Your fingerprints on the bills will furnish all the additional proof necessary. <sighs> fingerprints? Yes. New bills take fingerprints excellently, Mr. Hopkins. <sighs> All right, Carter. I admit it was all worked out, just as you figured it. Hopkins, you? But, Nick, you haven't accounted for that woman who actually took the diamonds away from Coleman. Where does she come in? She doesn't, Patsy. Just, she just happened to run across the stones and being an opportunist took them. Oh. Well, Nick, I, I don't know how to thank you for what you've done. You've not only caught a thief and returned my jewels to me... You've also exposed another thief who might have gotten away with far more than this if he hadn't been found out. You know, Hopkins, this is just another illustration of the old adage. There's no such thing as a perfect crime. Crime doesn't pay. Ever. I'm curious, Nick. What happened to Redding? Well, by the time the ship docked, Bob, Redding had recovered sufficiently to stand trial. And later, he was executed for what he did. Well, he certainly deserved it. It was a cold-blooded murder. Uh, Nick, uh, it's about time to look into the adventure that old Dutch Clender's going to bring us next week. All right, Bob, here it is. It's the story of one of the most unusual rackets and crime I've ever encountered. Unusual is right. It terrorized a whole city. And Patsy speaks from first-hand experience. Uh-huh. But to go on, Bob. This case included a murder on a dark street, a deserted warehouse... The telltale marks of tires in an alley... A masked man whom they called the boss. And that's enough for now. Uh, what do you call this story, Nick? I call it A Case of the Persistent Beggars. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jock McGregor, plot outlined by Peggy L. Mayer. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use Old Dutch Cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Dutch Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective.
But, Nick, this panhandler syndicate must be headed up by someone far more intelligent than Big Louie Arkin. Obviously, Patsy. But who? I don't know yet. But whoever it is, he's made a mistake. But what kind of mistake? Murder. Now I can track him down and find out who he is. Oh, but, Nick, if he's as clever as you say he is, he won't be easy to find. Oh, I'm not going to find him. I'm going to let him find me. Now, the case of the persistent beggars. Today's exciting Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. Our story begins in a hideout in a deserted riverfront warehouse. A masked man, whose Confederates fear and know him only as the boss, watches silently as his lieutenant, Big Louis Arkin, opens a large bag of currency and dumps it on the table. Uh, there it is, boss. Today's haul. Did every one of our collectors pay off, Louis? Yeah, yeah. Every panhandler in the organization kicked in. Five dollars a man, like they've been doing every day. You've told them that my orders are to use no actual violence when they solicit funds from the public? Oh, yeah, yeah, boss. Just like you told me. No rough stuff. Precisely, Louis. No rough stuff. However, I have no objections if our collectors are, shall we say, persistent. Uh, yeah, but some people, boss, well, they're cheapskates, they... Only come across with a dime or a quarter when our boys put the touch on them. Then tell the boys that's not enough. Better get a dollar bill out of everybody they approach, even if they have to scare them to death. But, boss, uh, you don't mean they should get too tough. Not too tough, Louis. But tough enough. Understand? Oh, yeah, yeah, I get you. Still, boss, you ain't doing so bad right now, you know. A thousand dollars a Louis, day. Louis, do you by any chance envy my success? Me? Oh, no, boss, no. I... I wouldn't want you to be unhappy working for me, Louie. I'm not, boss. Honest, I, I'm satisfied with my cut. After all, it's I who organize these poor, downtrodden beggars, assign them to their territories, give them what protection I can. Sure, boss, sure. And it's a sweet record I got. Louie, your choice of words is offensive. Huh? This is not a racket. This is a legitimate business. All in the name of sweet charity. Certainly it's no crime for a poor man down on his luck to beg a dollar for food and shelter. Lady, can you let a hungry man have a little something to get a bite to eat? Oh, well, here's the dime. The dime? Well, yes, I... Give me that dollar bill. I gotta have well, money. I, uh... I'm desperate, see? Well, here. Here, take it. Hey, look, Jack. Uh, can you spare a buck? M my wife's sick, and I gotta buy her some medicine. Hey, what goes on here? You're the third panhandler who's approached me tonight. I'm not gonna give away any more... Look, Jack, I'm a desperate guy. I need dough. And you better not be a cheapskate about it. Understand? Mm, all right, here you are. A buck ain't enough, Jack. Not enough? I got a lot of medicine to buy. Better make it two. Hey, lady. <gasps> it's all right, lady. I ain't gonna hurt you. Oh, well, it's, it's so dark in the street, and I... Well, I didn't think in that do doorway. I... Look, lady, could you stake a hungry guy to a dollar... I'm down on my luck, see? I'm starving. No way. Oh, yes. Oh, now, just a minute. I, uh, I've got a dollar here in my purse. I have ah, to... you got a lot more than that in your pocketbook, well, lady. I, I... Look, I'm pretty hungry, lady. I could use all that dough. Oh, no. No, no, please. It's all the money I've got. I, uh, hand please, it I... over. No. I no. said hand it over. No. Come on. Please. Give it to me. Help. Oh, I'll teach you. You wish you never met up with Foxy Farrow when I get through with you. Oh, come in, Sergeant. Thanks, Patsy. Hi, Maddie. Hi, Nick. Hey, what's on your mind? Plenty, Nick. You know those panhandlers that have been mushrooming all over town lately? Yeah. No, I'll say we do. Well, you can't walk two blocks these days without one of them approaching you. Yeah. Well, the pressure's on down at headquarters. 
Newspapers are after us hot and heavy to clean up the city. So is the mayor. And every day of the week, we get our ears beaten off by the Citizens Reform League. Oh, yes. That's headed up by John Prentice, the big real estate man. Yeah, Prentice. Sergeant, can't you pick up these beggars on a vagrancy charge? Sure we can. We do pinch a few of them, but we can't arrest them all. Mm. And if you could, Patsy, there isn't much you could do to them on a simple vagrancy charge. Yeah, that's just it, Nick. The judge can fine them or give them a jail sentence, but the jail sentence is only a couple of days. Soon as they're out, they go right back again begging on the streets. Oh, but suppose they're fined. <laughs> big Louis Arkin is right there in night court to pay off the fine. What? Big Louie? Yeah. Well, that's very interesting, Matty. Why should a big operator like Big Louie take such an interest in down-and-out panhandlers? Oh, I wish I knew. Look, Nick, the commissioner asked me to stop in and see whether you would take a hand in this business, huh? I'll be glad to, Matty. This panhandler situation isn't just a nuisance, it seems. It's much more than that. Well, what do you mean, Nick? I mean everything points to it being an organized racket. An organized racket? Yes. First of all, there's Big Louie, always on hand to pay the fine for any beggar that gets arrested. Huh. Second, these beggars are sprung up all over the city, on every side street, like the plague. Uh. And third, they seem to use the same methods of terrorizing citizens. Hey, you got something there, Nick. If we could only get some kind of a break, maybe we... I'll get it, Nick. Uh. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Yes, he is. It's for you, Sergeant. Headquarters. Oh, oh thanks, Patsy. Uh, Sergeant Matheson speaking. Yes, O'Rourke. What? Where? What did she say? Okay, O'Rourke, I'll get right on it. What is it, Matty? It looks like the break I was just talking about. Oh, yeah? What? Yep. It's not just vagrancy anymore, Nick. This time it's cold-blooded murder. Murder? Yep. A woman was blackjacked and robbed by one of these panhandlers on a deserted street. She died on her way to the hospital. Oh. But before that, she was conscious for just a minute and she talked. Yes? She identified her murderer as Foxy Farrell. Foxy Farrell? Right. Nick, wasn't he one of Big Louie Arkin's thugs in the old days? Yes. wonder what he's doing panhandling. Well, I don't know, but I'm going to send out a pickup call for him right away. Oh, and while you're about it, Matty. Yeah? Pick up Big Louie. I'd like to ask him a few questions. <laughs> Now look, Louie, there's a homicide rap that goes with this. You better come clean. Now, for the last time, where's Farrell hiding out? Now, Sergeant, you're looking for Foxy, not me. Why don't you find him? Louie, you're up to your neck in this, and we know it. Then prove it, Sergeant. Why, you... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, Matty. No <laughs> use getting upset. Uh... If Louie's in this, we'll find out sooner or later. Louie, why have you been paying the fines of these panhandlers when they come into court? Well, Carter, I'm a sentimental kind of guy, and a lot of these drifters used to be old friends of mine. <laughs> now, if you two coppers haven't got any more questions, I got a date. Nothing now. doing, you. You're staying right here until we're ready to let you go. On suspicion, Sergeant? Wait. Don't try to pull that phony charge on me. I got a lawyer who busted apart in five minutes, and you know it. I better let him go, man. Oh. We can always pick him up later if we need him. All right, come in. I. Oh, it's you, Mr. Prentice. Yes, Sergeant. Uh, Nick, this is Mr. Prentice, head of the Citizens Reform League. Yes, I've met Mr. Prentice. And I think you know Big Louie Arkin. Yes, very well. Don't I, Louie? Yeah. And I'm not forgetting you, Prentice. You sent me up the river for two years, and one of these days... One of these days, we're going to clean such scum as you out of this town. Ah, you reformers give me a pain. I remember this, Prentice. This town ain't big enough to hold you and me both. Huh. What's Big Louie doing here, Sergeant? We've been trying to nail him down on this panhandler killing. I see. Oh, and speaking of that, Sergeant, when are we going to get some action? Uh. It's getting so a decent citizen can't walk the streets anymore. And now, now it's come to murder. I'm sure we'll find the killer, Mr. Prentice. Well, I hope so, Mr. Carter. I'm glad to see that you've taken an interest in this case. And as for the police, Sergeant Matheson, we demand that every resource of the department be thrown into solving this case. Yeah, sure, sure. We're doing everything we can. Well, see that you do. Our league has considerable influence at City Hall. And if necessary, we'll shake up the whole police department. Good day. Nick, he's out for blood, no mistake. Yeah. Look, Matty. What? There's only one thing to do. 
Yeah. Get on the inside of this panhandling setup. Try to find out who runs it. I'm convinced that Big Louie runs it. I'm not. Take a bigger brain than Louie's to organize and run a racket like this. Mm. Well, maybe. Uh, have you got any idea how you're going to uh, get on the inside? What do you think? <laughs> Louie said you wanted to see me. Sit down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, what's it all about? Foxy, you shouldn't have killed that woman. Oh, now, listen, boss. You I... knew my orders. No violence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but boss, when I hit her up for the touch, she started to put up a fight. Gee, you can hear her yell for the cops a mile away. Her so purse I... was gone, Foxy. And you took it. Oh, boss, I... I run a legitimate business, Foxy. The collection of money for the poor and downtrodden. Not robbery and murder. You know the rules of my syndicate. Yeah, but uh, I... Boss, boss, what are you going to do? To use the underworld expression, Foxy, you're hot. The police are after you, and worse than that, Nick Carter has been brought into the case. Yeah, but boss... Foxy, I have no use for bunglers in my syndicate. I'm going to have to dispense with your services. No, no, but boss, let me get out of town. I don't know who you are. You're always wearing that mask. Let me get out of town. It's a pity, Foxy. You let your greed overcome your good judgment. Miss Bowen? What? Miss Bowen? What? How do you know my name? Well, I seen you around with Nick Carter. Look, Miss Bowen, my name's Davis. Snuffy Davis. I ain't had a thing to eat since two days ago. Could you spare a buck or two for a poor hungry guy? No, I'm sorry. Hey, now, look, lady, I'm down on my luck, and I need some dough. Get your hand off my arm. Oh, no, not till you come across. Get your hands off me, please. Hey, Patsy. What? Uh-huh. Not so loud. What? Nick. Yes, alias Snuffy Davis. Oh, Nick, for heaven's sake, you gave me the scare of my life. What on earth are you doing in those dirty ragged old clothes. <laughs> Why, I never suspected. Good. If you didn't, no one else will. Looks as if I passed the acid test with flying colors. Well, Nick, what on earth are you up to? Going to do a little panhandling on my own, Patsy. But why? I have an idea that instead of my having to look for the men who are running this panhandler's racket, they're going to look for me. <laughs> And now back to the case of the persistent beggars. Today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by All Dutch Cleanser. It is afternoon now, and as we rejoin Nick, now Snuffy Davis, he is panhandling his way up the busy city street. Suddenly, he finds a hand on his shoulder. He turns around to see a tough-looking vagrant with hard blue eyes. Yeah, you're mooching out of your territory, ain't you, Jack? What you talking about? It's a free country, ain't it? I can work any place I want to. Eh, not in this town you can't. What's your name, Jack? Hey, look, you, you just work your side of the street and I'll work mine. Oh, wise guy, huh? Come on, spill it before I wipe up the sidewalk with you. Hey, uh, What's your name? Okay, okay, don't get sore. My name's Snuffy Davis. Ah, Snuffy Davis, huh? That's right. I just blew into town from Union City. I was just mooching a buck or two when look, you came along. Punk, and... you can't work this town unless you belong to the syndicate. What syndicate? We got a set up here. Everything's organized. You gotta belong and pay off or else. Hey, what do you mean, pay off? Who's running this racket? Kinda nosy, ain't you, pal? Oh, no, no, but I don't want to work. How do I join this, uh, this your syndicate? Ah, that's better. Now you're showing sense. You know what a Boulevard Tavern is? Yeah. Go in there and ask to see Big Louie Arkin. Big Louie Arkin? Yeah. Just tell him... Eddie sent you. Hey, 
Hey, you. You big Louis Arkin? That's right, bum. What do you want? My name's Snuffy Davis. Eddie sent me. I see. What do you want? I want to work the street. But Eddie says I got to belong to the, to the syndicate. That's right. Cost you five bucks a day, every day. Five bucks a day? Hey, that's a lot of dough. Look, bum, you can take it or leave it. Ain't much choice, is there? All right. I'll take it. Okay. First, you'll have to talk to the boss. The boss? But I thought that you run this record. You ask too many questions, Snuffy. Keep your trap shut and come with me. Your name's Snuffy Davis? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That's right. I thought you'd like to look him over first, boss. Quite right, Louie. Snuffy, you say you're from Union City. Yeah, yeah, sure, that's right. Where's the Lyceum Theater in Union City? The Lyceum Theater? Yes, where is it? Why, it's, uh, it's on Grand Avenue. And the public library? On State Street. Hmm. Then you have been there. Oh, sure, sure, I told you. Never mind. I... You think he's all right, Louis? Yeah, sure, boss. I give him a good going over. He'll do. He knows the rules, too. Snuffy, the important thing is no violence. I conduct a legitimate business, and I don't want any trouble with the police. Do you understand? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I get you, I get you. Louis here will collect my commission every night. And one more thing, Snuffy. Yeah? If you ever breathe a word about coming to this warehouse or about this syndicate, your life won't be worth a panhandler's dime. You understand? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I get you, I, I get you. All right, Louis, give him a territory and put him to work. Come in. Oh, Mr. Prentice. Yes, Miss Bowen. I just dropped by to see whether Mr. Carter has made any progress in breaking up this vicious gang of panhandlers. Well, he's working on it now, Mr. Prentice. And knowing Mr. Carter as I do... Well, I... I... Excuse me. Uh, Certainly. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Patsy, this is Nick. Oh. I'm calling from a drugstore phone booth at River and Forth. River and Forth. Yes, now listen closely, Patsy. Mm Mm-hmm. I met the big shot who runs this whole panhandler syndicate a half hour ago at a deserted warehouse on the riverfront. At a deserted warehouse? Nick, who is he? I don't know yet. He wore a mask. A mask? Yes, covers his whole face. I met him through Big Louie Arkin, who turns out to be his right-hand man. Uh Uh-huh, so there is someone higher than Big Louie. There is. Now, listen closely, Patsy. Right. I picked up a clue to the boss's identity, and I need your help. Uh Uh-huh. He parked his car in a dirt driveway next to the warehouse. I didn't see the car, but I went back later and checked the tire tracks. Oh, what was the tire pattern? There was nothing in the tire pattern. Mm. Four new tires of a common make. But the width of the car, the distance between the right and left wheel tracks. Give me a tip-off. The width of the car? Yes. The boss, whoever he is, isn't driving an American car. Because the distance between his wheels isn't standard. In short, Patsy, he's driving some foreign car. Hmm. Now listen closely. Yes, me. I measure the distance between the wheels. It's five feet, two inches. Check the Automobile Association and find out what foreign make car measures that wheel distance. You got it? Right. Check Automobile Association and find out what foreign car measures two, uh, five feet, two inches in width between wheels. That's right. Five feet, two inches. When you find the make of the car, call the Bureau of Motor Vehicles and check who owns a car of that make. Uh-huh. Can't be very common. After you find out, call me back right here. All right, Nick. I'll get to the Bureau of Motor Vehicles right away. Oh, what's the number where you are? Virginia 90568. Right, now wait for your call. All right, Nick, I'll hurry. Bye. Mr. Prentice, I'm sorry I kept you waiting. That's uh, quite all right. I, I'll be running along now. I have a great deal to do in a short time. Good day. I've got news. Yeah? The car measuring a width of five feet two inches is an English arrow. There are only four in the whole state, and only one in the city. And that's owned by John Prentice. What? Prentice? Of the Citizens Reform League? Right. You don't suppose he could... Oh, hold a minute, Nick. Someone's coming in. Oh, it's Sergeant Matheson. Hi, Sergeant. Hi, Patsy. Patsy, look. Yeah? Prentice may be in this. 
And we've got to check the other three people who own aero cars before we can make sure. Mm hmm. Hey, wait a minute. What? What is it, Nick? Two mugs came into the drugstore just now. They're watching me. Oh, Nick. I recognize one of them. Panhandler named Eddie. Yeah, they're after me, all right, Patsy. Nick, then, Prentice is the boss. What? He was in the office when you called me and overheard our conversation. Right. And he went out and phoned his men to pick me up. Oh. Nick, what are the thugs doing now? They're moving this way toward the phone booth. And they've got guns. Oh, quick, Patsy. Put Mary on the phone. <laughs> Well, Nick is in a real spot. Trapped in a phone booth with two of Prentice's men coming to pick him up. We'll be back to see what happens in just a moment. And now for the conclusion of The Case of the Persistent Beggars, today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As we pick up our story, two of Prentice's thugs are headed toward the phone booth to get Nick as Matty's voice comes over the wire. Yeah, Nick, what is it? Matty, I've got to talk fast. Two mugs have me trapped in a drugstore phone booth at River and Forth. I'll have every prowl car in the neighborhood down there in five minutes, Nick. Five minutes may be too late. They're here now. Listen, Matty, if you miss me here, try that big deserted warehouse next to the fur exchange. Stop that phone, Carter. Another word and I'll blow your brains out. Yeah, we're going for a little ride, wise guy. The boss wants to see you. <laughs> Carter, it looks as though you've outsmarted yourself. On the contrary, Prentice, you've outsmarted yourself. Your racket has ended. My dear Carter, my work may be ended, but so is yours. Wait a minute, Carter. You say the boss here is Prentice? That's right, Louis. Prentice, head of the Citizens Reform League, the man who sent you up the river. Why, you double cross? Don't make a move, Louis. The same goes for you, Carter. As you see, I've got a gun. Take off that mask. Why not, Louis? There you are. So you are, Prentice. That citizen's reform stuff was just a blind. Exactly, Louis. I'm about to retire with my earnings. Naturally, I intend that both of you will retire also, and permanently. You'll have to work fast, Prentice, if you expect to carry out your plan. Mr. Carter, you underrate me. I have plenty of time. First a bullet into each of you, then through this window, and a... What's that? The police, Prentice. Police? Okay, Prentice. But I it. warned you, Louis. Thanks for the opening, Prentice. Smash the light, will you, Carter? That won't help you. Yeah, miss me. Hard to hit what you can't see, isn't it? Uh, yeah, now that your gun's jammed, I'll show you that this is the most effective way. Okay, boys, break it down. Nick, Nick, where are you? Over here, Matty. Are you all right? Sure, sure, I'm all right. Turn on your flash. Yeah. Hey, what's Prentice doing here? Prentice? Uh, he's the big boss of this whole panhandling racket. What? And the other one with the bullet wound, you already know. Big Louis Arkin. I... I'll say I know him. He looks in bad shape, Matty. You better get what you can out of him while he can still talk. <laughs> Nick, I just spoke to Sergeant Matheson over the phone. Oh, yeah? Big Louie gave him the whole story before he died, all about the killing of Foxy Farrell, everything. You know, Patsy, it's funny how Prentice masqueraded as a respectable citizen for so long. <laughs> Why, Big Louie, whom Prentice sent up the river, never knew who his boss in this racket was. <sighs> well, anyway, Nick, the sergeant tells me this panhandling racket is definitely finished. Oh, oh. Hmm? Speaking of panhandling, Patsy, I've got something on my conscience. On your conscience? Yes, seven dollars and twenty-five cents. It's the money I mooched while I was snuffy, Davis. Remember? <laughs> hey, what'll I do with it? Well, uh, why not give it to your boys' club, Nick? Ah, oh, Patsy, you would think of a nice thing like that. That way, the money will really go to help those who need it, and that's what it was given to me for. <laughs> Nick, is Old Dutch Cleanser bringing us an exciting adventure next week? I should say they are, Bob. How about it, Patsy? Oh, you can say that again, Nick. What's it all about? Well, all of a sudden, there are a series of accidents way up in the skyscrapers of the city. Yes, men fall to their death, and a mysterious killer roams the building. Not to mention a pail on the wrong side of a windowsill in an empty office. And a bad dream that Patsy had. Oh, but you haven't heard the best part of it, Bob. If you knew what Nick did to catch the killer... Whoa, that's enough for now. Uh, what do you call this story, Nick? I call it 
The Case of the Careless Employees. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by Max Ehrlich. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use Old Dutch Cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System. Broadcasting System. Broadcasting... Old Dutch Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction... Nick Carter, Master Detective. But, Nick, that's impossible. No, Patsy. Somewhere high up in the skyscrapers of this city, a deadly killer is running wild. I know. But how on earth are you going to track him down, Nick? It's, well, it's like looking for someone in a jungle of stone and glass. Well, at least I know whom he's picked out for his next victim. But, who? A fellow by the name of... Nick Carter. Now, the case of the careless employees. Today's exciting Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. Our story begins in the superintendent's office of the Park Window Cleaning Company, a large firm handling skyscraper contracts only. Bill Stevens, one of the company's window washers, is talking to the superintendent, Frank Marston. I just dropped in to give you my notice, Marston. I'm quitting this coming Saturday. What? You heard me. I'm handing in my equipment Saturday. Wait a minute, Bill. Take it easy. It's more money you want. You couldn't pay me enough to keep me washing windows for the park company, Marston. Bill, you've been with the company a long time. Yeah, and I want to live a long time. I don't like all these accidents that are happening to pals of mine. Look at Ed Kelly. He fell 40 stories to the street two weeks ago. And then last week, Joe Drummond took a nosedive from the Embassy Hotel Towers. And then only yesterday, Tim Bolin hit the bricks. Dropped 20 stories from the exchange building. And each of them so badly smashed, you could hardly identify them. Oh, sure, I know. But we're bound to ever run a bad luck now and then, Bill. Those fellows probably got a little careless. Nuts! They were old-timers and you know it. They know where to put their safety belts and how to handle themselves in a high wind. Truth is, this here company is jinxed. And what do you mean by that? You're the superintendent. You tell me. Oh, just because you've had a few accidents. Marston, the... we've had three accidents in two weeks, and that's too many. I'm getting the jitters myself. The next thing you know, bingo, they'll pick me up off the street with a blotter. Bill, if I were you, I'd think it over. Think I... it over or nothing. My mind is made up, Marston. I'm going to get myself a nice, safe job on the ground. <laughs> Oh, good morning, Patsy. Oh, gosh, do I feel embarrassed. Letting the boys beat me into the office. Ah, uh, Patsy. Uh, what's the matter, Nick? Leave that bunch of fruit you call a hat right where it is. We're going places. So early in the morning. So early in the morning. John Farron just called and asked us to go to work for him. Farron? Mm-hmm. Is that Farron of Atlantic Underwriters? That's the man. And I might remind you, his company pays us a handsome annual retainer for services rendered. In other words, you've got yourself a case. I have. Well, what's it all about? Well, Atlantic issues a special high-premium policy to window cleaners. And three of these insured window cleaners have fallen from skyscrapers in the last two weeks. What does that have to do with you? In the first place, statistics show that no window cleaner has died by accidental fall in the past two years. Now, for no apparent reason, three of the poor devils plunged to their deaths in two weeks. Hmm. It could be coincidence, Nick. 
Yes, it could, but I doubt that it is. Hmm? Listen to this. There are only two big contract window cleaning companies in town. The Park Outfit and the Community Window Cleaning Corporation. Uh Uh-huh. Between them, they handle millions of dollars worth of skyscraper business annually. And they're bitter rivals. Well, who had the accidents, Park or Community? Or both? All the accidents have happened to Park, none to Community. I see. Of course, that could be coincidence, too. Well, I'm afraid this case has too many coincidences. Well, what are we going to do about it, Nick? In other words, where now? To headquarters. I want to check a few details with Mary before we really get going. So you're sure these window cleaners fell by accident, huh, Matty? I can be absolutely sure of nothing, Nick. As far as we know, these guys just got careless, that's all. Well, from what we understand, they were all old-timers in the window cleaning business. Yeah, yeah, but even the best of them can make mistakes, Patsy. Yeah. And when they slip on a job like this, why, it's curtains. Or I should say, shrouds. Oh. Now, what about the safety belts these cleaners are wearing, Matty? Nick, I checked them myself. They were in perfect condition. Not a thing wrong with them. And the bolts on the sides of the windows to which they hooked their belts? Went over them personal, every one of them. And every window where these men were cleaning when they fell... Those bolts were in solid, Nick. Not a loose one on the lock. Well, Nick, that's that. I sure you're just wasting your time, Nick. The medical examiner looked over each of the bodies and reported death by accident. Fall and violent contact. Oh, Island is right. Oh, Nick, I've seen men smashed up in my time, but these fellas... uh, We could barely identify them. Well, nevertheless, I still can't get over the fact that these accidents happened so close together and only to the men in the park company. Well, Nick, look, these window cleaners stepped out on a windowsill and slipped. Or they were blown off these skyscrapers by a high wind before they got their belts hooked. Oh, I don't know. But we're booking them as accidents, and that is that as far as we're concerned. All right, Matty, you may be right. But until I've exhausted every possibility, I'm not going to be satisfied. Come on, Patsy. Uh, Where are we going this time? Uptown. I want to talk to the superintendent of the park company. Mr. Carter, it's beyond me. I still can't figure out how they happened to fall. Uh, Tell me, Mr. Marston. Did you know any of them well? Did I know them? I'll say I did. They were old-timers with our company. Came in with me when the business first started. Worked right alongside of them before I hurt my leg and took this inside job. Yeah, they were friends of mine, all right. Knew their families, too. Now... We understand how you must feel. Uh, Mr. Marston, these accidents, how have they affected your business? We're taking a terrific beating, Mr. Carter. I see. We've already lost a couple of big accounts. The mercantile building and the arcade building canceled with us and went over to the community corporation. They didn't like the unfavorable publicity. I can understand that. And that isn't all. This losing business is only one of our troubles. Suppose your men are quitting, huh? They sure are in droves. You know, window cleaners are pretty superstitious, Mr. Carter. I think our company's hoodoo. Well, can't you get any help to replace them? There hasn't been a man come to our employment office in two weeks. We've advertised in all the papers, and we haven't got a single response. Frankly, Mr. Carter, a little more of this kind of thing, and the park company's washed up or we're through. I see. Uh, Mr. Marson, who's the man to see at your competitors, the community corporation? A man named Whaley, Fred Whaley. It's a corporation with a board of directors, but he supervises operations. Why? What's what's he got to do with all this? Oh, I just want to get his point of view, that's all. Come on, Patsy. Let's go see Whaley. Look, Mr. Carter, I'm a very busy man. I don't have much time. Now, what do you want? Miss Bowen and I are investigating those accidents over at Park on behalf of the Atlantic Underwriters. Well, why come to me? Nothing's happened to our window cleaners. Why don't you talk to the Park people instead of coming here to waste my time? Look here, Whaley. You don't have to tell us anything if you don't want to. But at least you can be civil. Okay. Well, what do you want? We don't quite understand why all the accidents seem to be happening to the park company alone. Meaning what, Carter? Meaning anything you like, or nothing. Look here, Carter, are you implying we're responsible? I'm not making any accusations, Whaley. We just thought you might have an idea. I haven't. Uh, I mind my own business, operating the Community Window Cleaning Corporation. What happens over at Park doesn't interest me. 
Is that clear? Clear enough. But is it the truth? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Carter. Do I understand you to insinuate that I... What I'm saying is common knowledge in business circles, Whaley. Park has already lost several big skyscraper contracts to your company. They lose a few more, they'll fold up. Well, that's their affair. It's not mine. Though I'd be happy to see them fold up. Now, is that all? Yes. Yes, Mr. Whaley. That's all. For now. Hiya, beautiful. Fresh. Oh, no, listen, I just got carried away. You know, when you're cleaning windows on these big buildings, all you see mostly is a lot of sour pusses. But you, boy, you're the best-looking babe I've seen in any of these offices. Oh, you really think so? Honest, no kidding. Well, you're not so bad yourself. Thanks, baby. <clears throat> um, what's your name? Mabel. Mabel Lanigan. My name is Bill Meadow. Pleased to meet you. Ah, uh, must be uh, pretty dull working in an office like this all day. Punching a typewriter. Oh, say. Sometimes I could scream. But take your job. Gee, that must take an awful lot of nerve. Yeah, you gotta watch yourself. Ain't you scared you'll fall someday? Well, I never was before. But lately, I've started to smarten up. In fact, I'm quitting the job tonight, and I'm gonna celebrate. Hey, that gives me an idea. What? How about you celebrating with me? Oh, I couldn't do that. I hardly know you. Oh, come on, Mabel. I'm a nice guy when you get to know me. Well, go to the Blue Grotto. You know, dinner, dance. What do you say, Mabel? Huh? Well, I... I... I tell you what, if it'll make you feel any better, we'll make it a foursome. Foursome? Sure, I've got a friend. You get a friend. Well, I... I've got a friend who works on the floor below, on the 32nd floor. Her name's Alice Hayes. I... Might call her up. I tell you what, if it's okay with her, me and my friend will meet the two of you at the entrance of this building tonight at 6 sharp. Okay? All right. Well, call your friend right now. I'll be washing the next window over, Mabel. And when you get through phoning, you stick your head out of the window and let me know how you make out, huh? So long, beautiful. <laughs> Honest, he is. Huh? Oh, gosh, I don't know how tall his friend is. Yeah, sure, it's embarrassing when you're taller than the man you're with, but I, I tell you what, Alice, hold the wire. Bill's washing the window in the next office. I'll ask him how tall his friend is. Hold on. Bill! My friend Alice wants to know how tall... Bill! Bill! That Mr. Whaley is a nice, chatty man, Nick. Just a sweet, lovable guy, if I ever saw one. Yeah. Certainly didn't get much out of him. <sighs> if you ask me, we're on a wild goose chase. We've been running around in circles. Hey, what's the matter? Nick, that ambulance just stopped where the crowd is. Must be an accident. Yes. Let's have a look. Right. Hey, what happened, bud? It's, it's, it's another window cleaner. Winter cleaner? Yeah, poor guy smashed right through the awning, right on the sidewalk. Oh. Oh, must have dropped on the 40th floor. Oh, Nick, it's another one of those accidents. Oh, I see. Come on, Patsy. Oh, but Nick, the body's over there. I'm not interested in the body. I want to find out what office that poor devil dropped from. You say it was the office next to yours. Is that right, Miss Lanigan? Yes, sir. He'd just finished our window and he was working on the next one. He was just falling backward from the window sill. Kind of. And that's all you saw? Yes, sir. Uh, Nick, I, I think we better let Miss Lanigan go now. She isn't feeling very well. Yeah, of course. Just as soon as she tells us which office it was. It's this one right here. It used to be rented by the Burger Woolen Mills, but it, it's empty now. I see. Thank you very much for your help, Miss Lanigan. You're welcome, I'm sure. All right, let's go in, Patsy. Right, Nick. 
Not only an empty office, but it's just been repainted. Yeah. The floor's still a little sticky from a fresh coat of varnish. Patsy, look. Look at what? The floor. Huh? The very faint imprints of someone's feet in the varnish. Nick, you're right. Right. Hmm? See those little round spots beside the footprints? Yes. Those are undoubtedly made by the rubber tip on a cane. So the man who came into this office was lame, huh? Does that suggest something to you, Nick? Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, look. Hmm? A number of prints at the window, too. Must have been left by the window cleaner. Apparently, he was cleaning the inside of the window when the lame man came through the door. Nick, I still don't see what but you... the window washer's pail is on the outside sill of the window. Well, what of it? Well, look at the window, Patsy. Look at it. Hmm? Sorry, it had been washed on the outside. And the cleaner had started on the inside surface. That means the cleaner was working on the inside when he was interrupted. Nick, if that's the case, why is the pail on the outside of the window? Precisely, Patsy. It shouldn't be. Unless someone deliberately put it there after the window cleaner was dropped to the street. Then this was no accident. I'll say it wasn't. It was murder. And now back to the case of the careless employees... Today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. It is Monday now, and Patsy is just coming into the office after doing a job of research for Nick. Well, Nick, I checked back on those three accidents that preceded Bill Meadows. And? And your hunch was right. Every one of those window cleaners fell from the window of an empty office. Good going, Patsy. This proves that the murderer was someone who knew the schedules of the Park Company crew. And knew them to a dotted I and a cross T. Huh. He showed perfect timing, picking empty offices where he wouldn't be disturbed. And his motive certainly is obvious enough. To ruin the park company, drive it out of business. Hmm. Well, even with what we know, it isn't going to be easy to nail down this killer, Patsy. Oh, I'll say it isn't. Well, there must be a hundred skyscrapers in the city with thousands of windows. And heaven knows how many empty offices. Looking for this murderer is going to be even worse than trying to find a taxi on a rainy night. Patsy? Yes? Did you ever wash what? windows? What? I said, did you ever wash windows? Well, why, yes, of course, but I never enjoyed it. Why? I've decided to get a window cleaning job with the Park Company. Oh, Nick, for the love of Pete, have you gone mad? No, Patsy. I've got a hunch that if I set myself up as sucker bait, the killer may look me up. Well, how do you know where you are or, or what you're doing? Oh, I'll make sure the word gets around. Why, Nick, you can't do it. It isn't the killer I'm worried about so much. It's the idea of you hanging on a safety strap 40 stories above the street and then suddenly... Oh, Nick. Now, Patsy, don't worry. High places don't bother me. (sighs) Maybe you don't know it, but if you look at my high school yearbook, you'll see that a kid named Nick Carter was champion high diver of the swimming team. You say my men were murdered, Carter? They didn't fall just by accident? That's right, Marston. What makes you think that? Well, I won't go into the details now, except to tell you I know they were murdered. And the killer is a man who uses a cane. Probably walks with a limp. Walks with a limp? That's interesting, Carter. Is there anything I can do to help you track him down? Yes, Marston. You can give me a job, cleaning windows. Did I hear you right, Kurt? You want me to give you a what? A job. With one of your regular crews. Well, by all that's holy, why? Because I have a hunch that if I'm on a window-washing crew, this skyscraper killer may pay me a visit. Well, I... Oh, now, look here, Carter. You're out of your mind. This is the whole idea. It's... Well, it's crazy. You've never had any experience. This kind of work's pretty tricky and dangerous. I'll take the chance. You're sure you want to do this? I am. Okay. Against my better judgment, but I'll give you the job. All I can say is you be careful. Oh, don't worry, Marston. I expect to be careful. Very careful. Now, to whom do I report? The crew boss is Al Fredericks. You'll find him in the locker room down the hall and to the left. Oh, don't you think you'd better come along and introduce me? Well, I... Uh... Well, Carter, I think I'd better stay here. I'm up to my ears and work. You go ahead. I'll phone Al from here that I'm sending you in. Oh, uh, one more thing. Yes? Shall I tell him who you really are? Might as well. If you consider him trustworthy, I may need his cooperation later. Mm 
You, Al Fredericks? Yeah, that's right. Mr. Marston told me to report to you for work. My name is Carter, Nick Carter. Yeah, so Marston told me over the phone just now, but I don't like it. Pretty dangerous work, especially for a green hand. Oh, I know what I'm up against. Okay, I'll put you on the first thing in the morning. I don't know exactly what you're up to, Carter. But let me tip you off to one thing. Yes? Be careful. Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Oh, hello, Patsy. Oh. I'm on my lunch hour. Anything doing at the office? Uh, no, no, there's nothing new. Oh, Nick, for heaven's sake, will you stop this window cleaning business and come back here to the office? I've been going crazy ever since you started work this morning. Now, Patsy, there's no point in getting jittery. Oh, there isn't. Well, Nick, let me tell you something. I dreamed about you last night. You were crawling up the side of a big, tall building like a human fly. And then, when you almost got to the top... A huge bird swooped down and started to attack you. You tried to fight back, but you hang, had to hang on and you couldn't. And, and then, then all of a sudden you lost your grip and... Oh, Nick. I thought I lost you. Now, now, Patsy, I'm doing fine so far. Don't worry. Oh, I'm all right, Nick. I'll try not to. Anything new? No. But if the killer wants to look me up this afternoon, he'll find me on the 32nd floor of the Globe Building. Good to get inside for a minute. Cold out there. You did decide to look me up, after all. Don't turn around, Carter. Keep facing that window. And get your hands up. You don't want a bullet in your back. Well, Nick's hunch that the skyscraper killer would finally look him up turned out to be accurate with a vengeance. We'll be back to see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Careless Employees, today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As we pick up our story, Nick is facing the window with his hands up while the man with the limp points a gun at his back. I see you picked out a nice empty office as usual, Marston. So you know me, eh, Carter? I do. Not that it matters much now. How did you know? When I first met you, you mentioned the fact that you had a bad leg. Yeah, so I did. It was stupid of me, wasn't it? Very. Then later, when you refused to get up from your desk and walk with me to the locker room, I was pretty sure. Why didn't you do something about it then? Because courts require airtight evidence before they send a man to the chair, Marston. I wanted you to tip your own hand the way you're doing now. I figured you'd get worried and come after me. Yeah, you're a smart detective, Carter. But this time, you've outsmarted yourself. Have I? You sure have. 32 stories to the street, Carter. You've got a one-way ticket. Down. I suppose the community corporation's paying you off to ruin your own company. Ah, oh, no. Not the corporation. Just my friend Whaley. You see, Whaley gets a big bonus if the community does a big business. I get a dividend. $25,000 for turning over to him a million dollars worth of park business. I see. Now, Mr. Carter, I'm going to treat you just as I did the other. No favoritism. I'm going to tap you on the back of the head with the butt of this gun, knock you out, and then I'm going to drop you out of the window. 
Of course, they'll never notice a little bump on your head after you hit the street. They'll call it an accident. Just an accident. Hey! Don't like water on your face, do you? Too bad you missed, Larson. You won't get another chance. Well, Mr. Marson, looks as if you're the one who suffered a little accident, not me. An accident that should please my friend Matty very much indeed. Well, Nick, we grabbed Whaley at the airport. He's just trying to get a plane out of town. Nice going, Matty. Well, that makes two customers for the chair instead of one. Yeah. And if these two don't burn, I'll go back to pounding a beat. <laughs> oh, it's sorry. <laughs> Nick, there's still one thing I don't understand. Yes? You were facing the window, and Marston was in back of you with a gun. Yeah, how did you get out of that spot, Nick? Well, I had to take a long chance. I watched Marston's reflection in the window as he came toward me. Yeah? My pail of cleaning water was beside me on the sill. When he raised his gun to crack me over the head, I flipped the pail of water right over my shoulder and into his face. And that blinded him just long enough so you could knock him out. <laughs> well, I'll be doggone. Nice work, Nick. That's my boss, Sergeant. If he can't wash windows with his cleaning solution, he catches murderers with it. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by Max Ehrlich. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance therein to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count... Use Old Dutch Cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.